Chapter 18 The fourth kind of monks are those called gyrovegs. They spend their whole lives tramping from province to province, staying as guests in different monasteries for three or four days at a time. Of the miserable conduct of such men it is better to be silent than to speak. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 1 They reached the outskirts of Hannigan City by early evening, and the Cardinal decided to rent rooms and spend the night in an inn outside the city limits. There was the possibility of learning recent news from the innkeeper or fellow travellers. There was the inevitability of reading the government bulletin boards to learn of the response of the bureaucrats to the same recent news. There was a need to change from a monk's habit to red and black. Wege would need new clothes altogether, and could again wear his weapons as the cardinal's bodyguard. All Blacktooth needed was a bath and a change of habit. They had grown beards during the journey, but only Wege decided to shave. His whiskers were rather thin and added an alien touch to his appearance. Brown Pony's beard was redder than his thinning hair. Blacktooth had more grey on his chin than on his pate, which badly needed reshaving. Wege barbered Nimi's tonsure with a short sword, grasping the blade with both hands and drawing it smoothly under the soapy hair. Blacktooth complained that the swordsman was leaning on him too hard. Only to hold you still. If you prefer, I could shave you just as easily standing back here, Wege said to the lathered monk. Blacktooth looked at him with affected fright. The guardsman held the sword drawn back past his right shoulder as if to deliver a roundhouse cut to the scalp's long stubble. Stop boasting. Lean on me if you need to. He was surprised because it was the first time Wege made a joke, a sinister joke besides, and one of the few times he spoke at all. In Jackrabbit country only once did a need arise to draw his long sword and brown pony's pistol when a group of young bullies had decided to pick on three itinerant mendicant monks for fun. Both Nimi and the Cardinal missed Wuxin. Blacktooth wondered if they had, without meaning to, resented Wege as a poor substitute for the axe, on whose head there was a price in this realm. But Wege had no wish to be a substitute for anyone. Nimi resolved to befriend him if there was still time. By mid-afternoon of a cold and sunny day, they were standing on the steps of the Cathedral of Holy Michael, the Angel of Battle, talking to its Cardinal Archbishop. At the Archbishop's left and rear stood an attractive young acolyte wearing a long surplice with lacework and crocheted borders. Torildo smiled happily at Blacktooth on first seeing him, but then misinterpreted Nimi's expression and cast his eyes on the ground. The monk was less shocked that Benefers had hired the pretty fugitive than surprised by a sudden realization that the letters BRT beneath the painted B. Dulles was here legend at Yellow's Crater Lake stood for Brother Torildo, who had been traveling from Valana to Hannigan City. Wege seemed ill at ease, for Benefers kept glancing at him until finally the cardinal asked, Young man, where have I seen you before? Brown Pony answered for him, in Valana, Urian. Wege was in Cardinal Rees' employ. Now he is in mine. Ah, yes. There were five or six of them, weren't there? Where are the others? Brown Pony shook his head and shrugged. I've been on the road for two months. The evasion was almost a lie, Black Tooth noticed. Of course, Benefer said, then returned to their previous conversation. Ilya, mm, your eminence of canon law, I too have been a scholar. Before the flame deluge there had been only two papal resignations. One pope, so-called, was a great sinner, one was a great saint. The former sold the papacy, the latter fled from it in holy terror. But the question arises whether either of these men was a legitimate pope. So can a real pope resign? I think not. If he resigns, he was never elected by the Holy Ghost in the first place. This may be against the majority opinion, but it is my opinion. A poet of his own time put him in hell, but that poet was a bitter man. I think the old fellow was really hallowed, but I doubt the legitimacy of his election in the first place. If he were Pope, he would not and could not resign, and would not be talking about resignation. Are we talking about San Pietro of Mount Moron, or Pope Amen Speckleberg? 
Brown Pony asked. Aren't they two of a kind? No, Urian, they are not. He hesitated. Well, how can I say? Amen, speckled bird, I have known. I know San Pietro only from a book at Leberwitz Abbey. The writer thought he was a saintly clown. Doesn't this describe Amen, speckled bird, in a charitable way? Brown Pony paused. He seemed to be leaving himself open on all sides. Blacktooth tried to remember Wuxin's word for it. Hapu Biraki, he thought. In a fight, it was usually a deadly invitation to be foolhardy. Brown Pony closed in. If so, then this saintly clown, Pope Amen, his holiness is disposed to absolve you, Urian, of any penalty of excommunication you may have incurred, crimine ipso lysi majestatis facto, or any other act of rebellion you may have committed in thought, word, or deed. I am here to announce this. Blacktooth noticed that the purple in the face of Benefers was not merely reflected light from his purple vestments. It had been a day for burying the dead. He did not sputter, however, but heard. How utterly wonderful of Emilia! From so generous a man, I'll bet the penance I have to do is only kiss his ring. I doubt he would allow you to do that, Urian. He is an honest man. There are no conditions and no penance, unless I choose to impose one. You. The Pope sent a plenipotentiary in this case. Me. You. And I unbind you, Urian, without condition, in nomine patris filiique spiritusque sancti. Blacktooth saw the archbishop's right hand twitch toward mirroring the sign of the cross Brown Pony made over him. But it was only the twitch of habit. Your credentials are as good as your Latin, Ilya. Go home and stop being my gadfly. I am also empowered to offer you control over those churches in the province where the parishioners are mostly settlers or soldiers whose native tongue is Olzark. Oh, I see. It's not a matter of geography, then. Geography is boundaries and fences. These don't mean much to a nomad. Yes. We had a recent demonstration of that just west of New Rome. Human life doesn't mean much to them either, and they eat men's flesh. Only men they honor. It is a funeral rite or a tribute to a brave dead enemy. You defend this evil thing? No, I merely describe it. Someone was yelling, Make way, make way, in the distance, and Cardinal Benefers looked up the street. Apparently my nephew is coming down the road, he said to Brown Pony. Do you want to step inside? You mean, do I want to hide? No, Urian, thank you. I must see him in order to deliver this. He showed Benefers the sealed papers which he had received at the Abbey from Valana. I must go to the palace to request an audience unless he sees us and stops. The Emperor was in a hurry, as usual, and ordered his driver to wield the whip. He waved in a friendly way to his subjects in the streets who bowed or curtsied as the royal coach hurried on, preceded by two mounted guards whose costumes were more elegant than that of their ruler. Philpeo wanted to be seen as a man of frugal habits, generous to his subjects, and devoted to the economic interests of the empire. He sought to distance himself in public from the ferocity of some of his predecessors, and had shortened the list of crimes for which the penalty was death. His own ferocity was carefully contained. He had secretly, on several occasions, insisted on administering the supreme penalty himself, but few men knew about this. One who had known it was named Wushin, and it was the Hannigan's personal fascination with death by the art of the headsman which had, in fact, cost him his best executioner. The fellow had been repelled by his own art when practiced by his master, and Hark had let him get away. It was one of his few mistakes in judging men. Philpeo Hark was a Hannigan only on his mother's side, and some considered this inheritance of the throne through the mother line supremely ironic, given the masculine, patrilineal, and certainly patriarchal cast of the Texarch civilization, which in its origins was a reaction to the matriline culture of the plains. The original Hannigan, or Hungan, with a jackrabbit pronunciation, the conqueror of the city had been leader of a band of nomad outlaws, 
and his acquisition of the mayorality of the small town and trading post called Texarc had been by conquest. The term outlaws was a farmer's word. Nomads who despised them but feared them less called them motherless ones, a term which was applied to those wanderers of the prairie who either evaded family ties because of hostility or found themselves unwanted by any woman of the horde, and these men formed homosexual, not necessarily in the erotic sense, war bands, taking their women by violence when they felt the urge and saw the chance, and keeping them, if at all, as servants. From the point of view of the civis, every nomass was an outlaw. But in the nomad view, the motherless ones had deviated so far from the nomad cultural norm that they were loathed by the people of the plains more than they were by the farmers along the eastern fringe whom they sometimes plundered. As is usually the case, a completely alien enemy is less to be despised than a deviant brother. The motherless ones who originally conquered Texarc had been driven there by the right-thinking orthodox nomads of the several hordes. It was an infusion of fresh blood and new ideas for the sleepy trading community and the surrounding farmers, and Texarc began to grow and to be fortified. It was located in a place where, exposed on both flanks in order to grow at all, it was forced to conquer or perish. However, after five generations, the mutation of barbarian outlaw into civilized aristocrat was nearly complete, and Philpeo was a popular ruler except in the conquered territories. The town of Texarc itself, or Texarcana, improperly so called in the Latin of the church, was not located at the site, now lost, of the ancient city of that name. Now called Hannigan City, it did lie on the Red River that it grew up at the vague boundary between forest and plain, where it was originally a minor center of commerce between the two areas, the sown and the treeless wild. The relatively peaceful jackrabbit people had come here to trade surplus cattle, horses, and hides for wood, metal, spirits, medicinal herbs, products of the blacksmith's art, and whatever trinkets the merchants could show that caught the nomad fancy. Among the merchants, however, there were a few panderers who took advantage of the sexual hungers of the motherless ones, and actually sold them brides or rented them for a while. That was the beginning of it. When the price of brides went up, the bandits killed the merchants, took what they wanted, and settled down. But they themselves, not their captive wives, kept and managed the horses, and every other kind of property. In one generation, a way of life was turned on its head. Filpeo Hark himself was a student of this local and family history, which was not so well known to the residents of his realm. He had taken a personal interest in the writings of historians at the Collegium, now a thriving university, and he who wanted tenure and royal favor wrote to please the monarch. He who wrote otherwise was rarely published and failed to thrive, to put it mildly. In passing his uncle's church, the monarch suddenly signaled his driver to go slow. He pointed at a group of clergy, including his uncle Urian, standing on the steps in the morning sun. Cardinal Benefer seemed to be arguing warmly with another man in a red zucchetto whose back was toward the coach. Who is that man? Filpeo asked sharply. Which one, your imperial honor? The cardinal, with his back toward the coach, suddenly looked over his shoulder. The mayor's head disappeared inside the window, and he knocked for the driver to hurry on. Beside the second cardinal stood one man in the robes of the Albertian Order of Leibowitz, and another man-at-arms who was probably a bodyguard. He thought he knew who one of them might be. The armed man was too alien in appearance to be the cardinal's secretary, and Uncle Urian appeared to have acquired another pretty young man as acolyte. Drive on, drive on! The manufacturer's representative had already arrived at the war college, when the imperial coach discharged its royal passenger and his courtiers, but he and the officers in charge were not yet ready for the demonstration. Irritated by the delay, but determined to make use of every idle moment, Filpeo called an immediate meeting of staff to discuss long-term strategy on the plains. It was disquieting to the officers to be quizzed by the monarch on such an impromptu basis with no preparation, and Filpeo always enjoyed putting them in such a situation. He learned a lot from the practice, and it helped him weed out the fools. The commanders of infantry and corps of engineers were out of the city on maneuvers, however, and their seconds were summarily yanked out of their offices and hauled to the conference room. 
Admiral Le Fondelai was there in prison, and so was General Goldeen, Chief of Staff, and Major General Alverson of the Cavalry. Infantry and engineers were represented by Colonels Holofot and Blindermen. Not as a joke, but in a joking manner, Philpeo Hark himself collared Colonel Potskar, S.I., in the corridor while the Ignatian chief chaplain was returning from Mass and pulled him along to the meeting. Someone may need your services here, Father, said the monarch to the astonished Potskar. It may even be me. Did you know that Cardinal Brown Pony and probably his troublesome monk secretary are in town? Colonel Father Potskar nodded. I just heard about it as I left the church. By now he must have requested an audience with your honour, no? No, not that I have been told about. I'm sure he will, but naturally he would see the Archbishop first. My God, I should have him arrested. If Uriah knew he was coming, he would have told me. What the hell is going on? I would guess, your honour, that he has come to plead the cause of the man he calls Pope. Ha! Huh? The man who sent the grasshopper horde to smash its way to New Rome. By God, they killed two-thirds of the nomads, and we chased that bastard courier back to Valana with their speckle bird, all right. But they left a lot of dead men and raped women and burned buildings. There hasn't been an atrocity like that before the second Hannigan's conquest. And now we've got trouble with the grasshopper all along the frontier, mainly because of him. Who, Brown Pony? Sire, you have been misinformed. He was not even with the courier so-called at that time. He was with Monsignor Samuel at the nomad election. Samuel told me that. He was quite shocked by Brown Pony. Says the man is a pagan. But although he rode south with the grasshopper to meet the Pope, he did not join the others, but continued south. Your Honour, according to one of my chaplains in the area of conflict, the uh, pretender Pope turned back with his whole retinue when the guards refused to let them cross the border. This priest says the nomad escort attacked only after they were separated from the Valanan cardinals. It's not at all clear that they were acting under Valana's instruction. I know the archbishop had received a message from this crazy speckled bird. It probably told him Brown Pony was coming. I wonder that the guards let him cross the border. I doubt that he came through the skirmishing zone, sire. He probably crossed from the province. By way of Leberwitz Abbey, I dare say, for he was with a monk of theirs. Right now I want you to send one of your chaplains to bring Brown Pony to me. Let a military policeman go with him. Let them not take no for an answer. Bring that monk along, too. Colonel Father Potskar hurried away. The Hannigan glanced curiously at Admiral Le Fondelai and asked, I don't remember calling you here. Do we need the Navy to fight nomads on the plains? Not that you aren't welcome. I asked him to come, explained General Goldeem. Brown Pony inherited six alien warriors from a cardinal who died in conclave. And Carpy here knows something about their race and nation. We might need to know. The Admiral frowned. Carpius' robbery had been the Fondelai's nom de guerre in his pirate days, when he had become the second man since antiquity to circumnavigate the globe. But he hated to be called... Carpy, especially in the presence of his Hannigan. They entered the conference room. First, the Emperor asked about the status of the forces protecting new farming lands and any further encounters with the grasshopper people. Told they had drawn back defensively, Philpeo ordered there be no punitive raids by Texarch forces until he so commanded. He then stated, If I were a grasshopper war sharf, I would make an alliance with the wild dog to strike the province. I would cut the telegraph line in several places. The wild dog will cut the province in half while Grasshopper strikes toward Texarch. What is your response? Colonel Father Potskar entered the room and nodded to Philpeo. Colonel Holofort spoke. They can destroy, but they cannot hold. Such an invasion can be no more than a massive cavalry raid. Our forts would remain secure. They might massacre the jackrabbit settlers and the colonists, but they would quickly exhaust themselves and be driven back, as in the grasshopper raid. General Goldeem looked levelly at his ruler and shook his head. Your scenario is improbable, sire. When they began establishing winter quarters after the war, they became vulnerable. 
If they attack the south, they know our cavalry would strike in the north at their family settlements, which would not be well defended. When the hordes were entirely mobile, they could retreat forever. They could lead pursuers to exhaustion. Now they have fixed property. It's vulnerable. They have no infantry to take or hold ground. Suppose the jackrabbit revolted and joined the invaders. We have kept them disarmed, said the engineer, Colonel Holifot. What will they fight with? Pitchforks? No, but if they could provide the invaders with food, water, shelter, and places to hide, said the general. The question is, would they? The jackrabbit has bitter memories of the northerners, for the wild hordes were contemptuous of the jacks. Frankly, to me, it seems a toss-up whether they hate us more or the northerners. But even with Jack Rabbit's support, Colonel Holifort is right. A mass cavalry attack would exhaust itself in the south, and the northern underbelly would be exposed. They would be more likely to strike the farmlands north of the valley, uh, north of the Wachita Nation. And that is what we are not well prepared for yet. But we are preparing fast, and the whole border will be fortified in two years. The surviving farmers there are well armed now, and since the raid they have a lot of hate for nomads. We have the troops to back them up, but not to attack prematurely, because we have the same problem in the north as they in the south. And that is? We can attack and kill, but we don't have the men or the logistics to occupy grasshopper territory, unless, of course, we weaken our forces in the province. Philpeo became thoughtful. I wonder, he said, why is it that these farms on the eastern fringe which get more rain are not as productive as the refugee lands at the foot of the Rockies, where the land is said to be nearly a desert? There was a brief silence. The Hannigan's remark seemed almost idle, having nothing to do with the nomad as a military problem. Sire, that question is outside my field, said the commanding general, but it may have something to do with discipline. As you know, ours are free peasants, and they work mostly for themselves. When you say productive, you mean it in terms of commercial crops. The ex-nomads are sharecroppers working for landowners, especially the Bishop of Denver. They are forced to work, and they grow only a few crops. I think that is not an explanation, said Father Colonel Potskar, and it's not quite true. The ex-nomads learn from the mountaineers, who have been dry farming for centuries. And as for the rainfall, there is a monastery in the hills north of Valana where the monks keep records of events in the heavens, waiting for the coming of the Lord. One of the things they keep track of is rain, because they pray for the weather. They say the rainfall on the western side of the mountains is now nearly twice what it was eight hundred years ago. That and that alone is your miracle of the ex-nomad farms. Of course the monks think it's their miracle answering eight centuries of prayer. But the runoff for irrigation is better than in ancient times, miracle or no. Well, doesn't the increase apply to the whole plains? asked the monarch. Their records are local, I can't say. Thorn Greycall points out that there are no very old trees in the edges of our forests where the prairie begins looking eastward. That suggests our tree line has been moving slowly westward for a few centuries, but nobody is sure. The nomads may have cut the older trees for wood. Well, said General Goldeem, if nature is closing in on them from the east and the west, they're going to lose their precious desert anyway. We'll just give nature a hand in their extinction. Extinction? I don't want to hear that word again, General, Philpeo Hark said sharply. Pacification and containment are the goals, not extermination. We have achieved that in the south. The jackrabbit population is stable. Except that their young men keep running away to join outlaw bands. The northern nomads kill most of those. One way, maybe the only way, to secure the area between the forests and the western mountains is to colonize. How, sire? Except along the eastern fringe, the land is poor, the water scarce, and the weather horrid. Who could, who would live there but wild herdsmen? Tame herdsmen and a tamer breed of cattle, said Fulpeo Hark. Fenced ranchers as in the south. Some places down there they use yellow wood trees for fences. If you plant them a foot apart and keep them pruned, they make hedges dense enough and thorny enough to keep cattle in. There may not be enough water for agriculture, but wells can be dug to water stock. Some land can be fenced farther north 
where the cold kills yellow wood. We hold much forested land in the east. Enough timber can be shipped to settlers, and they'll pay with beef and hides. And I'm not so sure agriculture is impossible either. The university is studying that problem. Until civilized men can live there, the plains will remain an obstacle. The Pope might as well be living on the moon, and there is no way to unify the continent. But who in hell would want to live there? Hark the Hannigan thought for a moment. The jackrabbit itself has settled down in the south. That's why I won't stand for talk of extermination. But they were always half settled anyway, sire. The wild dog and the grasshopper would prefer to die in battle than give up their ways. To farm or to ranch is hard work. To the nomad, work is slavery. The ex-nomads learned to work when they lost their horses. You merely predict their choice. We must not allow them to have such a choice. There is no need to colonize the plains if we can civilize the wild tribes themselves. I want Urien to send missions to the northern hordes. Cardinal Urien sent Monsignor Samuel to them, and he came back empty-handed, and I think empty-headed. The Christians among them are already tied to Valana, sire, and there is a rumor this pope in Valana means to take the jackrabbit churches away from our archbishop, said the chaplain. There is no pope in Valana, and until there is a pope in New Rome, they are tied to nobody, and Urien hopes to be the next pope. If not... We'll see whether Urian or some anti-pope offers them sweeter salvation, especially to the grasshopper after we punish them. The time is ripe for change. The papacy is up for grabs. The new lord of the hordes is a wild dog, not a grasshopper. We have to influence both. Please understand, continued the Hannigan after a pause, that what I ask of you is to tell me what you think would happen if we do this or we do that, even if I would never do either. To show you what I mean, I ask General Goldeem what he thinks would happen if we undertook a war to simply wipe out the nomad population of the northern plains. He spoke again after a silence. Well, General? Sire, I did not really mean to suggest... Very well, I realize you were just making bellicose noises to exercise your military gland, but go ahead. Answer my question. What would happen if we undertook to wipe out the grasshopper and the wild dog? The general reddened, and after a few seconds said, I think we would fail. We're stretched out. We occupy and police the jackrabbit country below the Nady Ann. If we try to hit the grasshopper hard, he can pull back until our supply wagons can't supply our forces. The nomad can live on carrion and crickets. Why can't you? I can, but we can't fight without powder and shot. Good enough. You have now taken charge of your military gland. However, you can put it to work again and organize a battalion of a special strike force. I want men trained to out-nomad the nomads. Take the biggest, toughest, meanest men you can find, both from our own ranks and from any motherless outlaws you can recruit. Teach them to live on the land, speak nomadic, and learn their way of signaling. And what exactly is the battalion's mission, sire? Not to hold ground, surely? Of course not. The mission is to surprise, kill, destroy, and run. Punitive strikes, in case there's another attack on the farmlands. As for weapons, be sure they have the new biologicals from the university. Graft Thorn Hilbert if you have to. Goldeem looked at Carpios, made a sour mouth, and winked. He did not believe that biologicals were the wave of the military future, and he hoped Carpi agreed. But the pirate admiral merely shrugged. Filpeo turned to the chaplain. Colonel Potscar, suppose my uncle the archbishop had unlimited funds to spend on the conversion of the grasshopper horde. What would happen? Well... If he didn't spend it on young boys, he would waste it sending people like Monsignor Samuel. The mayor seemed to suppress a giggle. How would he spend it on young boys? Charitably? Oh, of course. I was only thinking about how he just last week took in a refugee from Lieberwitz Abbey. He hired a young brother, Terildo, as his assistant and acolyte. He's always thinking of the welfare of young boys. I'm acquainted with my uncle, Father Colonel Potskar. My question is, do you think spending money to Christianize the nomads would be a wise investment? No. 
Why? Because the nomads would be baptized, take the money, ignore the priests, and do as they have always done. Just so. Well, look at the clock. Let us go inspect the wares of the gunsmiths, gentlemen. Wait a moment, sire, said Goldim. I think, Carp, uh, the admiral might have something to say first. Go right ahead, Carp, said the Hannigan. The admiral winced slightly, but said, The guns the alien warriors brought with them disappeared soon after they met Brown Pony. How do you know that? And if true, what does it mean? I heard it from Esset Lloyd, sire. Their homeland has firearms superior to our own, and such guns are now being made on the west coast. He took out a small pistol only to have it snatched from his hand by one of Filpeo's bodyguards. The guard seemed to have trouble determining if the gun was loaded. The admiral assured him that it was not. Where did you get that thing? Filpeo asked. About fifty-eight hundred nautical miles from here, sire. On a great circle course, almost northwest, I'd guess. Or sixty-three hundred miles by rum line course, nearly due west. That's my best guess without looking at the charts. Across the ocean? Not our west coast? No, but they're in production on our west coast by now. Show me how it works, Admiral, said Filpeo. Carpius robbery pulled five cartridges out of his pocket, loaded the revolver, walked to the nearest window, aimed at the sky, and shocked their eardrums by holding down the trigger and rapidly fanning the hammer five times with the edge of his hand. When he turned around, Filpeo looked pale. My God, is that what's been piling up in the Succamint Mountains? I have no way of knowing that, sire. But this special battalion you want Goldie to organize should have a lot of firepower. Give me the weapon. Let's go see the gunsmiths. The admiral released the pistol with obvious reluctance. According to the gunsmith's salesman, the prototype of a similar weapon was already on the drawing board and might be ready in two years. But they were alarmed to see a competitive firearm already in production. Would your possession of this gun hasten production? That is very likely, sire. Carpius robbery winced again. I'll let you have it before you leave the city, Filpeo said, then looked at his admiral's expression and added, Of course you must send it back to its owner here when you're done with it. Certainly, sire. Brown Pony's interview with His Imperial Majesty Filpeo Hark, Mayor Hannigan VII, happened in City Hall, also called the Imperial Palace, on Thursday the 5th of January thus giving the lie to a jackrabbit rumor extant in the province, which held that Filpeo Hark always had himself locked up in his private quarters for three days about the time of the full moon, and would see no one. That Thursday the moon was full, and after opening the sealed papers from Pope Amen, the monarch flew into such a rage that Blacktooth wished the rumor were true. He and Wege were made to sit on a bench in the corridor outside the mayoral throne room and they could hear only muffled shouting without being able to understand much of it. None of the shouting was done by the cardinal. Presently a priest with a monsignor's belly band came down the hall and spoke to the guards. One of them knocked hard, opened the door, and shouted, Monsignor Samuel, in obedience to the Lord Mayor's summons, and pushed him inside, then followed him and closed the door. There was a lull in the shouting. Blacktooth had never seen Shanuel before, but had heard enough about him from both his master and father's stepson Snake to know that he would be anything but a friendly witness, and that Brown Pony's actions at the funeral festival on the plains and his participation in the affair with the wild horse woman were on the court's agenda. He exchanged a glance with Wege and saw that both of them were aware of this. The guard who took Samuel inside now opened the door and spoke to the other guard. Seize them, he said, and again closed the door. The guard had no way to seize them, but he pointed his gun at Wege and told him to throw his swords aside. Two seconds later he was flat on his back with a sword point at his throat. Get his weapon, brother. It was a suggestion, not a command. No, said Blacktooth. That was a mistake, Wege. Remember the cardinal. Wege looked at the door. Then he booted the fallen guard in the stomach. Having taken the wind out of the man, he grabbed the gun and burst through the door. Nimi observed the startled monarch sitting on his throne. 
Brown Pony had been forced to his knees, and the guard was holding a pistol to his head. Wege aimed at Filpeo Hark and barked, Let my master go! Nimi leaped away from the door, for the mare was flanked by two more guards with raised muskets. The man, gasping for breath, crawled toward Nimi, who leaped over him to avoid a fight. There were three distinct explosions, and silence, followed by Filpeo Hark's voice, Take him and the one in the hall away! Blacktooth looked inside again. Wege lay in a growing pool of blood. One of the musketeers was down, but the mayor himself was holding a pistol. It looked like the one Idria had showed to him in the cave. It was impossible to guess who had killed Wege. All weapons were still pointed at his body. When the Hannigan saw Nimi standing white-faced in the door, he raised his pistol again, but the monk leaped aside. He made no attempt to escape. A frightened and humiliated Cardinal Brown Pony was still kneeling there. One of the jails at Hannigan City was part of the public zoo, where interesting prisoners were exhibited in cages not unlike those used for cougars, true wolves, and monkeys. On the way in, they passed an open area girded by a heavy fence on which there was a sign saying, Camellus Dromedarius Africa Contrib Admiral Effondoli. God, what are those things? Brown Pony asked. It says right there, snapped the jail guard. Don't stop the gawk. They're domesticated? How astute of you! Otherwise the boy wouldn't be riding on the animal's back, eh? Are they useful? They can go for longer periods without water than horses. The Admiral says they are used in desert warfare where he got them. Are there more of them? Not as far as I know, but there soon will be. He pointed to a female with a large belly. But they're the only camels in captivity on this continent as far as I know. The Admiral brought them in the hold of a giant schooner. Now move along, move along. They were escorted past cells full of lesser animals and then cells full of human prisoners. On each cell was posted the name of the occupant species. The humans were mostly murderers. A Homo sicarius, a Homo matricidus, but two homines sediciosi, and one child rapist. All of them jeered as the two clerics were locked into the third cell on the left. The jailer unwrapped a sign and posted it above the door of the cage, out of sight and out of reach. The man in the cell across the roofless corridor from theirs looked at it, entered a whispered conversation with the man in the adjacent cell, and fell silent, watching them as if in awe. His own cage was labelled not homo, but grillets, grasshopper, and his crimes were war crimes. His jeering had been limited to nomad grunts, so when the jailer was gone, Blacktooth spoke to the man in his native tongue. What does our sign say? he asked. The man did not answer. He and Brown Pony were staring at each other. I know you, the cardinal said in wild dog. You were with Hultor Braum. The nomad nodded. Yes, he answered in his own dialect. We took you south to meet your poop. You asked me why the Lord Scharf called us a war party. Now you know. I was the only captive to my great shame. But Fortier says that you tried to murder the Hannigan. Is that all our sign says? Nimi asked. Evidently the nomad could not read. He conversed again with the man named Fort, then shook his head. I don't know what all those words mean. Fort himself, a Peter asked, spoke to them. It says heresy, simony, the crime of wounding majesty, as well as attempted regicide. Fortunately, the hour was late and the zoo was closed for the day. Although the other prisoners wore uniforms, none were furnished for the cardinal and his secretary. Each of them received three blankets against the January cold. The cage was open to the weather on the south side. At least they would get sun during part of the day. The cardinal still had not fully recovered from the curse of Meldon. My lady of the buzzards had a buzzard's breath, it seems, he told Blacktooth when he was feeling almost hysterically cheerful. When Urien's angel of battle fights my buzzard of battle, which do you bet on to win? Lord, doesn't that old prayer go, Holy Michael Archangel, deliver us from battle? No, it doesn't, Brother Monk. It's defend us in battle. But, 
deliver us from the snares of the devil, as you well know. But what would you bet right now on either prayer being answered? Nothing. If I remember the nomad myth right, your Berrigan, since you claim her, always mourns as she eats the fallen warriors, the children of her sister, the Day Maiden. She doesn't want war either. You are right. We must pray for peace while girding for war. Of course you are right, Nimi. You are always right. Nimi hung his head and frowned. But Brown Pony was not being just sarcastic. To avoid being understood by other prisoners, they were speaking Neo-Latin, and the Cardinal's speech was unguarded. I mean it. You were right to leave the Abbey, although you are a monk of Leibowitz. You were right to fall in love with a girl like Idria. You are right to disapprove of my importing and selling West Coast weapons without telling His Holiness. Blacktooth looked at him in surprise. Brown Pony noticed the look and went on. Pope Linus VI, who gave red hats to your late abbot and me, was the man who assigned me the task in a letter which I still have in Valana. Linus told me not to show it to anyone unless I got caught, and then only to a pope. Frankly, Nimi, I have almost wanted to get caught. Oh, Blacktooth thought it over. It was certainly true that Brown Pony had not been cautious, allowing even Abelot the Mouth to learn of his activities. But he would probably rather be caught by Amen Speckledbird. Suddenly the Cardinal seemed less sinister, an unwell man with a hump on his back and an uneasy conscience. Fortunately, during visitors' hours when children would spit at them through the bars of their cages, the human animals were fed raw beef and raw potatoes for the amusement of the crowd. No one was watching when they ate cornmeal mush for breakfast. Nimi remembered from B. Dulles that eating raw meat, or better still, drinking fresh blood, as the nomad sometimes did, was good for the patient's own blood, and he persuaded Brown Pony to eat some of the meat. Nimi liked flesh raw, if fresh, but sometimes the jail meat tasted like coyote kill, and raw potatoes gave them both a stomachache. Philpale's government did provide enough mush to keep the zoo's display specimens from looking starved. During their stay at the prison, three inmates were led from their death cells to the chopping block. From fellow prisoners they learned that Wuxin had been replaced with a chopping machine, not another electric chair. The electric dynamo, an expensive affair, could be put to more productive use than frying felons. The moon phase had waned from full to new. Then one afternoon, past visitors' hours, a man in a lacy surplice came and stood looking in at them. Torildo. The former brother winked at Nimi, but remained silent. What do you want, man? Brown Pony snapped. My lord, the Archbishop wonders if you would like the Eucharist brought to you here. I would like bread and wine with which to offer mass myself. I'll ask, said Torildo, and departed. Find out if the Pope knows we're in jail, Blacktooth called after him. Nimi, hissed the Cardinal. But Torildo had stopped. Without looking back, he said, He knows, and resumed his departure. Damn, it's all over. Brown Pony was angry and downcast. Blacktooth decided to let him alone. He rolled up in his blankets and took a nap in the icy wind. Three days later, Torildo came back. This time, Blacktooth winked at him. Torildo blushed. I never saw a sarcastic wink before, he said. What about the bread and wine? the cardinal asked. Your eminence will not have time to say mass. He produced a letter from a sleeve and a key from his pocket. I am to let you go when you read this, and promise to obey these instructions. Brown Pony accepted the papers and began reading, handing each page to Blacktooth as he finished. Damn, it's all over, the cardinal repeated, again downcast, but without anger. I thought every cardinal had a church in New Rome, Nimi remarked as soon as he read the first lines. There is a St. Michael's in New Rome, Brown Pony told him, and it's Urian's church, but there he is not called the Angel of Battle. They read in silence while Torildo watched and impatiently drummed the key in his palm. The first page was thus. To his eminence, Elia Cardinal Brown Pony, deacon of St. Maisie's. 
from Urian Cardinal Benefas, Archbishop of St. Michael the Archangel. Inasmuch as the pretended Pope, one Amen Spettelberg, has by trying to resign the papacy admitted that he was never Pope, it has pleased His Imperial Grace the Mayor of Texarch to pardon all of your crimes except attempted regicide, for which you and your servant Blacktooth St. George are under suspended sentences of death. You are to be expelled from the Empire as Personae non gratae. By countersigning this letter in the place indicated below, you enter a plea to the remaining charge against you of nolo contendere, which His Grace is persuaded to accept, and you agree to be escorted under guard as swiftly as possible to a crossing point of your choosing on the Bay Ghost River, and promise never to return except by order of a reigning pontiff, a general council, or a conclave and only for the purpose of direct passage to or from New Rome from the nearest border crossing. There was a place for their signatures below a statement acknowledging the charges with a plea of no contest, and agreeing to obey a decree of permanent banishment. The other pages were a more or less personal plea from Benefes to Brown Pony and other Balanan cardinals to accept New Rome as the proper place for an immediate conclave to elect a pope. When Brown Pony finished reading, he looked up at Torildo. The acolyte was holding a metal pen and a file of ink out to him through the bars. They quickly signed, and the key turned in the lock. Their trip back to the Bay Ghost by coach on the main military highway west was a fast, rough ride, taking less than ten days. Before they left the province, the guards permitted Brown Pony to buy two horses from a jackrabbit farmer. The moon was full again, allowing them to ride sometimes by night. When they came at last to Leibowitz Abbey, an excited abbot Olshuan knelt to kiss the cardinal's ring and tell him that he, Brown Pony, was now Pope-elect, chosen by an angry conclave of Valanan cardinals called by Pope Amen before his resignation. The cardinals were eagerly awaiting his accepto. Who brought this crazy message? Brown Pony demanded. Why, it was an old guest of ours who went to New Rome with you, namely Wushin. Cardinal Norwat sent him with a letter from the Curia. It's in my office, and an oral message from Sorley. What was the oral message? That he had opposed the conclave, but hoped you would accept the election anyway. He knows it isn't legal, was the Red Deacon's immediate comment. Of course I won't accept. You have a more immediate problem said Olshuan, recovering from his initial awe of the cardinal. And what is that, Dom Abicu? Have you told Brother St. George about his young lady? She came for him while you were gone. He thought she had died. She said you knew she was alive. Brown Pony was suddenly nervous. We'll talk about that. Let's go to your office. I need to read the letter from the Curia. Chapter 19 let all guests who arrive be received as Christ, for he is going to say, I came as a guest, and you received me. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 53 They had arrived at Leibowitz Abbey during the recreational hour in the late afternoon of Ash Wednesday. The Yellow Guard presided over several kickboxing matches between novices, and even the professed brothers Wren and Singing Cow were sparring clumsily. Blacktooth observed that the style of fighting differed in some respects from that of Wuxin, although the axe would never admit to having a style. However, Foreman Jing, who had fenced with Wuxin, called it the way of the homeless sword, and a style of no style. Brown Pony's first duty was to confer with Abbot Olshuan. Blacktooth's was to bring bad news to the Yellow Guard. First he established himself in the guest room. "'You're still here!' he exclaimed upon entering. "'No, no,' said Unmu Kun, the jackrabbit gun smuggler. "'I'm back for the second time since you left.' He was full of wine and the urge to talk. "'The jackrabbit Weegis and Bear Spirit have chosen me as Scharf. Did you know that?' Nimmy doubted it, but didn't much care. By looking around at their war gear, Nemi knew the comrades of the late Wege, although they were working hard around the abbey, participating in the liturgy and teaching weaponless fighting to novices, were still staying in the guest house along with Nmu Kun. 
This to Nimi meant that Olshawan was not about to take them on as postulants or novices without permission from on high. They greeted him with smiles and handclasps as they returned from the bouts in the courtyard, but Unmu was still talking and laughing about his adventures in the province, and the warriors were a polite lot. Only their eyes questioned him, Wege? Where? But they waited for the smuggler to finish. Brown Pony's flirtations with churches in the province had made it easier for Unmu to sell guns, he said. He had only to ask a pastor whether he had seen Cardinal Brown Pony on his way toward Hannigan City. If the priest said that he had not, Unmu hurried away. If he had seen him and showed the slightest enthusiasm, it meant there existed a group of local partisans wanting arms. One cadre, which called itself the Knights of Empty Sky, was a charity organization. He had supplied them not only with infantry weapons, but made a special trip to bring them three cannon that fired either a peach-sized ball or a load of heavy buckshot, for those badly in need of charity. According to Scharf Unmu, the knights anointed each cannon with oil, placed it in a well-corked box, dug a shallow grave in the churchyard, and buried it by night. Blacktooth murmured politely in reply, but finally turned his back toward the tipsy smuggler and faced the five warriors who watched him expectantly with those dark eyes with uncreased lids. He was ashamed of his failure to befriend an alien in a strange land for no better reason than that he was not Wushin. Brother Wege was killed while defending his master, he told them, rather loudly to silence Unmu. I heard it happen, but I did not see it. There were three shots. There were four men holding guns pointed at him when I looked through the door, and he was already down. He had taken a gun he took from one of our guards. If he fired it, he must have missed. I am very sorry. Whether it was a mistake or not, he was living out his duty. He was a better monk than I. Was it a mistake? asked Jing Yu Wan, the foreman. Who were those four men? Gai Si wanted to know. Did he have last rites? asked Wu So Lo. A proper funeral? Dare we ask Abbot Oshawan to say a mass for him? Nimi tried to answer some of their questions and apologized for his inability to answer others. He finished his talk with them by promising to see Oshawan about a mass for the repose of souls on behalf of Wege, and he went at once to the abbot's office. The door was open, and Brown Pony was sitting at the abbot's desk and talking while Oshawan sat on a stool. It's a shame the Hannigan has a monopoly on the telegraph, the cardinal complained as he finished writing a letter which Nimi was certain was addressed to the Villanan Curia. He turned sideways at the desk to look at the abbot who owned the desk, and he saw Nimi in the doorway, beckoned him in, and continued, The church has the money to hire Philpeo's technicians. We could build a line from here to Villana, and perhaps from Villana to the Oregonians. The abbot said, Money enough, yes, but what about the copper? I heard Hannigan had to confiscate coinage, pots, and church bells. Buy it you might, but who has it to sell? I'm told silver conducts electrical essence even better than copper, and I'm not sure it's practical, but we have a source of silver. Oh, where is that? Brown Pony changed the subject. He handed also in a letter and asked, What do you think of this? Come in, Nimmy, come in. The abbot took it and studied for a bit, holding it so that Blacktooth might read it as well if he wanted to. To Sorley Cardinal Norwat, Secretary of Extraordinary Ecclesiastical Concerns. From Elia Cardinal Brown Pony, Vicar Apostolic to the Hordes. Non accepto. You know it is not possible to hold a conclave without notification of every cardinal on the continent. The Curia must have recommended to His Holiness that he clarify the law on both resignations and conclaves, and I cannot believe that he made legal a conclave such as the one the Curia has apparently conducted. You know it, and I know it. You must have been a minority in an angry sacred college. My imprisonment by the Hennigan forced His Holiness to offer his resignation, but I am free now, and I pray that he reconsider. He is not bound by anything he did under pressure of blackmail. Let him renounce his resignation, saying that it was forced. If he will not do that, then you must summon every cardinal, including me here at the abbey, to Valana to choose another successor of St. Peter, complying in every way with existing legislation. Although I appreciate the irony of electing a pope that Hannigan just released from jail in a trade-off of this kind, 
I have to say again, non accepto, as you sorely knew I would. I await instructions from my sovereign pontiff, Pope Amen, and when they come, it would please me greatly if you can spare Wushin to bring them here. You ask me what I think? How should I know? Olshuan said while shaking his head. In the name of God, my lord, I am only a monk of Leberwitz. I am not Abbot Jared. My only vocation is here. My God is here, and although I am a servant of Holy Mother Church— Oh, bother! Stop! Stop, please! I'm sorry I showed it to you. Jared should have refused the red hat, but the seventh Linus insisted. I know that, and you probably do, too. I'm trying to remember if an abbot here ever refused a pope's request, my lord. Maybe not, but if Amen Speckleberg made you a cardinal, what would you say? Olshuan hesitated before he said, No, not even from him. It was plain that even those who knew him only by hearsay adored the old priest, hermit, magician, pope. But among lovers of power only brown pony seemed to feel a deep affection for him. Nimi presented his petition on behalf of Jingu Wan's men and their deceased brother, and Olshuan promised a mass. The next morning Brown Pony sent Blacktooth to Sanley Bowitz with the message, and gold enough to hire a courier with two horses to carry it quickly to Valana. The messenger promised to ride from dawn to dusk, and by night when the moon permitted, and to wait in Valana for a reply, unless Wu Xin replaced him. While he was returning to the abbey, he met Guy C. riding toward the village. They exchanged greetings and paused for a moment. Nimi asked why he was going to town, and Guy C. said, After you left, the cardinal decided to send another message. I have it with me. Another letter to Valana? No. New Jerusalem. He frowned at himself. You have a right to ask that? Probably not. I'll try to forget it. They went their opposite directions. Nimi knew well what the Cardinal had to say to Major Dion. Somehow a small weapon from their west coast arsenal had found its way into the hand of Filpeo Hark. Both master and servant had seen it. There seemed to be no other possibility than that New Jerusalem had been infiltrated by the Hannigan's agent. But he would not ask Brown Pony about it, lest he make trouble for Guy C., who told him the letter's destination. While Nimi in October had found unfriendly attitudes in the atmosphere at the monastery, he now found them downright hostile in early March. He was being shunned again by the professed. On the other hand, some novices seemed to find him much more interesting than before. He tried to find out what had happened since, but unexpected visitors was the only mumbled answer he could get to his questions. The three novices who were in the abbot's waiting room overheard a shouting match between the abbot and Cardinal Brownpony, or Pope Brown Pony, as one of them called him, and mentioned it to Nimi. Very little of the shouting was understandable, but that it was about Blacktooth, they were certain. Blacktooth decided to confront the Cardinal, but upon finding him kneeling before the Lady Altar praying to the Virgin, he merely knelt beside him and waited. Brown Pony stirred, and Nimi sensed his discomfort. The Red Deacon crossed himself and arose. The monk waited a few seconds and did the same. Brown Pony was pacing toward the door. Nimi shuffled behind him. Hearing the shuffle, the Red Deacon turned. Do you want something, Brother St. George? Only to know what's going on. They walked outside and stopped. I knew she might be alive, but I did not want to arouse false hopes. Go climb the mesa of last resort. The man who saw her last may be living there now. The Cardinal started walking away. She? Who? Nimi called after him. Brown Pony looked back at him without answering. Idria! Go to the mesa. I'll tell the abbot I sent you. He wanted to send you himself, but it was my responsibility. I let you down. Pale as a ghost, Nimi hurried toward the kitchen to beg some hard biscuits and water for the journey. From the cook, who was in a good humour, he received the biscuits, some cheese, and a wine-skin filled with a mixture of wine and water. Then he went to the guest-house to pack a bedroll. It was too late to leave that day, so he slept and left before daylight, while his brethren were being called to Lord's. It was a long hike to last resort, and the first thing he saw when he arrived at the usual way of ascent was a recent grave with two sticks lashed together for a cross. Its meaning eluded him. 
After the slow climb, the sun was sinking behind distant mountains. He went straight to the ramshackle shelter he had discovered the previous year and found it rebuilt, but no one was home. He was reluctant to try the door. After shouting a few times and hearing no answer, he sat on his bedroll to wait. The light was becoming too dim for reading Compline, so he said his rosary, sometimes contemplating the mystery of each decade, and sometimes contemplating the beautiful waif who had stolen it from him. The grave at the foot of the mesa kept coming to mind. He shook his head impatiently and resumed contemplation of the fifth glorious mystery, which was the coronation in heaven of the mother by the son, after her bodily assumption. But there was no before or after, according to Amen Specklebird, for whom the coronation of the Virgin was an event belonging to eternity. The Virgin's face became Idria's, and he finished the last decade as quickly as possible. When he looked up, a gaunt silhouette with a club raised on high stood over him against the twilight sky. It croaked, Don't get up! Who are you? What are you doing here? I am Brother Blacktooth St. George, and my master Cardinal Brown Pony sent me. Oh, I remember you now, said the old Jew, squinting in the twilight. On the road to New Jerusalem you asked too many questions. Did you make rain for them? Still asking too many questions. Your master sent you with a message? For me? No, he sent me with a question. What can you tell me about Idria? You saw her. Where did she go? The old Jew was silent for several seconds. I happened to be of some assistance to her when she fled from her father. She came here with me after the abbey turned her away. She had her babies. She went away. Babies? Twin boys? They were not alike, though. She left them with me because they were not perfect. Her father would have killed them and she had nowhere else to go but home. She knows too much about affairs in New Jerusalem to risk getting caught on the way east to the valley. Where are the children? The milk of my goat did not agree with them. I took them to Sanley Poets. I left them with a woman who promised to take care of them until they were sent for. By whom? Hmm, how should I know? Someone from the valley? Or you, the father, probably? Idria told you that I am the father? She is a talkative young woman. She was here for, hmm, seven or eight weeks. She was always singing or talking. I miss her singing, not her talking. He groped in his bag and handed Nimmy pieces of flint and steel. That's the hearth there in the shadow. Like the tinder, the wood is stacked. Was it a hard birth? Very hard. I had to cut. She lost a lot of blood. Cup, you are a physician? I am all things. Nimmy got the fire started at last. Following the old hermit's instructions, he found in the hut a box of crumbled dry meal, dumped two double handfuls to a pot with a bale, and added water from a great jug by the door. Hang it from the tripod. Stir it with a clean stick. What is that stuff? Food, father. Don't call me that. I'm no priest. Did I say you were? You're a father, though. I could call you dad. Blacktooth felt himself reddening. Why don't you call me Nimmy? Is that what they call you at the Abbey? No, but my master does. Is he not at the Abbey? Yes. Well, it seems your master let you think she was dead. Isn't it so? He said he couldn't be sure, didn't want to arouse false hope. I think I believe him. Ha! The old Jew began chuckling to himself. Nimmy stirred the pot until the mush turned thick. The old hermit brought out metal plates, spoons, and cups. Nimmy pulled his biscuits out of the bedroll, poured the cups full of his watered wine. They sat on a bench made of a flat stone supported by fat legs that were sunk in the ground, and ate dinner by the firelight. Blacktooth crossed himself and whispered the blessing. The old Jew, holding his bowl, sang out a few words of prayer in a strange tongue which Nimmy supposed to be Hebrew. The mush, Benjamin told him, was made of processed mesquite beans he had brought from Sanley Boats. Later in the year he would pick and process his own. 
He had raised goats here before and would try to acquire a herd again. He spoke of past ages as if he had been there personally. Several times he spoke of an abbot Jerome, as if he were still ruling the monastery, and referred to the conquests of Hannigan II as if they were still happening. For him all ages seemed to coexist in his own private now. Nimmy spent the night inside the old man's hut. Again he dreamed the dream of the open grave at the abbey, the one with the baby in it. But he awoke in surprise from the dream, knowing that Jared Candemon was buried there. In the morning he dared to ask Benjamin about the recent grave at the foot of the mesa. The hermit denied any knowledge of it, then noticed Nimmy's doubt. If you think I buried her there, go try to dig her up. I believe you. Nimmy was not in a hurry to leave. His anger toward the cardinal had been aroused, and he wanted to rid himself of it or turn it into mere diminished trust. Brown Pony had withheld the truth from him before, but he could not remember an outright lie. From what the old man said he knew Edria thought he lied, but she had not heard his actual words to Blacktooth. He stayed an extra day and night. The sky was overcast, and a cold wind had risen. The water skin and the hermit's jug were empty. Where do you get water up here? Benjamin looked at him, pointed casually at the sky, then continued milking the goat. Twenty seconds passed. A large, cold drop of water hit the monk in the face. Moments later there was a brief cloudburst. Nimmy asked no more questions. The old hermit complained that Nimmy was eating more food than he brought with him, so he left shortly after dawn on the third day. When gravel came rattling down the way behind him, he looked back up the path. The old Jew was following him down with a shovel. Because of the dream, Nimmy had a brief vision of an open grave, and on the third day she arose again. But the grave was not open. Instead, they now found two graves at the foot of the mesa. Obviously one had been dug only yesterday. The old Jew leaned on his shovel and squinted at Nimmy. No, I won't dig, the monk said. Goodbye and thank you. He hurried away toward Sandley Bowitz without looking back. Benjamin had given him the old woman's name. He found her old adobe house without difficulty, and counted seven children playing in the yard. He suddenly realized this was the orphanage the abbey had always supported in the town. The woman was sullen. She seemed to know who he was and why he was here, but considered him an outcast and a scoundrel. Why did you not come for them ten days ago? They have been taken away for adoption. By whom? Three sisters. Where were they taken? I'm not at liberty to say. When Blacktooth showed signs of anger, she called him a scoundrel, a libertine, a false monk. She ordered him to leave at once and retired to the old adobe building. Where did the mother go? He yelled after her to no effect. So he marched in gloom back to the abbey. The shooting began while the monks were in the convent's refectory for lunch on the following day. Atop the parapet wall, Father Levian, now prior, was fasting when the first distant boom occurred. He was praying, as he often did, toward the grandeur of the broken desert horizon and to the God who made it. The first explosion scarcely distracted him from prayer, although his eyes scanned the open country for a sign of smoke. After the second boom, Un Mu Kun came running out of the refectory and across the courtyard. He saw Levian on the wall and raced up the stairs to join him. Where? he asked breathlessly. I don't know. I didn't see anything. Boom. The interval between explosions was about a minute and a half. It sounds like it's coming from over there, said Levian, pointing down the valley. The crosswind makes it sound that way. Unmu replied, looking straight at the mesa of last resort. After the fourth boom, he pointed at the mesa. There was indeed a tiny wisp of smoke up there. On the fifth boom, a plume of dust shot up from a spot about two hundred paces from the abbey. Damn, he's getting our range, cried the smuggler. On the sixth boom, a cannonball hit the center of the road in front of the abbey, bounced through the open gates, caromed off the stone curb around the rose bed, and went on bouncing directly into the convent and through the refectory doors. Screaming was heard, and monks came pouring out of the building. Take cover! yelled the jackrabbit. 
He's got two balls left. There were no more shots, and while the monks at their meagre Lenten lunch were badly frightened, the only damage was in the kitchen. But Unmu had indicted himself by knowing too much. The cannonball was found, and although it had been deformed and somewhat flattened, there appeared to be a few characters in Hebrew scratched upon it. An expert was summoned. The legible part of the inscription said, Maketh bread to spring forth from the earth. It was a blessing over food. Apt enough, considering the target, said the translator. There was an immediate conference in the abbot's office. Blacktooth was called in and appointed interrogator, since he knew the man as well as anyone, and spoke his dialect best. They met in the guesthouse. By what right are you staying here, good simpleton? I was invited, said the jackrabbit. By whom? By Abbot Olshu, and who else? At the cardinal's insistence? Probably. The abbot knows what you do? I don't know. But even if he knows, I would not, I could not, bring my merchandise here. I never have. So you bury it in the desert here until you're ready to travel again. Then you dig it up. This time the old man dug it up. My bad luck. I thought he never came down and never had visitors. It's the first time I used that spot. I didn't expect him to desecrate a grave. He's a little crazy, but not stupid. He knew it was no grave. So he dug up your cannon and sent us a message with it. He must have exceeded the maximum load to reach this far, and pointed it up about forty degrees. And he's shooting from about five hundred feet above us. Was he trying to kill someone? Old Benjamin? No. He was telling the abbot about you. I'd better leave. What was in the other grave? Rifles. If you're going to try to reclaim your merchandise, someone is going to go with you. There are six of us. Any one of us can manage you. Even you? The jackrabbit laughed. Blacktooth knocked the wind out of him and threw him in the corner. Yunmu looked up in surprise, gasping for breath, but without anger. Why did you do that, Brother St. George? To show you if you get into a quarrel with the old man over your guns, you're going to lose. But they are my guns. They are for the grasshopper, and I am sharp. You know that's a lie. You told me yourself you get a commission. Sure, if I sell them, if I lose them, they're mine. I don't understand. I have to pay for them. Who do you think owns them, Cardinal Brown Pony? I don't know, but I doubt it. Mayor Dion, probably. But whoever sells them, you're only the broker. I am also sharp, secretly, of course. Unmu Kuhn disappeared from the abbey that night, never to return. Being related to the royal tribe was prerequisite to election as sharf of a horde, and Nimi doubted that any nomad north of the Nady Anne would recognize his claim. Guy C. was sent galloping toward last resort on the abbot's horse to protect the old Jew, and if possible to negotiate the surrender of the weapons. He returned the following day dragging one cannon and reported two empty graves, also reported that Benjamin had not opened the second grave. Evidently, Kuhn had recovered his rifles and moved on. But so it was that Leibowitz Abbey came into possession of modern ordnance, but as yet no ammunition. Abbey Q. Olshuan locked the cannon in the basement room with the rusty weapons from earlier centuries. Novices reported another loud argument between the cardinal and the abbot behind closed doors. This time it was about guns. Brown Pony emerged angry and humiliated. He told Blacktooth that Olshuan felt the abbey's hospitality had been abused. He knows now that the jackrabbit is being armed, he told Nimi. He's afraid for the monastery if the Hannigan suspects his monks are involved. He wants Jing's men to leave. But they have nothing to do with it. No, but the concept of warrior monks is alien to Dom Abiquiu's idea of Christianity. To him it's a scandal. We should leave here soon. Did the jackrabbit grandmothers really choose Ummu Kun as sharf, as he claims? Everything is secretive in jackrabbit country, Nimi. With them the test is not legal, but practical. If the men follow him in battle, he is sharf. If they don't, he is not, no matter what the Ouija's say. Well into Lent, a messenger from Hannigan City brought a petition addressed to all bishops and signed by Urian Benefers and seven other cardinals. It announced a general council of the church to be held in New Rome six weeks after Easter, 
and all bishops and abbots able to travel must attend. The purpose of the council would be to draft new legislation concerning conclaves. Only a sovereign pontiff can summon a general council, said Brown Pony, and refused to sign. Orshuan also refused. The messenger shrugged and rode on. Wu Xin arrived the following day with the expected summons to a conclave in Valana. He was warmly greeted by Brown Pony, Black Tooth, and the Yellow Guard, but the summons he brought was rather strange. Apparently the curia knew of the petition for a general council, for the tone of the summons was angry, and the last paragraph threatened excommunication to any cardinal who attended a rump session in New Rome, where schismatics and heretics will try to install a known sodomite to sit on the throne of Peter the Apostle. The document was signed by Amen Episcopus Romae Servus Servorum Dei, but Brown Tony was suspicious of the signature, and the language was certainly not speckled "'Things are getting ugly,' said the Red Deacon. "'We must leave here at once.' Chapter 20 We think it sufficient for the daily dinner, whether at the sixth or the ninth hour, that every table have two cooked dishes on account of individual infirmities, so that he who for some reason cannot eat of the one may make his meal of the other. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 39 for more than a year now it seemed to Blacktooth that he was always on the road. This time there was no coach to Valana. Eight men with sixteen horses rode the papal highway north. Several miles south of the side road which led to Shard's place and on into the mountains of New Jerusalem, Cardinal Brown Pony stopped, called Blacktooth and Wushin to his side, and announced a detour around that whole area. Blacktooth protested, "'My lord, the only one who needs to take a detour is me.' I can ride east out into the scrub, travel a few miles north, and then catch up with you on the road before dark. No, said the cardinal, I want no more than one of us to be seen. Wu Xin, pick a man to ride past the Glep guards and take a message to Magister Dion. The message is really for Shard as much as for the mayor, but Shard will accept orders only from Dion. Why not send me? Max offered. No, Shard remembers you. Nimmy said he may remember any or all of us. He went for his gun and came out shooting when we were on our way to the abbey last fall. Axe went to consult the warrior monks. When he came back, he said, I suggest Guy C. He is the smallest target and rides the fastest horse. If he can't find a way around, he can wait until dark and gallop right up Scarecrow Alley. There's moon enough. Brown Pony nodded and beckoned to Guy C., then instructed him to avoid any contact with the families that guarded the passage. Tell this to Dion. On the east, open gates to the wild dog and to the grasshopper. On the west, send gifts to the curia. Now repeat that, please. On the east, open gates to the wild dog and to the grasshopper. On the west, send gifts to the curia. Good. Then remind him of what Nimi and I saw in the hand of the Hannigan. I sent him a message about it from the Abbey. If he got it, he will know what has to be done. Afterward, he will provide you with a well-laden pack-mule. Leave New Jerusalem from the west and come on to Milana as fast as you can. Guy C. dismounted, bowed to the cardinal, and sat down beside the trail. He'll wait until dark, said Axe. I, too, think it's safer that way. Brown Pony looked at Blacktooth. Why so disappointed? he asked. It's nothing, my lord. You were hoping someone would be able to find out if Idria is in her father's house. I know it's not practical. It would be dangerous. Never mind. Guy C. can ask the mayor about her, and get the same kind of truth about her as he gave to me. Brown Pony shrugged. I can't tell Dion what to say or do, except with my own property. It was the first time the cardinal had spoken of the arsenal as his own property, but that was not Blacktooth's concern. My lord, I wish Guy C. would not mention Idria to Dion. Why not? Because he will be wondering about a spy or a traitor when Guy C. tells him about the gun we saw in Philpeo's hand. And Idria ran away from home during that time. We know where she went, but the mayor may not believe her. The cardinal looked down at Guy C. Did you hear and understand that? Yes, my lord cardinal. I'll be discreet. We'll see you in Valana. Now let's ride a mile or so back into the juniper scrub. 
Three days later, they camped in the scrub half a mile east of the Papal Highway on the evening of Monday, April 3rd. It would be the night of the Paschal full moon of Holy Week. But the sun was not yet set, and because their food supply was running short, Nimi went forth in search of roots and edible greens that might be beginning to sprout, while Wuxian took the party's only firearm and went to hunt small game while the cardinal's warriors gathered wood and tended the fire. Brown Pony himself, clearly exhausted from the long journey and developing a nasty cough, wrapped himself in blankets and with his head on a saddle fell asleep before dark. Blacktooth dug up a few bulbs of last year's wild onions from the bank of a half-frozen creek bed. They had little value except as seasoning in case the axe came back with meat. Of course it was a day of Lenten abstinence, but it was also an emergency, especially for the cardinal, who had never fully recovered from his ordeal in the breeding pit. Nimi tried to keep track of his direction from camp by watching the sunset, the stars of twilight, and finally the glow of the campfire in the distance. He found yucca and uprooted some skinny tubers from the hard ground with a sharp stick. He heard two gunshots, and decided that they came from Wuxin's pistol, but they were closely followed by a third, too closely for the axe to have reloaded. A horse galloped past along a creek bank at the foot of the hill, and he caught a glimpse of a nomad rider. There was a burst of shouting from the direction of the camp, accompanied by one more gunshot, but he could make out only the voices of Foreman Jing and Wu So Lo in their native tongue, until he heard Axe shout a death threat in poor but understandable wild dog, and a weaker echo from the Cardinal that the threat was real and enforceable. Nimi hurried back toward the firelight as quietly as possible. Two nomad outlaws were sitting on the ground with their hands tied behind them, surrounded by Brown Pony's guards. The Cardinal himself was sitting up in his bedroll. A strange small horse was tied to a juniper, and two unfamiliar muskets were propped against a log. Nimmy, where are you? It was Brown Pony's voice. Blacktooth hurried into the firelight and dumped the yucca and wild onions beside the body of a dead wild dog. The Cardinal winced at the odor of the onions. Wuxin explained. Three motherless ones with only one horse among them had tried to steal two horses from the Cardinal. One had succeeded, but the men who had dismounted to search and rob Brown Pony had been surprised and captured by Axe and the others who had heard their approach. The scruffy nomads were looking around in terror at the strange warriors with their long blades. Nimi, you tell them what the situation is, said Axe with a wink. Blacktooth brushed the root dirt from his robe and went to stand behind his master. Facing them across the fire, he drew himself up, pointed at one of the men, and said in impeccable grasshopper, I know you. You haunt this region. Now you have accosted the vicar apostolic to the hordes, to whom even the Kisachtri Verdar Isle Hengenschur comes for counsel. Not to mention the grasshopper Schaff Iltur Braum. Your fellow bandit has just stolen the horse of the high shaman of all Christendom, the next Schaff and great uncle of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. He has also been chosen by the buzzard of battle. The Ouija's have announced it. Don't overdo it, Nimmy, said the cardinal in church speak. Horse for horse, said the bolder of the two. You take this horse, great man, we even. Nimmy ignored him and spoke again to the man he recognized. You. It was holy madness himself, now lord of the hordes, that stopped you from raping Idria last year near Shard's place, not far from here. The outlaw shrugged, but seemed suddenly meek. Brown Pony picked himself up out of the bedroll and went to inspect the scruffy Mustang. Having walked around the little mare, he faced them and said sternly in Wild Dog, She belongs to the Hungan Fuji Vern. You dare to violate a mare of the wild horsewoman? Lord Isle Hungan Chur would have you eviscerated and fed to the dogs. Wushin, release the animal at once. The axe flipped his sword twice, once to slice the hackamore that made her fast to the limb, a second time to swat her behind with the flat of the blade. The mustang snorted, kicked, and clattered away into the night. Since Guy C. had not taken an extra mount on his gallop through Scarecrow Alley, they still had an extra horse per man, but neither Brown Pony nor his aides were ready to let the matter lie. "'Who is your master?' the cardinal asked. "'His name is Mounts Everybody. How far is his camp from here?' "'Almost a day's ride, great man.' How many men in your band? The outlaw seemed to be counting on mental fingers for a moment. 
37, I think. And women? Children? Yesterday there were five captives. Today maybe more, maybe less. And how many bands like yours? I don't know. Sometimes we encounter other no-family people. Sometimes we fight, sometimes we join together. There are many bachelors along the fringes of the Wild Dog Range and to the south along the Nadian. Do you ever fight or rob farmers? It is not a wise policy. Does it happen? Sometimes. Would you like to be paid for fighting farmers? The captives looked at each other and shifted uncomfortably. Brown Pony elaborated. There is a war between the Grasshopper and the Hannigan's farmers. We know, but we are at war with both. But suppose the Grasshopper accepted you as allies. That they would never do, great man. Did the monk here tell you that I am the Christian shaman to all the hordes? We don't know what that means. It means, said Blacktooth, that the word of his eminence has power with all three hordes. Would you fight against the Handigan under demon light? There is no possibility. What about a jackrabbit shaft? The idea of a jackrabbit shaft brought roaring laughter from the bound men. Let the cowards go, Brown Pony ordered. You whimpering wild puppies, go tell your mounts everybody to come and see me in Valana, unless he's a coward, and bring back the horse you stole. Otherwise you will be driven south of the Nadian and east of the Bay Ghost. The Hannigan will know what to do with you. Now go. Easter arrived before they reached Valana. Brown Pony concelebrated the Mass of the Resurrection in a wayside church with a circuit-riding mission priest who stumbled through the liturgy, too frightened by high rank to get anything quite right. Some days later, a fast rider from Pobla, where they had spent the night, brought word of their coming to Valana, and Sorley Cardinal Norwat and the SEEC guard Elkin were waiting for them at the Venison House Tavern, where the Cardinal had entertained kindly light the previous year. It was close to sundown, so they ordered dinner. The two prelates, with their assistants, sat together while Wuxian and the Yellow Guard took an adjacent table. Sorley Norwat was a fast talker, and he had a lot to explain. Before submitting his resignation, which Norwat, like Brown Pony, regarded as revocable, if not wholly invalid, Pope Amen had broken with a recent tradition and created new cardinals, as many as forty-nine of them and had been induced to take the almost unprecedented action of stripping forty-nine others of their cardinalates. This shocked Brown Pony, but it made the attempt at a conclave understandable, if not legal. Amen Specklebird, who insisted that his resignation had been duly submitted to the Curia, had retired to his former residence, the old building which seemed to grow out of the side of a mountain, and which had been at one time a root cellar, and before that a cave whose deeper recesses had never been explored, and which the old man had reopened to let the mountain spirits come and go. Here the cardinals of the Curia came to consult him, to scold and beseech him to no avail. And there was news from Texarch. Although the text of what purported to be Pope Amen's resignation had appeared there by telegraph, the original signed copy of the document, if it existed, could not be found in Valana or anywhere else. One enterprising forger in the Empire's capital sold a clever counterfeit of the original to the Archdiocese of Texarch for ten thousand peos, a sum paid after a police expert affirmed that the handwriting was that of Amen, the anti-pope. But afterward another expert showed that the document contained egregious errors of the kind often occurring during transmission of text by a telegraph operator, including several pure operating codes such as ZMF, meaning break, more follows. The forger escaped into jackrabbit country and was never seen again. As I told you, the Pope refuses to live in the palace, said Norwat, and he has returned to his old home. He said Easter Mass at home, not at John in exile. He will see anyone who comes to him and cheerfully submits to any indignity. He has signed blank bulls, perhaps by the dozen. He will press his seal of approval into the wax of almost anything. I don't know if he always reads it first. Did he really appoint all these new cardinals, or was it done for him? I should know, but I don't because he found out about some guns at S.E.E.C., and he thinks I am responsible. Well, I must confess to him on that, 
No, don't do it. I am responsible now. His actions are those of a man who has lost his bearings, if not his sanity, but not his good humor. You, Elia, he speaks of constantly, and he will rejoice that you have returned. You must go to see him tomorrow, you and Brother Blacktooth as well. Of course, but what are the agenda, if not weapons? It was he who placed your name in nomination as Pope. His only agenda, probably, will be to submit to you as Pontiff. I must set him straight on that. Well, you can try. But besides the new cardinals, the college is coming into town again in numbers, and some from the east are bringing the military officers and envoys you invited. They pass for bodyguards. In response to the same summons I got, who was it wrote that foul thing? Dommy Dommy Cardinal Hoydock. Do I know him? No, he's one of the new ones. He's from Texark, but Benefiz excommunicated him for supporting Pope Amen, so the Pope created him Cardinal. He is a civil lawyer, not a priest. How are the Easterners getting here? Brown Pony asked. Mostly through the Iowa country. There the farmers seem to get along better with the grasshopper. They trade a lot. Only a few Texark patrols go north of the Misery River, and they wouldn't stop a cardinal there even if they knew he was coming to Conclave. Misery River? The old name was Missouri, my lord, Nimmy put in. Misery better suits it now, said Sorley. Before the occupation of the farmlands it was a natural route to New Rome. Of course, my memory is slipping. The first thing I must do tomorrow is send a messenger to Holy Madness and Swimming Elk to come here for a conference, and to send a war party to New Jerusalem for the new weapons. Swimming Elk? Scharf Eltio Braum, Haltor's brother, the grasshopper Scharf. Dinner was brought to them. This time there was venison and a good red wine. They were nearly starved after the long Lenten trip on light rations. Nimmy wondered absently if he should confess to eating barbecued wild dog on abstinence days, even though the cardinal had granted dispensation in an emergency situation. How are things in Texark, by the way? asked Cardinal Norwat. Well, the province is seething with revolt, and of course there is sporadic fighting with the grasshopper. In Hannigan City little has changed, except they are importing some desert animals from Africa for warfare in dry country. And they know about our guns. Two bad omens. And one other thing. He glanced at the adjoining table and tapped Wu Xin on the shoulder. Axe, I think I forgot to tell you of one small change, my lord. Brown Pony looked at Blacktooth. You tell him. His Imperial Majesty the Mayor has replaced you with a mechanical head chopper, Axe. Wu Xin shrugged. A man without shadow and form, when he chops heads, becomes a chopping machine. No change. This caused a murmur, apparently not of approval, but perhaps of recognition from the rest of the warriors present. A remarkable man, Sawley said with a shiver in his voice as Wu Xin turned away again. One without shadow and form, Brown Pony mused aloud. Four weeks had passed since they last saw Guy C., and they had just begun to fear that he had been shot down in Scarecrow Alley when he arrived not with the well-laden pack-mule with gifts for the curia, as in Brown Pony's message, but with Mayor Dion, Ulad, eight heavy wagons, and a whole brigade of light horse infantry bristling with new and superior arms. The secret of New Jerusalem was no longer secret. Brown Pony showed no surprise, and Nimmy realized that the message to Dion had been code. There was no way Valana could accommodate both the influx of cardinals and a whole brigade of light horse, of whom the citizens of the city were quite frightened as the word was quickly passed around that these armed men were spooks. But Magister Dion had no intention of imposing. His troops immediately set about building a fortified encampment on a hill well outside the city. As soon as the wagons were unloaded, they were returned to New Jerusalem for more supplies. Regular convoys were planned to supply his men with food, ammunition, and other necessities of military life. 
They would sleep in tents at first, but within four days a permanent log structure was built with a basement beneath it to store ammunition and to reload brass cartridges. The reloading machines were simple and portable, so that they might follow an army in battle. Seeking information about Idria, Nimi had approached the gate of the newly constructed fort in the hope of obtaining an interview with the Magister, who was now in the role of commanding general. He was told politely to wait, and a guard left for the armory. He struck up a conversation with the other guards. Blacktooth noticed that their rifles were similar to the pistols in having revolving cylinders, with six chambers instead of five. A guard showed him that the ammunition was of the same caliber as the handguns, and used the same brass. Only the weight of the bullets and the weight of the powder charge differed. The pistol ammunition might be fired with safety from the rifles with a lesser range, but it was unsafe to shoot the more powerful loads from the handguns. With copper being so scarce, it was essential that empty brass be saved after firing, even in battle. After three hours of waiting, the guard returned. Nimi was given a polite excuse from Magister Dion and turned away. He returned to the Red Deacon's own private mansion outside the city, where all of them were temporarily living. Brown Pony had obtained a list of new cardinals created by Pope Amen during their absence. He gave a copy of it to Blacktooth for his own information, along with two copies of a summons for all incoming cardinals to register at the Papal Palace with a clerk of the Secretariat of State, which again had been placed in the hands of Highland Cardinal Blees by Pope Amen after the interregnum. He told Nimi to post one copy of the summons in John in Exile Square, then to hire a town crier immediately to shout aloud the text of the second copy at every intersection in Valana. When he had finished these chores, Nimi returned to his old residence, where he was rather mournfully greeted by Abelot, who had fallen in love with the younger sister of the late Jesus. It seems to me, said Abelot with unusual gravity, that those people in those mountains are just as intolerant of outsiders as the outsiders have always been of spooks. They actually look down on us. Idria never did. I know, and she's under arrest. Oh, my God, did you see her? No, I was not allowed. What are the charges? She left without permission some months ago, that's all I know. Through his employer's intervention, Blacktooth obtained an interview with Magister Dion. Dion listened politely to Nimi's account of Idria's trip to Leibowitz Abbey, and thence to the Mesa of Last Resort, where she had given birth. And then she went home to her father's place, he finished. That's all she did. And her father beat her and brought her to me. We can't have people leaving without permission. But she always had permission to come to Valana. No, she had orders. But her father would have killed her babies. Babies? Twins, old Benjamin said. Well, what you think you know, you got my hearsay. I'll consider it, but she will remain in custody for the time being. Think of it as protection from her own family. You are never going to see her again. Neither your cardinal nor I will allow it. Blacktooth left the camp, fuming with anger at both the mare and brown pony. On the way home he meant to stop at the hillside home of Amen Specklebird and ask for his intervention. But there were at least forty people in a queue outside the door, many of them cardinals, and the red deacon himself was tenth in line. So he pretended not to see him, and went instead to a nearby church to pray his anger away. On the first day of May, normally a nomad holy day, in response to Brown Pony's call to a war council, Chur Hungen, his half-nephew Oksho, Father Ombros, and Demon Light, with one of his lieutenants, rode into town together. Brown Pony was surprised to learn that Oksho, in spite of his youth, had been chosen Wild Dog Sharp after Holy Madness was made judge and leader of all three hordes. The Wild Dog leaders bowed and kissed the Cardinal's ring. El Cure, the demon light, refrained, but offered a nomad military salute. From the south on the following day came Umu Kun, cold sober and wearing a leather helmet with his family badge. He introduced himself as Jack Rabbit Sharp. Knowing of Unmu's reputation, the others demanded documentation. He presented a roll of soft deerskin with Ouija's beadwork depicting a man-like figure with the ears of a jackrabbit. From his saddlebags he produced a crest of buzzard feathers, also of obvious Ouija's design. 
The sacred talisman was to be worn on the helmet of the scharf only in battle. After brief discussion and some shaking of heads, his credentials were accepted by the others. Brown Pony, who wished to honor them all, consulted with others of the Curia, then had the nomad leadership housed in the Papal Palace, since the Pope had retired to his remodeled hillside cave and refused to return. A military conference was scheduled for Thursday the 4th at SEEC, and an invitation was sent to Commander Dion to come and bring his senior officers. Then a great embarrassment rode into town on the night of the 3rd, and by the light of the full moon rode on through town and up to Brown Pony's private estate, where he made a great clatter at the main entrance. Wuxin and Wusol Lo immediately rushed from the dining room to investigate the visitor, but then called for Blacktooth. Nimi stared out at the spectacle standing there in the moonlight. Three hundred pounds of muscle and black hair confronted them with folded arms and an angry glare. He uttered obscenities in bad grasshopper and demanded to see the Christian shaman who boasted to my men that he was married to the Burrigan and then called me a coward. Blacktooth swallowed hard and went back to the dinner table. There seems to be a motherless one at the door who wishes to speak to your eminence. Who? I think they called him Mounts Everybody. Remember the outlaws you released? They spoke of their leader. The cardinal blotted gravy from his lips, got up, and strode to the entrance. Where is my horse? he demanded of the burly outlaw. Tied to the gate, you damn grass-eater. Then come in and eat beef with us, you damn thief. The man came in, surrounded by suspicious warriors with short swords in hand. Because of a foul odor about him, the cardinal had him seated at the foot of the table. Most of the others had finished eating. A servant carved him a few slices of roast beef and fetched him a hot baked potato and roasted onions from the kitchen. It was too early in the season for anything the nomad would call grass, but he grunted a few complaints about the lack of inner meats to go with the beef. Nimi knew that nomads usually ate virtually the whole animal, except for the hide, horns, hooves, and bones. It was the basis for the venerable Bedullus' prescription for radiation sickness. The outlaw ate with his hands, wrapping slices of beef around bits of potato. The cardinal spoke. I thank you for returning my horse. But do you know that all the shafts of the hordes and the Kisok Dri Verdar himself are here in the city? Mounts, everybody, stopped eating and glowered. You invited me here. They are enemies. You intend to have me killed? No, all I wanted was my horse. You spoke to my men of fighting farmers for money. I asked them questions. Which farmers are your enemies? Those nearby? No, those are under the protection of the Bishop of Denver. Blacktooth put in a word here. His eminence is trying to use your word for citizens, and he means specifically the subjects of the Hannigan, and even more specifically the armed forces of Texarc. He does not mean peaceful people who work the soil and grow crops. Many of them were formerly nomads, including my own family. Thank you, Nimmy, said Brown Pony, with a trace of irritation, then to mount everybody. Just how many fighting men could you muster if you were inclined to do so? Mounts everybody seemed to be doing mental arithmetic. That depends on the pay. For gold, not many. We need good horses. The families kill us when we take wild ones. Offer us two good horses and a woman for every man and you get a small army. Horses, yes, but no women. How small an army? Maybe four hundred warriors. But the grasshopper is at war against the farmers in the east. We cannot fight beside them. I realize that. What about the jackrabbit? Mounts everybody was suddenly suspicious. Wormy face told me you threatened to drive us south of the Nadian into Texark lands. Geisy, fetch one of the new rifles. The small warrior stepped into the adjacent room and returned with one of the West Coast weapons. Load it and take him outside for a demonstration. Brown Pony and Black Tooth remained sitting at the dinner table while a servant cleaned up after the meal. There were six loud shots in as many seconds, followed by a frightened whinny and hoofbeats in the roadway. 
Wu Xin came back inside with the outlaw who was holding the empty rifle and staring at it in awe. I'm sorry, your horse ran away, said the axe. When they find him, give him to the sharp of the outlaws here, and also the rifle. The burly guest stared at Brown Pony in amazement. I made you no promises. I know, and you won't get the gifts until you do. No promises. Well, all I want you to do is stay here all night and most of tomorrow. You can't come to the meeting tomorrow because I'm afraid someone would kill you. On your way into town, did you observe the fortress on the hilltop? Yes, it is new. Tomorrow night you will go to the fort and talk to Magister Dion and the jackrabbit Mukun. Any men you recruit will be under their command, as will you, and you will not be driven south of the Nadian. You will go there well armed and with other forces. I will think about it. The cardinal looked away. Axe, see that he takes a bath, cuts his hair and beard, and dress him as a mountain man. He can stay here until moonrise tomorrow. Mounts everybody, growled angrily, and started to his feet. But six half-drawn swords had a calming effect. He allowed himself to be led away. Brown Pony looked questioningly at Blacktooth. My lord, those men live by murder and plunder. And that is war, is it not? Nimi prayed earnestly for peace that night, but he feared the Virgin would not listen. If the Cardinal came to be elected Pope, he would make the Virgin a commanding general of the hordes. Chapter 21 Whenever any important business has to be done in the monastery, let the abbot call together the whole community and state the matter to be acted upon. The reason we have said that all should be called for counsel is that the Lord often reveals to the younger what is best. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 3 Nimi slept badly that night, and arose twice from nightmares to pray before the crucifix. Once he had a visitor. Moonlight shining through the window fell on white bedsheets, and he could see a dark figure in the doorway. By its bulk he knew it could only be Mounts Everybody. He came quickly to his feet, prepared to fight if the outlaw tried to live up to his name. But the hulk merely grunted and moved on. A few seconds later another dark figure stole down the corridor behind the motherless one. That would be one of the yellow guards shadowing him. Probably he was only looking for a place to urinate. Nimi went back to bed. He dreaded the morrow, for he saw clearly the direction of recent events, and how Brown Pony was moving them. It was not as if the Red Deacon had drawn a map of the future, but he was bent toward one goal. Whatever happened, he examined it to see if it might be useful as a means toward that goal. Nimi was not opposed to the destruction of the Empire, or the reduction of its power and the restoration of the new Roman papacy. That was Brown Pony's end. The means, in part, he might deem legitimate. There was such a thing as a just war. He did not doubt the ancient teaching. But Leibowitz had been a man of peace, had he not, after a warlike youth, and he was still the saint's willing follower, although a half-unwilling member of the saint's present order under abbots like Jared and Olshuan. He had renounced the world just as the abbots and his brethren had renounced it, but now he was in the midst of the world, and the renunciation seemed meaningless. He lay awake most of the night, remembering his devotion to Leibowitz and the Holy Virgin. When he did fall briefly asleep, he dreamed of Idria, woke up with an erection, and fought an urge to masturbate because it was dawn and people were moving in the hallway. Almost unwillingly he accompanied the cardinal to conference in the palace with the leaders of the hordes and of New Jerusalem. It would surely last most of the day. His employer noticed his reluctance and said, I'm sorry, Nimi, but I'm going to need you. So will the grasshopper. Only four members of the Sacred College attended, Sorley Norwat, Chunter Hadala, Ilya Brownpony, and a new cardinal, one Hawken Chief Irikawa, who was said to be king of his northeast forest nation, and who wore a feather sewed to his red hat. He claimed to outrank all princes of the church except the Pope. Besides the four cardinals, several military people of nationalities both east of the Great River and west of the Continental Divide were here, and they had come to town with their cardinal electors. There was a roll call, a counting of noses, and many introductions. Mayor Dion was obviously still irked by Nimi's petition on behalf of Idria, and at first objected to his and Wushin's presence. 
Brown Pony turned to Elture Braum, winked, and said, Would you please give the commander an account of the battles that have happened between the Grasshopper and Texarch since the death of your brother? The Scharf smiled wryly and began to speak. After half a minute of it, Dion held up his hand. What is he saying? I understand most of it, said the Cardinal, but I'm only good at jackrabbit and fair in wild dog. Grasshopper is Brother Blacktooth's native dialect. Dion looked at Nimi and nodded. And Wuxin commands the Yellow Guard, who offer training in very efficient methods of weaponless combat. The mayor acquiesced, but as if to prove his impartiality, told you, lad, and another of his own officers, to warm the bench outside the doors. Blacktooth translated Sharf Demon-like's account of recent skirmishing between his warriors and the Texarch cavalry. But it had been low-intensity warfare with few casualties and fewer deaths. Because of orders given by Holy Madness, the Grasshopper forces had not made any further raids on the protected farmlands. Braum noted with irony that the unprotected farmlands north of the Misery had been free from raids since trading between farmers and nomads had begun a generation or more ago. Most of the principals had their own interpreters, and local dialects were translated into church-speak. It made for slow going. The focus of attention was usually a war map of that part of the continent between the Rocky and the Appalachian Mountains. The map was a problem for all the nomads except Holy Madness, but Father Omroz tried to assist them with explanations of correspondences between the earth and the paper. Nimi found himself becoming the ears and the voice of the grasshopper shaft, and was soon rebuking the others, especially Brown Pony and Dion, for communicating between themselves in church-speak or Olzark Valley dialect without waiting for his interpretation. Even Unmu Kun was trilingual, but if Demon Light understood anything but the nomad dialects, he would not admit it. Nimi noticed, however, that the Scharf frowned when the monk interpreted Red Beard as Your Eminence. His Eminence himself, though understanding a bit of Grasshopper, kept a straight face. Braun acknowledged nothing spoken to him in the form of a request or an order, unless it came from the Lord Hungen Usler Only to the Kisok Drivvördar did he even appear to defer. He was polite, if only to hide a natural arrogance. Nimi found himself admiring the grasshopper leader. True, it was like the admiration a man might have for grizzly bear or a cougar, but he might, after all, be a distant relative to demon light. The sheriff was not condescending or rude to the monk, although he knew well enough that Blacktooth's ancestors had deserted the horde to farm on lands owned by the Denver Archdiocese. At one point during the meeting he noticed Holy Madness looking up at one of the high windows. Blacktooth followed his gaze, and it was the same balcony window through which Amen Specklebird had been passed into the building at the last conclave. The window was open. A policeman and the young Sharf Oksho, who had been conspicuous by his absence, at least to Blacktooth, were both gesturing. The Lord of the Hordes came to his feet. My Lord Cardinal, your eminence, I must excuse myself and find out what they want. He pointed. Brown Pony looked at the window, nodded, and said, We will discuss matters which would not much concern your realm while you're gone. If something's amiss, please let us know. Chur Hungen, Blacktooth, tried to remember the deferential name reversal when speaking to the man, but sometimes failed to think it correctly, was gone for a quarter hour, during which the talk was mostly with suppliers of military equipment from the west coast. When the Lord of the Hordes returned, his face was a storm cloud. A Texarch spy has been listening to every word spoken here, he growled, staring at Brown Pony. They caught him up there? Yes. Our sharp ox show was on watch. Are you sure he's from Texarch? Of course I know him. So does your eminence. He paused, and his stare at Brown Pony became a glare. He is or was the husband of Potayar Witok. He's your Texarch cavalry tactics expert. You sent him to us, remember? I always suspected him. Father Ambrose, who was sitting nearby, dropped his head in his hands. Es it loit, he groaned. Brown Pony turned pale. He is in custody now? Oh, yes, my lord. Oxo bound his hands and has him tethered. Nimmy winced. He knew what Holy Madness meant by tethered. 
Holes were punched in the captive's cheeks, and a loop of rope or rawhide was passed through the holes. Shall I bring him in for you to question? I'll cut the tenor so he can use his tongue. No, have them keep him in the local jail. Let him rot there for all I care. No! He belongs to me and the Weetok family. When I leave here, he goes with me, dead or alive. Brown Pony came to his feet and faced the angry nomad lord. Trusting him was my mistake, he said. You are right to claim jurisdiction over him. But Lord Hungen is the cure as your vicar apostolic. I forbid you in the name of God to kill him. They stared at each other. The nomad gave him a barely perceptible nod. The cardinal sat down. Hungen left the room again. This time he was gone for nearly an hour. When he came back, he faced Brown Pony again. Is he in jail? Most of him is in jail, said the Kisok Dree Vildar. The rest of him is here. On the table before his vicar apostolic, he emptied a bag of bloody parts. Nimi could see a hand, two ears, the tip of a nose, and what was probably the captain's penis. Sitting next to Blacktooth, Demon Light came to his feet with a deafening grasshopper battle cry to announce his approval. Brown Pony turned and vomited. You said not to kill him, Hungan said mildly. The meeting was adjourned while servants cleaned the table and the floor. When they reconvened, Oksho joined the other two shafts in the meeting, and they sat with their lord Hungan and Eltu's interpreter. Nimi sat surrounded by four nomads, and it seemed to him that the others took a different seating arrangement than before. No chair adjacent to a nomad was occupied. Magister Dion at first resisted the plan that Brown Pony and the nomads favoured. He wanted to join forces with the wild dog and the grasshopper and move across the plains north of the Nadian, then join forces with able-bodied Gleps from the Wachita nation and attack Hannigan City from the north. Chantur Cardinal Hadala, vicar apostolic to the valley, was familiar with its military potential, once its people were armed, and he backed Dion in his plan for a combined army of spooks from the Succamints and their Glep relatives from Olzakia. It was in expectation of this that the spook commander had brought his light horse brigade here to Balama. Brown Pony, however, was opposed. Having made reconnaissance in the province, he foresaw a war on three fronts. Present were military officers from four nation-states in the Appalachia region, who were prepared to invade the Texarch's puppet allies on the east bank of the Great River. Their aim would be less to conquer than to force Filpeo to send forces to the defense of the east bank puppets, lest he lose control of the river. The plan would be to harass, skirmish, and retreat, and prevent these forces from returning until Hannigan City itself was directly endangered. The commander-in-chief of the armed forces of the King of the Tennessee was present, and he outlined the plans the Eastern nations had made among themselves with the participation of Hawken Irikawa. Most of the nomads were pleased by this Eastern plan. Lord Hungenus Lechur suggested that the grasshopper Scharf propose a temporary truce with Filpeo's forces, just before the attack on the East Bank states came. That way he won't be so uneasy about sending forces across the river. Sharf Demon Light smiled at his lord, and the smile said that the truce, if made, would be opportunely broken. The role of the armies of New Jerusalem in this plan would be to join with the guerrilla forces of Unmu Kun, who were at present scattered throughout the hill country in the province. The guerrillas would move in small groups into the disputed areas a few days' ride to the west of the town of Yellow, staying away at first from the well-patrolled but narrow telegraph right-of-way that led to the last station nearest Valana. Kuhn had taken a pointer to the map and used it to draw a circle around the country where the Bay Ghost and the Nady Ann were hardly more than creeks, except for small lakes where antiquities' crumbled dams left small waterfalls. It was outlaw country to the east of the Papal Highway, and Blacktooth began to see why his employer wanted mounts everybody among his allies, although the prospect for such a thing was not mentioned at all by the cardinal. The northern hordes would object to the motherless ones, but because of Texarch protection, the jackrabbit had been little bothered by these outlaw bands. When the forces of Kuhn, Dion, and perhaps the outlaws themselves converged here under one command, 
The rearming of the jackrabbit with the West Coast weaponry, which Ng Mu had not previously been allowed to smuggle, would quickly proceed. The complete destruction of the telegraph was contemplated, also the physical removal of the wire to New Jerusalem. Local jackrabbit militias, already secretly armed, albeit with older weapons, would rise in revolt as Dion's and Kuhn's armies drove eastward between the Red and Nadian rivers. While Texarch's forces were thus engaged in the province and beyond the Great River, the wild dog and the grasshopper would join forces and attack from the west, hoping to help arm any able-bodied gleps from the Wachita nation and mount a combined attack. Eventually, Magister Dion became convinced. He insisted that Valana should raise its own militia, and occupy the fort his men had built, where citizens might take sanctuary in case of raids by infiltrators or outlaws, and the militia would be used to assist the police in apprehending disloyal citizens, especially those of Texarch origin. He designated one of his two military aides, Major Elswich J. Gleaver, a short keg of a man with a red face and long mustachios, as the right officer to command the militia. Blacktooth expected his master to resist this usurpation, but he said nothing. Chunter Cardinal Hadala broke the silence and said to Brown Pony with a wink, I'll keep a close eye on the Major for you, Cardinal. I'm staying in the fort. No one raised a question about Valana's possible response to putting an outsider and a spook in charge. When the meeting finally ended, it was nearly dark outside. Brown Pony told the nomads that the palace, where they were residing, would be needed tomorrow for the beginning of conclave, and asked them to pack their belongings and move to his estate for the night. Black Tooth will show you the way. Then he beckoned to the monk and whispered, Make sure they don't get there before moonrise. I'll speak privately with Dion now and tell him to expect that outlaw leader. Nimi nodded his understanding. He prevailed upon the Scharfs and Holy Madness to eat dinner at the Cardinal's expense at the Venison House. By the time they arrived at the estate, mounts everybody had gone, presumably to meet with Dion. They greeted their host with minimum cordiality, still angry about the spy, and went at once to their rooms. The food was gone from the dinner table, but Brown Pony asked Nimi to sit with them over a glass of wine. He asked what he felt about the day's events. I felt myself in the service of the hordes instead of you, my lord. That's quite natural. You were Braun's interpreter. What else? I was both afraid and angry. Afraid of whom? Angry at whom? You. This brought a threatening grunt from Wushin. I suppose that's natural, too, said the cardinal. Holy Madness and the Sharfs were certainly angry at me because of Esset Lloyd. And it rubbed off on you. Lloyd was one of the few men I have ever completely misjudged. Well, tomorrow begins the conclave. You'll find that less rowdy than last year, and— He broke off, noticing Blacktooth's expression. The axe noticed it too, and was scowling, for his loyalty to his master was absolute. Oh, I can get along without you, the Red Deacon said. I don't need a grasshopper interpreter in conclave, and I can borrow a secretary from Cardinal Blees or Norwat. Still angry? No, my lord, just very tired. It's been a tiring day. All right, then, take a vacation until we have a new pope. The nomads will be in town a few more days. They have things to talk over among themselves and with Dion's officers. But remember Loit, and remember last year's attack. Watch your back. Early the next morning, while walking through the streets, Blacktooth saw several cardinals and their servants on their way to conclave at the palace. One of them was a woman, but she was not Cardinal Bulderk. He had heard about her, but had not seen her before. There was a small convent on the south bank of the Brave River, where a community of barefoot nuns, sisters of Amen Speckleburds, Ordo Domini Desertarum Nostri, lived, worked, and prayed, and Mother Iridia Silentia had been created cardinal by Pope Amen, the second woman in the sacred college. Blacktooth noticed that her conclavists wore the same religious garb that Idria had worn when she was serving as courier between S.E.E.C. and New Jerusalem. The same order had last year held a temporary residence in Valana, and Nimi had assumed that among these local nuns, Idria's friend, Sister Julian, had provided her with a habit for disguise. 
but the local nuns were gone now. He had a wild hunch, and it overcame his misgivings about approaching one of them in the street. He spoke to her in a low voice. Forgive me, sister. I am a monk not in very good standing of St. Leverwitz. A young woman wearing your habit used to come here sometimes from a mountain community. Her name was Edria. I was wondering if you might know. The sister kept her eyes lowered and did not speak. Mother Iridia noticed her conclave as being accosted by a brash cleric of some sort, and she approached them wearing a frown. She and her nun exchanged murmurs in a foreign tongue. Mother Iridia inspected Blacktooth from head to toe, nodded, reached in her portfolio, and handed him a prayer card. "'God bless you, Brother Blacktooth,' she said, making a tiny cross. "'Pray for those in trouble.' Then she gripped her helper's arm and led her fast away. Blacktooth, amazed that she knew his name and therefore his sin, felt the heat of a blush in his face. He looked at the prayer card. It was thick, glossy, and heavily enameled, and probably blessed with holy water like many tiny sacramental placards sold by mendicant religious orders. Most were saccharine and sentimental, but this was not. On one side it bore a picture of a crucifix at the top, but the crucified one was a woman, and the name above it was Santa Librada. Beneath the cross was advice in ancient English, which he understood with small difficulty. The English said, Pray to Santa Librada in times of trouble with the police, the courts, and when freedom is not visible. She will help you if you believe. For Idria, freedom was certainly not visible. He wanted to run after the nuns and ask more questions, but that would be highly improper, and they would not answer. Instead, he resolved to write them a note of inquiry and get one of Brown Pony's housekeepers to deliver it. He looked at the other side of the card. There was printed a prayer or poem which he had difficulty understanding, for although the language reminded him of Latin, it was not Latin. Santa librada del mundo, tengo ojos no me miren, tengo manos no me tapen, tengo pieces no me alcanzan, con los ángeles del cuarenta y tres, con el manto de María estoy tapado, Con los pechos de María estoy rosado. He thought of Abelot, who was back in school at St. Ston's, and turned to walk toward their old shared residence. The student might know someone at the school who could translate. A crowd was gathering in John in Exile Square, but this was no mob like last year's raging rabble. There was no sickness in the city and more fear than anger, and what anger there was was directed at Texarch and cardinals absent from the city. The people wanted Specklebird to remain as Pope, but his refusal they now seemed to accept as a sad reality. Brown Pony was well known and popular, but not well revered. If he was lacking in holiness, he was also lacking in haughtiness, and he seemed to feel affection for the common people of the city. On his way to Abelot's, Blacktooth paused to watch some of the cardinals recently created by Pope Amen as they arrived and entered the assembly. He stood beside a young priest who told him their names. There was Abbot Joyo Cardinal watching down from watching down Abbey far east of the Great River, and Wilfer Cardinal Poilif from the North Country came still wearing his furs, although it was not a cold day. Domidomi Cardinal Hoydock of Texarch was excommunicated by Benefers for supporting Pope Amen, who then appointed him to the college. He was the one who had penned the angry summons to conclave, and he seemed still angry as he stalked into the hall. Then came the Fury Cardinal Shirikane, quietly, almost slinking along. He was from the west coast, a priest who could also speak Wuxin's dialect, so the acts had told him. His countenance also seemed to bear a trace of Asia in it. And there was Abraha Cardinal Lincono, a schoolteacher from New Jerusalem, the only known spook in the college. And there is Hawkin Chief Irikawa, said the young priest. I know, I saw him yesterday. Did you know that it was Cardinal Baldirk who suggested him to Pope Amen in the first place? The Abbey of Nork is adjacent to Irikawa's forest kingdom. I am surprised, Nimi told his informant. Last year the lady seemed to be leaning toward Cardinal Benefers. Huh? That was before Pope Amen ordained two women and made another one cardinal, the priest said, rather stiffly, it seemed, to Blacktooth. 
Irokawa makes strange claims, says his family is as old as the continent itself, and that eagle feather. He doesn't want to be called Cardinal. His servants call him Sire and Majesty. Two humbler men then went in the door. Boozy Cardinal Fudsau, a local plumbing contractor who had added a flush toilet of his own invention to Amen Specklebird's hillside retreat, and leave it Lord Cardinal B. Hovar, a merchant from the Utah country. Then the new Bishop of Denver, Varley Cardinal Swineman, whose diocese included the whole of the Denver Free State, except for Valona itself. His cathedral was two days' ride to the north at Danfer, a small community on the outskirts of an expanse of half-buried rubble which was once a city of Denver. Although a bishop of Denver had mounted the throne of Peter a few years ago, the Denver diocesan chair was not traditionally occupied by a cardinal. Blacktooth thanked the priest and picked his way through the crowd in the square again. The conclave, legitimate or illegitimate, was not yet officially locked and sealed. The doors and windows were all still open, and the crowd in the square was quiet because a loud voice could be heard from within addressing the prelates who had already arrived. It took a few moments for Nimi to recognize the voice of his master because there was anger in it. I am under a suspended sentence of death imposed by the imperial mayor. The pope has been denounced as an impostor by the Hannigan, the archbishop, and their allies. They are attempting to convene a general council of the church in New Rome, and this, as you know, cannot be done without the approval of the Pope, and if there is no Pope, it cannot be done at all. Texarch has begun to wage an undeclared war against the Valanan papacy, and we are all in danger. While we all deplore the grasshopper raid into the illegally occupied zone around New Rome, and the ensuing massacre of innocents, we find ourselves by necessity allied with the hordes against the Empire. You must protect yourselves. There are Texarch spies in Valana. One was caught yesterday and severely mutilated, without my knowledge, by the Lord of the Free Hordes. He is receiving medical treatment in the local jail. As you must recall, assassins tried a year ago Easter to kill me and my secretary. There will be more attacks of this kind. Weapons are available, superior weapons, for the Papal Guard, and for any of you who wish them for yourselves or your servants. Valana is an open city. We do not have border guards, and you may be sure that the agents of the Hannigan come and go as they please. Sidearms for you and your servants will be provided. Perhaps the anger he heard in the voice was rhetorical. The monk shook his head in wonder and moved on. He did not regret that Brown Pony had chosen other conclavists this time, although he hoped his obvious reluctance to serve as one of them would be forgiven. Abelot was not at home. Meaning to copy the strange prayer and leave it on his table with a note, he tried the door but found it locked. He shrugged to himself and started to retrace his steps when a thought struck him. He still had not been able to see Amen Specklebird because of the crowds waiting outside his door. But people who were not at work were now forming the crowd in John in Exile Square, and the cardinals were inside the palace. So he turned around and started climbing the hill to Amen's home. "'I'll not translate it for you,' said the old black pope, holding Mother Iridia's card. They were sitting together alone in the hillside house of stone. The rocks were cold, but there was a small fire on the hearth, and the room was chilly but not uncomfortable. It's more poem than prayer. It is not written in the language the sisters speak today, but their speech does have more classical Spanish in it than Rocky Mount or Olzark has. This is old Spanish with a word or two of country dialect, perhaps. I have seen it before. I know what it means to the sisters. They think the crucified woman does not depict an event of history, but an event in the mind of Mary when she allowed herself to feel the crucifixion of her son. She wishes herself in his place on the cross. Wishes? In her own heart she's already there. Librada del mundo means set free from the world. But the next three lines seem to be spoken by the crucified. She has eyes but doesn't see herself. With her hands nailed to the cross she can't touch herself. 
With her feet nailed there, too, she can't walk about. The line after that, with the angels of number forty-three, its meaning is lost. The last two lines might be spoken by the Christ child. Mary's blanket covers me. Mary's breasts turn me rosy. The child is nursing. This is the sister's interpretation. What is yours? I'm not an interpreter. You are, Blacktooth. You have eyes, hands, and feet. Can you see yourself, touch yourself, walk about? I never doubted it before, but— He paused. But what I see in a mirror is not me, is it? I can touch my body, but is that— me? My feet move, but who is walking? If you have the right questions, why do you need answers? The answers are in the questions. He smiled a cat's smile. I like your questions. Is there anything you can do for Idria? Specklebird was silent. Not that question Nimmy was afraid he would say. After a time he purred a cougar's purr. Stay a while and pray with me. We'll pray the silent prayer. They prayed without words. Occasionally Blacktooth arose to feed the fire. At dusk they ate a simple meal and prayed some more. In the morning Brother Blacktooth chopped more wood, and Amen Specklebird hung out a sign that read, I pray, go away. Nimmy stayed with him and prayed with him. The silence was like what the silence at the Abbey of Leibowitz should have been. On the fifth day, someone came and yelled, Habemus Papam, three times before he went away. Specklebird seemed not to notice. The silence was unbroken by the event. Blacktooth stayed for nine days, a novena of sorts. He learned more about his own soul during those nine days than he had learned during all his years at Leibowitz Abbey. Amen Specklebird was a teacher in silence. The soul of the student somehow began to resemble the soul of the teacher in silence. There was no explanation for it, for to explain would break the silence. He might have stayed longer than nine days, but when he came out to chop wood on the tenth morning, a great cloud of smoke was arising from Valana. Was the whole city on fire? Amen followed him most of the way down the hill until they could see that it was only the papal palace and the police barracks burning only. That was Specklebird's word. They embraced in silence and parted in silence. Nimmy was vaguely worried about the old man. He had tried to remove himself entirely from the scene of the ecclesiastical and political struggle for supremacy, but how could he be free from it while men continued to bicker and battle about his quit claim on the apostolic see? Was he ever Pope? Was he still Pope? Where was his resignation? If someone had burned the original, Blacktooth felt the old man was not safe, and yet he knew it would be useless presumption to advise him to seek protection. The fires had been preceded by explosions, the guard at the gate told him. But Cardinal Brown Pony, now Pope Amen II, was not dead. He had only fled the city along with most of the curia, Gone where? The guard could not say. Most of Mayor Dion's brigade had ridden south on the papal highway, leaving a few men with part of the yellow guard to train the civilian militia in the fort the spooks had built. Several cardinals had taken refuge there. Perhaps the Holy Father had gone with Dion. The Texarch spy had disappeared from the jail, and the guard reckoned there must have been as many as forty infiltrators to accomplish the jailbreak and blow up the palace. These bastards have been living among us for years, settlers from Texarc. Most of them pretended to be fugitives. The nomads had returned to the plains, he told Nimi, and perhaps the Pope was with them instead. Blacktooth hurried first to Avalot's. A note on the door said, Gone to the fort, help yourself. Blacktooth tried the latch. This time it was unlocked. Judging by the mess on the floor and the overturned furniture, someone had already helped himself or else the student had been dragged to the fort after resisting. He went to S.E.E.C. The building was deserted except for the covered wing. 
When he tried to enter there, he was quickly ejected. He went to St. John in exile. Only a curate was present. He told Blacktooth that the new pope, after escaping from the burning building, had left the city in a coach belonging to the grasshopper Scharf, that they had indeed followed Dion south. Did the coach have I set fires painted on the side? Is that what it said? It was ancient English, I think. Braum was going to take charge of a shipment of guns, Nimmy thought. He started walking to the fort. On the way, he was grabbed by the scruff of the neck and dragged to the fort. It was you, lad, who would not believe that he was going there of his own free will. You know I am a servant of Cardinal uh, Pope Amen, too, he protested. If you still were, you would be with him. You are a soldier now, piss-robe, the giant said. You are going to fight for the holy city. Holy city? Did he mean New Rome or New Jerusalem? Will I get to see Idria? Not likely, growled the hulk. Nimmy stopped struggling, but you lad kept his long, slender hand around his neck as they walked. Chapter 22 Let a good pound weight of bread suffice for the day, whether there be only one meal or both dinner and supper. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 39 Elia Brown Pony, now Pope Amen the Second, missed his grasshopper interpreter. No one had seen Nimmy since the election. The new Pope was reluctant to believe that Blacktooth had deserted him. He had left messages with cardinals who remained in Valana. Now he rode with Scharf's ox show and demon like Braum in Braum's coach, while several cardinals came along behind, some in coaches, some on horseback. Wu Xin, who was not fluent in any nomad dialect, rode with the Pope's driver. Inside the coach, the young wild dog, Scharf, fawned on his pontiff, somewhat to his pontiff's annoyance, because Braum was still calling him Redbeard, and every time Oxshow said, Your Holiness, or Holy Father, the grasshopper Scharf grew surly. Braum mentioned Esset Loit more often than seemed polite. Oxshow argued that the spy had been caught before he could learn much more than the identities of the participants in the war council. And that's too much, Eltio snapped. Once the Hannigan knows we have allies in the east, he will be less likely to send forces across the great river. Isn't that so, Redbeard? Brown Pony had been staring out the window at the scenery as if in deep reverie. Eltior was forced to repeat the question. Oxho rephrased it in the wild dog dialect, but Brown Pony's response was indirect. The attack on the palace was a complete surprise to me. I was too confused to think clearly for an hour or two. The agents who broke Loit out of jail must have taken him straight to the telegraph terminal. We should have thought of that immediately and sent forces to capture it before he could get a message out. Now it will be captured in due course, but too late. So the Hannigan's forces will not cross the Great River. We can't know that until you try to arrange a ceasefire, Sharp Braum. You expect me to play the coward, Redbeard? Of course not. You can seem unwilling. Let him know that holy madness demands it of you, that you would be delighted to resume hostilities if Texarch turns you down. Brown Pony had the uneasy feeling that Eltur blamed him for Twin Haltor's self-destructive behavior. But this feeling probably arose out of Father Stepson Snake's opinion that Haltor's murderous raid was meant to send a message to the cardinal who pampered wild dog Christians and left the grasshopper out of his counsels. Your tribes and your warriors and you yourself, Scharf Braum, are the most powerful force we have against the Hannigan. Eltur had trouble understanding. Oxho tried to shift the dialect to grasshopper, but the result was less than satisfactory. We are not your force, Redbeard, said the Scharf. They passed a dozen armed men from New Jerusalem along the way. The papal highway had been seized by and was being patrolled by Dion's forces. The guard drew itself up into formation and saluted as the Pope passed by. Soon they came to their destination. The road to Shard's place was no longer just a path through the bushes leading to Scarecrow Alley. Magister Dion's men were fast builders. The brush had been cleared. Fifty yards from the papal highway, a log barricade had been erected, and twin guardhouses flanked the improved road. A cloud of dust raised by men and horses hovered over the area. 
The ramshackle houses of the Gleps had been razed. Barracks and other log buildings replaced them. Two trains of wagons were loaded and stood ready to move out, while the dust of a third train heading south was still visible. Un mou kun, brown pony thought. Amen the second was quickly surrounded by his courier when he descended from Eltur's coach, and his leave-taking from the nomad shafts was perfunctory and less than cordial. Each of them was met by a band of warriors from his horde, and they were ready to move out within the hour. The secrets of the succumbents were no longer secret, and the colony now was clearly at war. The mayor strode up to the group of cardinals, genuflected with military precision to the figure in white, and brushed the Pope's ring with his lips. He answered questions before they were asked. The telegraph station has been captured. According to the prisoners we took, Lloyd had already been there and gone. Outlaw forces ambushed a cavalry troop in the outlaw lands. The ruffian you sent me brought over a hundred men to us, and they took no prisoners. Our light horse are riding hard toward the second station, and they are passing jackrabbit guerrillas on their way to join us. Now what of our allies in the east? Well, word has not reached them yet about what's happening here, Brown Pony shrugged, so we'll not know for some time. He gestured toward the mountains. Is the way open to us? Of course, Holy Father. The buildings are all of logs but new, and it is your third Rome as long as you wish it to be. He beckoned to a young man with such long legs and short arms that one might have considered him a glep, except that Dion introduced him as his son and he was both well-mannered and handsome. Slow John will be your guide as long as you need one. He will be in charge of my office while I am with the army. The young man bowed and squinted closely at the Pope's ring without actually kissing it. Brown Pony continued to peer out at the scenery as if in deep thought while they rode upward into the mountains in a coach formerly belonging to the mayor, who had ordered the door panels repainted with the papal tiara and the keys. This time Mushin rode with him inside the coach, along with Dion Slowjohn and Cardinals Highland Blees and Mother Iridia Silentia. With the latter he had enjoyed a distant but enduring acquaintance, and she had thanked him for concurring in the first Amen's choosing her for the Cardinalate. Brown Pony admitted that he had in fact done no such thing, but he now applauded her appointment after the fact. During the journey into the mountains, she brought up the subject of Idria's captivity. But Brown Pony's respiratory weakness returned to him as they gained altitude, and he was unable to say anything to support her in her petition to Dion Slowjohn, except to smile at her and gesture in the young man's direction. The gesture could have meant whatever each of them might want it to mean. Highland Breeze changed the subject to curial matters. By the time they arrived in the heart of the community, Pope Amen II needed to be carried by sedan chair to his new quarters. He asked the Secretary of State to send an urgent message to Blacktooth in Valana for a copy of a recipe by the Venerable B. Dulles. Then he collapsed in a feather bed and slept for sixteen hours. Outside the building was a disappointed crowd of the faithful among these normal-looking children of the Pope, who had assembled in the hope of receiving the apostolic benediction from their special father. Secretary Highland Cardinal Blees blessed them himself and told them to come back tomorrow. Corporal Blacktooth St. George never received his pontiff's urgent message, for when it arrived in Valana it was routed to the fort and delivered to his commander, Major Elswich J. Gleaver, who signed the receipt for it in Blacktooth's absence, but somehow forgot to give it to him later. He called Chunter Cardinal Hadala's attention to the message, the cardinal opened and read it. Our new holy father must have become a gourmand since his election, said Adala with a hint of contempt in his tone. It's only a request for a recipe by a cook named Bidullus. Could it be a coded message? suggested the florid major. I think not. If Corporal Blacktooth had any secret information, the Pope would just summon him directly. Well, I heard that His Holiness had sent for him. Where did you hear that? the cardinal asked sharply. A rumor. He may have started it himself, but somebody said it came from Cardinal Norwat. Damn it. I'll have a talk with Sorley. You know Mayor Dion doesn't want that monk in New Jerusalem? 
There is his affair with that suspect girl, and the Pope, after all, is now too dependent on the mayor to risk offending him. I'm sure that's why Elia hasn't summoned him. Besides, he won't need a nomad interpreter in New Jerusalem, even if he broke off. The Major looked at him and wondered if the distinction between interpreter and translator had stopped his line of thinking. As if to confirm this, Hadala continued, Besides, we are going to need someone to handle correspondence between ourselves and the nomad shafts. Sawley will surely need him too for the same reason. That's why we proposed his promotion to corporal, and we want to keep him reasonably satisfied. I doubt any rumour about his going back into Brown Pony's, uh, the Pope's service, came from Norwat. Well, I can keep him busy until you need him, said Gleaver. Right now the police have him, and then he's on leave until after the funeral tomorrow. Better have him watched, lest he make a run for it. He can't be trusted. Brown Pony learned that, and don't assign him duty in the city. He's probably too squeamish to shoot traitors. A cleaning woman who came on Mondays to scrub the former Pope's clothing, dishes, and floor usually turned away when she saw his I pray, go away sign in place. But on the Monday in question, a brown stain from something that had leaked out under the door caught her attention. She knocked timidly, but there was no answer. She tried the latch, and the door swung inward. It was a quiet morning, and her scream echoed from the opposite hillside. A farmer and two shepherds responded. The decapitated body of Amen Specklebird had fallen sideways from the prie dieu where he had obviously been kneeling before his altar when his killer struck. His head had bounced off the wall and rolled under a table. He had been dead at least two days. The manner of his death, by a single horizontal stroke of a sword, caused immediate suspicion to fall on the yellow guard, but neither Guy C. nor Wu So Lo had left the fort during the week of the murder and the others, including Mushin, had accompanied Pope Amen II to New Jerusalem. Blacktooth had been one of the last people to see Pope Amen Specklebird alive, and the police questioned him closely. But in the presence of his lawyer advocate, a priest appointed by one of the cardinals to look out for his interests. As it turned out, the police did not suspect him, but his advocate was of some help in explaining the religious relationship that developed between the Leibowitzian monk and the retired pope during their nine days of silent prayer in Amen's residence just days before his murder. Nimi blamed himself. He had failed to act on his intuition at the time of their parting. The feeling which had come to him that Specklebird was in imminent danger. He was distracted from this worry when you lad had grabbed him by the neck and drafted him into the militia but he had felt certainty that Specklebird would ignore a warning anyway. The police were unconcerned by his guilty feelings. They had as yet no suspects, although the population of the city was being carefully screened, and any citizen who could not offer proof of his place of birth was sent to a detention camp adjacent to the fort. Fifteen known participants in the terrorist uprising had already been shot. The death sword could as plausibly have been a well-sharpened cavalry saber as one of the beautiful blades of the Asian warriors. Nimi was allowed to go in peace, and his leave was extended to include the time of the old man's funeral. He wanted to run away to New Jerusalem, but he would surely be caught, and Brown Pony might not welcome him if he did escape. Amen Specklebird lay in state, his body illuminated by many candles on the high catafalque in the Cathedral of St. John in Exile, and all the faithful who remained in Valana after the insurgency, the purge, and the flight came now to pay their respects and to pass in a slow line to view the body. There was less pomp and grandeur than if he had died as a reigning pontiff, and a certain amount of chaos, but that was more a result of the exodus to New Jerusalem than it was of his resignation and the previous transfer of papal power to Cardinal Brown Pony. Investigators found, for example, that no official had taken from the old man the signet of his fisherman's ring and the two seals, one for wax, one for lead, of office upon his resignation. These seals were normally seized and broken by the Cardinal High Chamberlain during the interregnum after the death of the Pope. Had they been used after Brown Pony had ascended? The ring was removed from his finger after death, but militiamen searched his home and found no seals. Stolen by his killer? These and other irregularities cast doubt upon many documents that emerged from the Specklebird pontificate, 
especially in cases where living witnesses could not be located. After joining the slow line and awaiting his turn, Black Tooth passed the catacalque. He noticed that the undertaker had done a good job of concealing the fact that the head had been severed from the body, but otherwise the corpse looked more like a pope than Speckled Bird had ever looked while alive. The wild white hair was carefully combed, the deeper creases in his face were corked, and his black skin lightened somewhat with a brown powder. The stink of the corpse, however, had begun to penetrate the background odors of incense in the church. Nimmy choked with tears and hurried into the square. There was a thin crowd. Many of Amen Specklebird's admirers had been fanatically devoted to the old holy man, and enough of them disputed the validity of his resignation, and therefore the validity of Brown Pony's election. But some were heard to suggest that Brown Pony himself had arranged the old man's murder in order to secure himself in office. Nimmy overheard two hill dwellers giving voice to this theory, and he shouted at them, You stupid oafs! That's exactly what Texarc wants you to believe! The men took umbrage, and Nimmy let himself be goaded into a fight. He won the fight, but lost self-respect, although he was now wearing the green uniform of a militiaman and not his brown monk's robe. He felt pats on the back, however, and heard cheers from Valanans who knew and liked the new pope. By the time of the funeral on the following day, Blacktooth smelled the stink of the corpse even through the haze of pignon pine incense that pervaded the cathedral. Later witnesses for the cause of canonizing Pope Amen I would testify of the heavenly perfume exhaled by the body. He knew all about the olfactory miracles performed by saintly corpses. St. Leibowitz had smelled like ambrosial barbecue, his followers said. He too now tried to smell the miraculous perfume of Amen Specklebird, but his piety perhaps had been diminished by his sins, for the rotten odor persisted. Suddenly, however, the body of Amen Specklebird sat up on the catafalque and pointed straight at Blacktooth. The whiskers of the cougar twitched and fangs were bared. Nimmy closed his eyes to squeeze the tears out of them. When he opened them again, the corpse lay back down and never moved during the high funeral mass, concelebrated by the six cardinals who had stayed in the region. The purge of Valana's people continued even during the funeral. When Nimi emerged from the church, he learned that the number of suspected conspirators who had been shot had risen to eighteen, and more than thirty citizens were imprisoned in the stockade next to the fort. Anyone unable to furnish proof of his place of birth, either by document or through testimony of witnesses, would, if no one appeared to testify of his participation in the terror, be sent into permanent exile. Any captive with an enemy or two in the city could expect a denunciation and testimony leading to his execution. Old scores were settled thus. The court trying the cases was neither civil nor ecclesiastical, but military. Nimmy guessed that most of the real villains had fled the city immediately after the crime, but the trials provided an outlet for revenge. In the murder of Amen Specklebird, however, the police had no suspects. When Volana had been pacified and purged, there was no talk of disbanding the militia. That Chunter Cardinal Hadala and his new Jerusalem officers had their own plan of battle in the war became clear when orders were posted to prepare the combined forces to move out from the city by the first of the month, when the moon was full. Messengers had been sent out to the Wild Dog, and Sharf Oksho replied by sending three guides and more than a hundred horses for those citizen-soldiers of Valana who had none of their own. The guides were assigned to Blacktooth for interpretation. He found them ignorant of the fact that they were directly following the orders of Chunter Hadala, sorely Norwat, and Elswich Gleaver, instead of the Pope. He was afraid to mention it, because Norwat had always been close to Brown Pony. The Lonans were skeptical and complained a lot about leaving the vicinity of the city for a move away from the mountains, but there was as yet no talk of rebellion. Then, on the 1st of July, when the militia was preparing to ride east with fourteen wagon loads of arms, a messenger of the papal guard rode into Valana and posted on the door of the cathedral and the wall of the papal palace an eight-page document with the papal seal, then proceeded to the fort and posted another copy on the orderly room wall. Its heading was thus, Amen the Second Episcopus Romae Servus Servorum Dei, 
Omnibus electis domini ipsis fidelibus in una ecclesia vera catholica atque apostolica credentibus, qui subsunt nobis secundum petrum unicum pastorem. Blacktooth knew historians would call it by the first words of the text, Scitote Tyrannum, which followed. Newly returned after dark to the fort from furlough, he read by torchlight the first few paragraphs on the wall, Amen the second, Bishop of Rome, servant of the servants of God, to all the faithful believers in the one true church, Catholic and apostolic, to these chosen ones of the Lord who are subject to us as to Peter, the only shepherd appointed by Christ to become the head of his mystical body, sends greetings and the apostolic benediction. You shall know that the tyrant, Philpeo of Texarch, Tyrannum Philippum Texarchani, together with his uncle, the former cardinal archbishop of the city of Hannigans, Civitatis Hannigansis, having by their own acts, ipso facto, been excommunicated, as affirmed by our predecessor of holy memory, Amen the First, are hereby declared by us to be enemies of God and his holy church, are cursed, condemned, cast out, cut off from the body of Christ, apart from which there is no salvation. For crimes against humanity and the church, including his own people and their clergy, we declare Philpeo Hark deposed from the office of mayor. We absolve his former subjects from all oaths of obedience to him. We urge them to reconstitute a legitimate government in his place, and we enjoin all Christians against serving or obeying him. As long as the tyrant remains in power, we encourage all Christian rulers of peoples throughout the continent to take up arms against him. They shall receive through our venerable brethren, their own bishops, our blessing upon their armies and their arms. Moreover, whosoever among the faithful is fit to bear arms, shall, upon undertaking to wage righteous war against this heretical tyrant and his uncle, receive from us, through his confessor, a plenary indulgence for all his sins, and remission of all temporal punishment which may be due either in this world or in purgatory. Upon confession his only penance shall be to wage war against the forces of the imperial tyrant, and should he die in battle, we, who hold the keys of the kingdom of heaven, shall unlock the gate thereof, that he may enter into the holy presence. A crusade. The word itself was not used, and had not been used since the twenty-third century, but all the characteristics were there. The Pope spoke of heroes marching behind a crucifer into battle. War was to be waged under the sign of the cross and the banner of the papacy. The church in Hannigan City was laid under interdict. Ecclesiastical courts were ordered closed. Priests were forbidden to say mass. All sacraments except last rites were withheld. Clergy and laity who ignored the interdict were automatically excommunicated. The sentence did not extend to the province, except to those parishes which had refused obedience to Brown Pony's former vicariate, and remained tied to the Hannigan City Archdiocese. Upon Urian Benefice himself, the Pope pronounced a sentence of anathema from which he can be absolved only by the Roman pontiff and at the point of death. There was more, but Blacktooth left the furious document and returned to the barracks by full moonlight. They would be moving out tomorrow. His astonishment was due to the fact that such language came from his former employer, a man slow to anger. Why astonished? Abelod asked him. Haven't you heard of a crusade before? Yes, but not since the twenty-third century, and that one of the least holy wars ever fought. The bull, or whatever it's called, just doesn't sound like Cardinal Brown Pony. Well, it isn't Cardinal Brown Pony. It's Pope Amen the Second. Maybe his voice changed when it dropped on him. It sounds more like Dommy Dommy Cardinal Hoydock. Abelot pondered for a moment. And why not? Hoydock wouldn't dare go back to Hannigan City. He's not here, so he must be with the Pope. And who could better write a letter to anger the mayor and the archbishop? He's probably the Pope's secretary for urban affairs by now. Nimi's urge to run away to New Jerusalem had not entirely disappeared because of Idria, but it had been diminished in urgency by the tone of the bull Scitote Tyrannum. He was not sure that he wanted to work for its author.
Early the following morning, most of the remaining population of Valana turned out to watch its young men ride off toward the plains and to war under command of the spooks of New Jerusalem. Minor clergy who had read Scitote Tyrannum had donned vestments and now fell in with the riders. A priest bearing a crucifix marched ahead of Major Gleaver's horse. Blacktooth suspected that the support of clergy had been arranged by one of the cardinals. The show of religion in support of the militia prevented a public display of hostility toward the alien commanders who were leading local soldiery. The sun was approaching the zenith when Gleaver called a halt for food, water, and a brief rest. When the formation fell in again, Ulad sent Blacktooth to the head of the column as interpreter. Only now that they were safely out of civilian earshot was Gleaver prepared to disclose the planned route to his nomad guides. Even so, the Major ordered that the details be kept secret from the men and from nomads of either horde they might encounter during the journey. From here, we ride southeast until we reach the Kensaw River. We'll follow the river until it turns northeast, then continue east-southeast until we pick it up again at some of the old dams near Tulsa, and on until we're within half a day's ride from the Texark patrol road. At that point we reconnoiter, and send a patrol to infiltrate the Wachita. Blacktooth translated for the nomad scouts, and Gleaver continued, The moon should be full again about the time we arrive. Our brothers beyond the border there can arrange incidents to distract the patrols, while we try to drive the wagons past the border at night. With luck we can arm the valley people without a fight. If we have to fight to get them in, it will mean Hannigan has seen us coming. That means secrecy. Don't talk to any nomads we meet about where we are going. The nomad warriors nodded their understanding, but Blacktooth heard them talking later about the troop being observed by motherless ones who regularly sold news of grasshopper movements to Texarc agents. There would be a blue moon on the last day of July. By day or by night, a convoy of wagons escorted by light horse infantry traveling east-southeast across the plains toward Watchard Ozakia would not go unobserved. Nimi and the nomads expected a fight, but only Nimi was committed to it, and his Idria was in jail. The whole scheme seemed crazy. A week after the departure from Valana, Sorley Norwat caught up with them. He was weary from fast riding and immediately made a bed in one of the wagons. The horse he had been riding bore a brand which identified it as belonging to one of the nomad messenger families, so it was clear that he had changed horses several times in catching up with them. Why Norwat? What was so important about this expedition that the head of SEEC joined the command? Previous to his appearance, Blacktooth had suspected that this feckless sortie of the Valanan militia was entirely Chantar Hadala's project, and, impressed against his will, he wanted to desert. But Norwat had been Brown Pony's closest friend and supporter in the Curia, and his presence seemed to confirm the legitimacy, if not the sanity, of the mission. Gaisi and Musso Lo, now sergeants, had come with the expedition, and their loyalty to Brown Pony was beyond suspicion. There would be no deserters with them looking on. One morning early in mid-July, while passing the cardinal's tent, he overheard a murmur of conversation between these princes of the church. Peace, yes, but the peace of Christ, Adala was saying. Sure, Brown Pony loves peace, Brown Pony's friend answered. He loves it so much he doesn't care who he kills to get it. Blacktooth hurried away, but perhaps not before being seen. Sorely Norwat began avoiding him immediately afterward. O oh, Santa Librada, freedom is not visible. Pray for us. That night he dreamed of a woman, a casualty of war. She was half buried in a hillside pocked by cannon fire. Blood drained slowly in a thick stream from a hole at the edge of her breast. Half her body and her right arm was swallowed up by the landslide, while her left arm lay free and limp among the stones in sand. He touched her arm and felt for a pulse. He could find none, but the wound in her side continued to bleed. The flow of blood continued. It ran into the sand and between the stones and continued to run ten feet down the slide. He tore off a piece of his robe and tried to staunch the flow, but even after leaving it there while he counted to a thousand, the wound bled unchecked. He began trying to dig her out, but his work moved a critical stone, causing her body to shift, 
and caused several rocks to roll from above, as if the landslide had not finished its work. Soon it became apparent that the flow of blood was increasing, until he saw that the blood could no longer be her blood, but was coming through her from somewhere deep within the collapsed hill. But the blood was keeping her alive. After a while she opened her eyes and looked at him. For a moment she was Edria. She raised her left hand toward his face, and he saw a torn palm with more blood. Tengo ojos, no me miren. Tengo manos, no me tapen. She was Santa Librada now, deposed from the cross. He backed away in fear. She hissed and turned red and tried to bite him. She was the bride of Brown Pony, the buzzard of battle. A shadow fell over him and he looked up. There stood Elia Brown Pony in white vestments and wearing the tiara. He sprinkled the woman with holy water and she shrieked in agony. Black Tooth always had trouble sleeping under the stars. Chapter 23 Indeed, at all seasons, let the hour, whether for supper or for dinner, be so arranged that everything will be done by daylight. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 41 The Emperor was a part-time scholar. With the help of a young political science professor, who was also a popular author, Kilpeo Hark had written a book. It was a book Brown Pony, not surprisingly, had sent to the Holy Office as soon as he saw it. The Holy Office duly added it to the Index Librorum Prohibitorum, although it bore the imprimatur of the Cardinal Archbishop of Texarch, and carried an introduction by a monk of St. Leibowitz, who, unfortunately for his career, happened to agree with the Imperial Mayor that the restoration of the Magna Civitas could only be accomplished by secular science and industry under the protection of a secular state against the resistance and hostility of religion. It was such a self-evidently wicked book that the Holy Office wrote neither an attack nor a commentary. The work was filed under anti-clericalism. Its author was already so thoroughly anathematized that further curses from eternal Rome would seem petty. But Filpeo was a scholar, and among other things he had been able to restore several ancient pieces of music, including one of regional origin which seemed well suited to become the new national anthem for the Empire, and he published it in his book. The tune was now well known. Its ancient words were English, but the old Zark translation scanned well enough. It began, The eyes of Texark are upon you. The mayor wanted his subjects to feel well watched. Every priest in the empire who read the crusading bull Scitote Tyrannum aloud from the pulpit, or who publicly observed the interdict imposed on the Texarch church by the brown pony papacy, there were only thirteen of them, was arrested and charged with sedition. Two bishops who had suspended masses and confessions in their dioceses in obedience to the bull joined the priests in jail. In six out of seven parishes throughout the empire, however, the religious life went on as if Amen the Second had never spoken. After so many decades of a papacy in exile, the people of Hannigan City and even New Rome had lost sight of the Pope as a real player in their perceived world. He was distant, and his anger was like that of a player on the stage, except that the people only read the reviews without seeing the play. The communications media, mostly paper since the telegraph line to the west was down, kept them informed but the media were deferentially kind to the relatively absolute ruler of the state. Scitote Tyrannum, therefore, however binding it might be in heaven, was the least of Filpeo's worries on earth. The anti-pope's forces were going to march, and the anti-pope had used the treasures of the church to arm the wild nomads with superior weapons to be used against civilization. Filpeo always spoke of him as anti-pope, although there was no competing pope. Filpeo stood for the renewal of the Magna Civitas, and Brown Pony, the antipope, opposed it. It was that simple from the Hannigan's point of view. Brown Pony was the past waging war against the future. He armed the barbarians and would soon send them against civilization's holy places, if not against the city of Hannigan's itself. Filpeo was confident he could defend the city until the new firearms were delivered, and after that his forces would be able to drive the spooks back to the succumbents and herd the jackrabbit into the southwest desert, push the wild dog north of the misery, 
and herd the grasshopper into formerly wild dog lands, so that the two northern hordes would be forced to fight each other for living space. The imperial mayor hoped to win the nomad outlaws over to his side, and he sent an ex-pirate to recruit them. Admiral Ifondolai promised them grasshopper lands in the aftermath of victory. Philpea was amused to hear of it at first, but after giving the matter some thought, he decided that he would, if possible, honor the promise Carpi had so rashly made. If the motherless ones could marry farm women and be assigned enough land, they could raise fully domesticated cattle and live in fixed homes and trade with the farmers and the cities. In such circumstances, they would not develop a society anything like the hordes. Very likely the taboo against capturing wild horses could not survive without the Ouija's to enforce it, and the motherless ones, once they settled down, were not likely to restore the matrilineal inheritance of wild nomads. They would acquire property and fight to defend it. In the mayor's dream, in the wake of his certain victory, the grasshopper and the wild dog and the motherless ones would each be at war against the others, and the jackrabbit would straggle back out of the desert to be arrested and put to work repairing war-damaged properties. Philpeo was well pleased with his admiral, but not his general. When General Goldeem went to the university and demanded Thorn Hilbert's cooperation in teaching the troops how to contaminate wells in the province and infect cattle with the new diseases, Thorn Hilbert refused. General Goldeem went to the war office and got him inducted into the Texark army as a private. Then he ordered him to teach. Hilbert cursed the general personally, then cursed his monarch. The general had the professor put in jail for sedition. The Hannigan summoned the general to his quarters, fired him, and retired him at half pay. He then put Admiral de Fondoli, alias Carpios Robbery, in charge of the project. Because Hilbert's assistant at the university agreed to teach the military whatever was required, Hilbert remained in jail pending an apology to the Hannigan. The apology was not immediately forthcoming. Three months after he fired General Goldeem, Philpeo watched with delight as Admiral de Fondoli's model strike force, led by Carpius himself on horseback, marched past his reviewing stand. The imperial mayor had never seen such a burly gang of cutthroats outside of a prison yard. They were armed with the several dozen repeating arms which had already been delivered by the gunsmiths, which was quite an investment, and one which Philpeo had been reluctant to make at first. Carpios made the point that for an effective assault force, firepower was everything, so the emperor placed his most advanced weaponry in the hands of ruffians dressed in wolfskins and chewed leather. He watched them march under a banner that depicted a bird being roasted on a spit over a fire. The bird was branded with both the Ouija symbol for the buzzard of battle and with a pair of crossed keys. Philpeo laughed aloud at the sacrilege, called the old pirate back to the stand, and awarded him the ancient title of Vaccaro Supreme of the Plains, which had been claimed by the Hannigans since the time of their nomad roots, but which dropped out of use after Hannigan IV fell off his horse. Part of Philpeo's delight was at Carpio's expense, for the sight of the bearded pirate in Admiral's white uniform riding at the head of three hundred bathless ruffians dressed in wild dog skins was hilarious. After the parade, Philpeo not only gave him the title of vaquero, but promoted him to field marshal, so you can choose your own uniform, was the way the emperor put it. But he made sure to let the old seaman know that when he finished the project he would be made commander-in-chief of Texarc forces. There was something oceanic about the Great Plains. The Admiral sensed it too and became enthusiastic about the wars that plainly lay ahead. There was no clear Texarc military doctrine for nomad warfare, not since Hannigan IV fell off his horse and the Admiral's job was quickly to develop such a doctrine. The plains resembled the ocean in that there was nowhere to hide and no naturally defensive terrain in which to take refuge. Most land west of the last timber was equally accessible from all directions, and therefore as inhospitable as the storm-tossed sea. A cavalry battle there could be like an engagement between two ships of war, short, savage, and with only one surviving side. The Admiral thrice visited Thorn Hilbert in jail. He informed his ruler of the visits and affirmed their obvious purpose. 
He promised an account of the ultimate outcome, but declined to give a running report. The jailer told Philpeo that during the Admiral's third visit, they played old Zark chess and talked about nothing but the game. What came of the meetings was also nothing, but Carpy wanted the mayor to let the professor go anyway. Philpeo refused. He had no use for an apology, but apology or no apology, Hilbert would stay in jail until the university's cooperation with the military was satisfactory and assured. Thorn Hilbert's disease is hindering them in the south, a field commander told him. A few cases have appeared among Brown Pony's armies, but it is becoming endemic only in the province. Because of it, the spooks and the jackrabbit rebels are exhausting their military energy for the time being. We can soon launch a counterattack. And no cases of the disease have appeared among our troops? No, as I told you, as long as they drink Hilbert's preventative every day. It tastes bad, and they don't like it. But there is a standing order that any trooper who catches Hilbert's disease shall be immediately shot. To prevent further contagion is the stated reason. The mayor shifted restlessly. That sounds unnecessarily cruel. Well, if carried out, of course. The threat is necessary to prevent contagion. It is only meant to ensure the men drink the preventative. The war dog was a constellation in the nomad night, but he was also the mythical pet of the Lord Empty Sky. That ancient hero had led even wild dogs into battle against the army of the farmer king. Nomads had always sent their dogs against the enemy whenever practical, but Empty Sky's battle was unique in that his dogs were wild dogs, and in that their elder Weegis bitches had elected Empty Sky to be sharp of the horde of wild dogs, while his sister thought the dogs were merely being loyal to the Kisak Drivurdar, to whom all loyalty was due. The fact that the horde of wild dogs had elected him as its own rival to the human wild dog shark suggested that the office was usually held by a dog, that this dog had an equal claim on human wild dog loyalty and young wild dog women was a grasshopper conceit. It was a conceit that sometimes led to fighting between rival bands of drovers of the northern hordes. But the war dog was still a nomad mythic reality, and Swimming Elk had begun his reign as Scharf by ordering a return to the old practice of keeping attack dogs trained to accompany horsemen into battle against an unmounted enemy, and he awarded a monopoly on the training of war dogs to the family of his brother's wife which is a nomad way of saying that he gave the job to a brother-in-law, Goatwind by name, who happened to be good at it. Goatwind persuaded all the adolescents of his extended family to organize parties for raiding lairs of wild bitches and stealing their puppies. He turned the management of puppy collections over to his sister, with an injunction against killing bitches except in self-defense, and another against taking pups younger than six weeks. A Ouija's minority held that stealing wild puppies was an offence like stealing wild colts, but Elkir's sister asked them scornfully, Who are we offending? The Hung and Fuji Vern is not the wild bitch woman. The dogs belong to Empty Sky, for whom the shaft speaks. We don't even punish the motherless ones for roasting wild puppy. Demon Light wanted results within two months, so Goatwind collected every available dog with any experience at all as a working companion to a horseman. Even now, in late July, results were apparent. Thirty-five willing warriors had been given thirty-five dogs to work with, and eighty-one younger dogs were already in school. There was no way to test dogs in the occasional skirmishes with Texar cavalry, for dogs could never effectively join one side in an encounter between mutually mounted war bands. The dogs could participate in a cavalry attack on infantry, but since nomad wars were usually ceremonial conflicts between hordes, there had been no reason since the time of Hungun Us to bear the expense of feeding a large war pack, until Elkir began contemplating battle against the standing armies of the Hannigan. The spirit of the dog-man-horse war entity was still alive in the tribes, however, and Demon Light's attempt to awaken it was immediately popular. It added Empty Sky's blessing to his leadership. But any nomad-speaking Texarc agent, and there must have been at least one, who learned about the training of dogs for war would know that dogs were only for fighting unmounted armies like the defenders of empire. They would be useful for incursions into Texarc's space. 
His brother, kindly light when he broke through Texarc border defenses and rode all the way to New Rome, had needed dogs. With dogs, Hultor might have lost only half as many men, even if it cost him all the dogs. A dog was a lethal, loyal weapon once the man and the dog and the horse became melded into a single spirit, which was then merged into a spirit of a pack. Man became more horse-like and dog-like. Dog and horse became more human and more like each other. It was a spiritual unity, but probably the only outsider to notice it as such was that old Christian shaman of the wild dog, Father Ombros, a man Eltur much admired, although he begrudged his influence on the wild dog shamans. The epiphany of the dog-horse-man unity was, when experienced, a nomad sacrament, according to Ombros. Monsignor Samuel had called it a bestial form of diabolic possession, a remark which Eltur found flattering. It was the issue of the war dog that saved Chunter Cardinal Hadalla and his officers from death at the hands of a grasshopper war party. The occasion of the issue being raised was a council called when the news of Hadalla's invasion first came to the grasshopper leadership. Demon Light became livid, and was quite ready to launch an immediate attack on the cardinal's forces. For negotiating purposes it always behooved a grasshopper shaft to take a harder line in council than he expected the grandmothers to approve. But it was his own sister who used the issue of the war dog against him after Eltur proposed killing Hadala and anyone else who resisted a seizure of the militia's wagons. It is a complete betrayal, my sister, said Demon Light before he yielded. Brown Pony's plan was for the sucker mint spooks to attack in the province, and the eastern allies to strike at the other shore of the great river. The grasshopper was to keep the peace until Handigan took the forces which now face us to the defense of his allies. Now here comes this army of farmer clowns out of Valana tramping toward Glep Valley with guns. How is Philpeo Hark not to notice them coming? Every motherless one south of here has seen them and tried to sell the information to Texarch. The first one who tried probably got paid. Yes, and I wonder, his sister said thoughtfully, if the motherless one who told Texarch about your war dogs was properly paid, and whether your dogs will affect Hannigan's temptation to weaken the forces that face us. No, I don't think Grasshopper justice demands killing the fools. It demands they turn back. You should let them choose. Take their guns with them, or surrender them to you. And that, my shaft, is the Ouija's consensus. Demon Light let his battle fury subside, as it usually did in the face of the Ouija's consensus. If no bear spirit, objection arose. After the council, Brougham assembled a force of eighty warriors and led them south by east to intercept this mounted militia of townsmen from the mountains. His men had armed themselves with new five shooters as well as traditional lances, but Eltur ordered ten repeating rifles brought along for killing officers at a distance if they met resistance from the townsmen. Then he took an action which changed the course of the war. He sent for Black Eyes, who had been captured during Hultor's raid. The man had been imprisoned by the Hannigan and had met Cardinal Brown Pony in jail, but he was released months later to carry a message from Pilpeo to his horde. Both Demon Light and the Emperor knew Black Eyes was a double agent, but as such he could be useful to both. Tell your contacts about Adela's expedition, said the Shah so they can mount a defense in that area. And tell them I told you to tell them. If they want to know why I let them know, explain that I want hostilities to cease between the grasshopper and Texarch. The farmers will be glad to hear it, said Black Eyes with a snicker. He left camp immediately for the frontier. Demon Light was not really turning on his allies because he was not convinced of his own complaint of betrayal by the Pope, for while Brown Pony alone might be foolish enough to launch such a venture, Brown Pony had good advisers on nomad affairs. Some were sent to him by Holy Madness, Lord of the Hordes. And Eltior thought highly of one of the Pope's secretaries, the nomadic interpreter monk Nyinden, who spoke Grasshopper so well. None of these counselors would allow Brown Pony to believe that Chunter Hadala's incursion into nomad country was acceptable to the Grasshopper, even were it not militarily stupid on the face of it. When his initial berserk reaction to the news of the advent subsided, 
Demon Light expected his war party to be confronted not by a force of official crusaders launched by a pope, but by a motley parade put in motion by the lunacy of lesser men. When Brown Pony first learned about Adala's mission, he himself cried betrayal, and his anger was stirred against his successor in the Secretariat of Extraordinary Ecclesiastical Concerns. The Pope could think of no reason why Sorley Norwat would betray him or lend support to a harebrained scheme to arm and assist such dubious allies as Adala's flock of gleps in the valley, at the cost of probable hardening by Texarch of its western frontier. Hadala had gone crazy in the service of his flock, the Pope decided. He would think thus, If Brown Pony can arm the nomads, I can arm the real children of the Pope. Not the spooks and the succumbents, but the gleps and the wachita and Olzaks. The Pope could understand Hadala's passion for his own people, but not sorely Norwat's duplicity in the ridiculous undertaking. The possibility that his old friend Norvat had simply gone over to the enemy never occurred to Brown Pony until it was put to him by Abraha Cardinal Deacon Lincono, the new Jerusalemite schoolteacher who was invited to join the Curia because he knew everyone in this nation now playing host to the papacy. But what could Philpeo Hark possibly offer that would tempt Sorley Norvat to betray us? Pope Amen II wanted to know. The papacy, perhaps? the schoolteacher guessed. Stung by Lincono's speculation, Brown Pony sent an immediate message to Valana ordering Cardinal Norvat and Brother St. George to appear before him. By including Blacktooth in his summons, the Pope hoped to alleviate suspicion in case Sorley really was guilty. Within two weeks, however, the messenger returned with the news that Blacktooth had gone with the Valanan militia, and that Norvat had disappeared shortly after their departure. The news was very depressing to Brown Pony. He called his nomad messengers and instructed one of them to pursue Hadala's militia and order him to turn back. He deputized another as an officer of the Curia to arrest Norwat on sight if found in nomad country, and to arrest Hadala if he disobeyed the order to retreat. He sent a third messenger to assure the grasshopper Scharf that Hadala's sortie was not authorized, for the Pope feared the wrath of demon light. The nomad messenger service families, both Wild Dog and Grasshopper, had for decades enjoyed a monopoly on a High Plains relay parcel delivery between Valana and New Rome. They kept fixed camps, and for this unnomadic practice they were not admired within their hordes. Sneering warriors would ask to see their vegetable patches. But they had made money, and they used it to buy horses from outsiders, thus freeing themselves from family obligations incurred by both buyer and seller when the seller was a nomad mare woman. Brown Pony had always used the relay families for communicating with the sharfs and the tribal chiefs. Now he used them for keeping in touch with the Kisok Drivverdar, and he was encouraging the families to establish relay stations north of the Misery River and well beyond the reach of Texarch patrols. He had already sent messages toward the king of the Tennessee and several other rulers beyond the Great River, and he was awaiting news from that front. To New Jerusalem, Brown Pony had brought two wild dog and two grasshopper riders to open a branch office of the family's service. In the abrupt wake of Norvats and Sorley's defection, he now found need for three of them. To one grasshopper rider he gave a message for demon light. It authorized Braum to exercise the papal warrant for the arrest of two princes of the church in his territory with authorization to imprison them humanely. Forgetting for a moment that the Pope understood their dialect, this grasshopper rider said to his kinsman, Our Scharf will surely appreciate these new powers in his own realm. Your family must send us someone less sarcastic, Pope Amen said to him in half-decent grasshopper. You can pass your message on to the next wild dog relay rider tomorrow. Then you can start riding home to tall grass country. Your family can send us your replacement when you get there. He stopped looking at the man and spoke to the wild dog rider. You can be home tomorrow and relay my message to Hadala from there. It will get to him quicker that way. We can't give arrest powers to a wild dog in grasshopper country. We do deputize you to arrest Norvat anywhere else you may find him. There will be a reward for him. Spread the word on that. He turned to the second grasshopper. You must chase Hadala all the way to Olzakia if you need to. Give him a copy of the same message. 
If he's not already obeying it and coming home by the time you catch up with him, you can read aloud to his men paragraph 7. It excommunicates all Hadallah's followers who do not disband and desert at once. Arm yourself, but try to get help from your sharp in making the arrest. He then looked pointedly at the maker of the sarcastic remark. When you see a man you can't control about to take the law into his own hands, you might as well save yourself embarrassment and put the law in his hands yourself. The man, having already been fired, answered back, Nevertheless, your holiness will be embarrassed when I tell Sharp Elchior you said that. Brown Pony glared at him for a moment, then broke out laughing. All right, you can come back here after you pass the message for Braum to the relay. Someday we'll need an insolent rider with a gift for blackmail. Grandmother Grasshopper raised insolent colts and children. Maybe I'll come back, and maybe I won't, the relay rider said. Chunter Hadala's war party and ammunition train traveled faster than anyone expected. The moon was nearly full again in the late days of July, but when it left the world dark setting before dawn, Blacktooth could see distant points of light on the eastern horizon. They looked like fires. Would farmers keep night fires burning? Nimi knew that a relay messenger had come from the west with a message for Cardinal Hadala on the 28th. The messenger had seemed surprised to find Cardinal Norwat with the train. Of course, the Cardinal Secretary had left Valana two days late and by night, so that no one in the city could be sure of his destination or whereabouts. The messenger left again, but the effect of the message on the Cardinals was to command a forced march. The troop rode eastward until midnight. The next morning the sun arose above the distant hills where Nimi had seen points of firelight in the night. Beyond those hills would lie the sprawling glep settlements of the valley. After a fast breakfast of biscuits and tea, the militia rode on toward them. Two days later, near sundown, the grasshopper shaft with a war band overtook them from the west. The militia had already camped from the night. After conferring with the cardinals, Major Gleaver ordered the wagons arranged in a defensive array and the men to take cover in expectation of an attack. This is crazy, Nimmy, Avalot said. They are allies. Just don't obey any order to shoot. I'll talk to them. Blacktooth walked out of the defensive position and went to meet the grasshopper warriors as they approached. He could hear Major Gleaver yelling at him to come back, and he stopped once when a nomad raised a rifle at him. Demon Light spoke a word, and the rifle was lowered. He recognized the monk and beckoned him on. A bullet struck the ground near Blacktooth's feet. The report came from behind him. The nomad who had lifted the rifle lifted it again and returned fire. Nimmy looked back in time to see one of the lieutenants standing beside Lever drop his pistol and fall to the ground. For God's sake, stop shooting, you fools! Nimmy yelled. I'll try you and hang you! the major yelled back. Behind Lever stood Chunter Hadala, looking grim. Sharp Braum lingered just beyond gunshot range, and he sat there for several minutes while the monk came up to him. You remember me? Blacktooth asked. Braum nodded. But what is the Pope's servant doing with these men? I'm not the Pope's servant now. My master left Valana without me. Yes, I knew that. I took him south to meet Dion. He thought you abandoned him. Did you? Not intentionally. I was not in the city when the palace exploded. When I came back, he was gone and I was drafted into the militia. You seem not to have been told the news. What news is that, Sharp Braum? Demon Light, unable to read for himself, handed the monk a letter. Blacktooth read it with mounting dismay, looked at Eltur, then back at the cardinals. This must be the same message Cardinal Hadala got. You go tell him what it says and ask him. Then tell him if he continues east, I shall not arrest him if he travels alone. Alone? I don't understand. What about Cardinal Norwat? It was Eltur's turn to be surprised. Is he here? Then they can travel east together. The rest of you will stay here. I don't understand. They seem to be expecting you to attack. They expect me to arrest them. Doesn't the message say that? What they don't know is that I already sent a messenger to the Texarch border guard. The enemy knows you're coming, and he knows why. 
The only way Hadala can keep the guns from the Hannigan is to give them to us. And the only way the Cardinal's going to escape from me is to surrender to the Hannigan's border guard. Then the rest of you go home. Remind them what Hungan Islechur did to Esit Loit. We can do as much for them if we have to arrest them. The letter Blacktooth had read said nothing about handing the Cardinals over to the Hannigan, but he chose not to argue. When he returned to the camp, everyone was watching him, and you lad was waiting to seize him. At the last moment, he changed direction to put a group of recruits between himself and the spook sergeant. He spoke quickly to Avalot. The Scharf has orders from the Pope to arrest the Cardinals. If we resist, we are all excommunicated, and the enemy is ready for us because Braum warned them we were coming. Tell the men, especially Sergeants Gaisi and Wusolo, tell them to pray and let Hadala see them praying. He tried to get to the Cardinals before you lad got to him, but the giant was fast. He arrived in a headlock and was forced to his knees. Sorley Norwat, since joining the expedition, had seemed anxious to avoid Blacktooth, and he now hurried away. Chantar Hadala bent over the monk. He was a glep himself, his skin dappled with various shades of brown, a common mutation. But he was a handsome man in spite of it, with a goatee and a long moustache that had once been golden. Well, brother, tell us about your conversation with the nomad warlord, said the vicar apostolic to the Wachita nation. Your eminence won't shoot the messenger? Nobody sent you as a messenger, the cardinal snapped. And the major may yet have you shot. Just tell us what you found out. Have you seen the fires in the east at night, my lord? Yes, they are our people's beacons. They know we're here. So does Texark. The Scharf warned them you were coming. The fires belong to the cavalry. The lighter patches of the cardinal's skin drained of color. They are supposed to be allies, he gasped. Why does he sell us out to the enemy? Blacktooth, under threat and afraid, decided not to mention the Pope's letter directly. Adala already possessed a copy. The monk resumed. He says he will not arrest you and Cardinal Norwet if you surrender to the Texarch troops. He orders the rest of us to surrender the weapons to him and get out of his country. Adala sputtered and went in search of Norwet. Soon he came back with an order. Go see him again. Invite him here to parley. We will stay out in the open where his men can see us. If he comes alone, he may come armed. Do you think an oath by me that he will not be harmed or taken captive would help? Blacktooth thought about it for a moment. No, he might find it insulting. Do the best you can without it, then. The Scharf was not reluctant. He borrowed a second pistol from a warrior, tied the leash of a heavily built war dog to his belt, grasped the monk by his uniform collar, and began walking toward Hadala's encampment with a gun to Nimi's head. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm no good as a hostage, Scharf Braum. They won't care if you kill me. As they stopped before Hadala, Gleaver, and Hadala's grasshopper guide, Elchur released Blacktooth, untied the dog's leash, and barked a single word at the animal, who began to growl and stare at the cardinal. If I'm shot, the dog kills you. Hadala spat venom at demon light for trafficking with the enemy and Blacktooth translated it. The Scharf ignored it. Braum waved an arm toward the east and spoke in short sentences. Between them, Blacktooth translated, This eastward lane here will be kept open. It goes from your camp to the hills yonder and to sunrise. When an armed man steps into the lane, we shoot him. An unarmed man gets one warning shot, but you and the other red hat may pass going east. Take with you any disarmed officers you wish. Red Beard ordered me to arrest and hold you. I am Scharf of the Grasshopper Horde. I give orders here. Empty Sky is my Pope. The Wild Horsewoman is my sister. Hungan Isla is my Lord. Demon Light gestured broadly at the sky, at the earth, and again toward the northwest prairie where his Lord would be encamped. After a pause, he went on grandly, I, the Scharf of this country, offer you, Grasshopper, hospitality. You will be required to gather dry turds for the kitchen fires, and the women will make you shovel horseshit. They will tease you a lot, but you will not be hurt. 
When Redbeard sends for you, you must go to him. If you don't accept our hospitality, you just march east, without arms and without men. The Hannigan's men will take you in. He may be glad to get you. Are you including Major Gleaver? Adala asked sourly. Eltur grew impatient and began talking in longer sentences. He knew nothing of Gleaver. He had already been told he could take unarmed officers. Braum made scattered remarks about the Cardinal's stupidity. Blacktooth waited for him to pause and then summarized. Let Major Gleaver cooperate in his own disarmament, he says. The Scharf will leave him in command to hold the men together on the trek back home. He says the rabble will get out of his tall grass country quicker if we are under command. But if Gleaver wants to surrender to Texarch, Scharf Braum will let him pass. He knows we outnumber his men nearly four to one. What makes him think? He can stop us, shall I ask? Ask him if two of his men are equal to seven of ours. The Scharf chuckled as soon as Nimi translated, then shared a few private jokes with his interpreter. Abdallah became angry. What does he say? Stop having your own private conversation. He says seven against two would be fair if you leave your wagons undefended. Your seven men with seven guns might chase his two men with two guns for several days, inconclusively, but you would lose the wagons. If we defend the wagons, we'll just be pinned down and starved out. And if you don't make up your mind soon, Texarch will come out and get the wagons. Are those his words or yours, Brother St. George? Be careful you don't go too far. After this admonition, Hadala began speaking slowly enough for Nimi to translate simultaneously. Look, we are as worried as you are that the wagons will be intercepted by the patrol as we try to take them in. So why don't you help us? Your people have been well supplied with arms, and you don't need my wagons. The occupied territory ahead is just a narrow strip along the western frontier of the Wachita Nation. It's hardly more than a double roadway. The outer road is patrolled by Texarch troops. They look outward toward your country. The inner road is patrolled by the Valley Customs Service. They look inward at the Wachita Nation, my people. I myself am on the Customs Service Board for the Church. Their patrol will help us once we're past the Texarch troopers and the patrol sees who I am. If you could just help us hold back the Texarch riders until we get the wagons through, we'll all cut and run afterward. You are another Christian war shaft, another military genius in a red hat. There are so many of you. Blacktooth found himself unable to avoid echoing Braum's sarcastic tone, although he could see that the Cardinal was beginning to seethe. But what will stop the Texarch cavalry from riding right straight into the heart of the Valley of the Gleps to take the wagons away from you? Why, we hoped to cross over by night unknown to them. But you ruined that by warning them, and the treaty between... Adala's explanation was cut off by a grasshopper war cry. Someone shouted that a large dust cloud and a probable party of horsemen was seen in the east. They've decided to come and get you themselves, Glep Priest, said Braum with a savage smile. Now we are going to get out of the way. Aren't you lucky? You can fight them instead of us. All nomads took immediately to horseback, and Blacktooth watched them ride away toward the northwest. He was tempted to mount up and ride after them, but Ulad had threatened to shoot him in the back for desertion if he again broke ranks. Adana looked at him for a moment. Do you have an opinion, Brother Corporal St. George? He demanded sternly. Those riders will be here in a few minutes. That is my opinion, Your Eminence. Blacktooth turned and broke into a trot toward the wagons. Sorely Norfat and the Major had been standing there watching the meeting between Braum and Cardinal Hadala until the shouting started, but Norfat had faded from view. Cardinal Hadala's done with you, Private St. George! The Gleaver snapped at him. Report to Sergeant Ulad! Get your arms buckled on and get in the saddle. Still wearing Corporal's chevrons, Nimi took note of his reduction in rank without openly acknowledging it. Earlier in the day, the Major had been yelling at him about a court-martial and the gallows, so the demotion was a welcome commutation of sentence. When you lad looked at him, however, he could still see a readiness to kill. Having observed the grasshopper withdrawal, the Texarch commander halted his advance just beyond rifle range. 
The troopers dismounted. Some of them began digging. Demon Light drew up his warriors in a half-circle just out of range to the west of the Valanan Brigade's position. Blacktooth had no doubt that they would fight to prevent the guns and ammunition from falling into the hands of the Imperial forces. But they would not begin to fight until Hadala and his men were defeated by those forces. The Valanan Light Horse, untested troops, and their spook commanders were sandwiched between two superior war bands. It was almost nightfall on Tuesday, the 2nd of August. The moon rose an hour after sundown. During that hour, Sorling Norwad vanished, never to be seen again west of Texarc frontiers. There is going to be a mutiny, Abelot whispered to Blacktooth at the first opportunity, unless the Glep Cardinal quits. Nimi shook his head. These townsmen could mutiny in Valana, but not out here between two unfriendly armies. Chantor Hadala remained at the head of his command. Sergeant Ulad shot a deserter who made a break for grasshopper lines during the night. When the body was dragged back to camp, it turned out to be the cardinal's grasshopper guide, who was only quitting his job to return to his people. Blacktooth told Abelot he was the shaft's man, and here we all are on the shaft's jurisdiction. So look at the sergeant now. The monk was remembering how Ulad, at their first meeting in Valana, had expressed hate for all nomads. But now that he had killed one, he showed in his face not satisfaction, but an astonishing fright. Chapter 24 If a brother who, through his own fault, leaves the monastery should wish to return, let him first promise full reparation for his having gone away, and then let him be received in the lowest place as a test of his humility. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 29 Fright, the mother of hatred, possessed the whole militia, but there was nowhere to run. Behind them, the grasshopper, in front of them, the emperor. Prowling among them were Chunter Hadala and two willing killers of conscripts, the major and Ulad. The flanks were faced with fires, but it was an unusually windless day. The fires had been set in the night, and no one was sure who set them, but because of the calm air nobody worried about them much. Before dawn, Ulad and three husky townsmen unloaded two cannon from the wagons and dragged them forward to face the foe to the east. Then they unloaded two more and aimed them toward the nomads. The sharf watched them do it, then broke his forces into two equal groups. He moved one group north and one south. They halted so as to face the Valanans from the southwest and northwest. Ulad rearranged the cannon accordingly, but the nomad movement spoke of no need for cannon. The way west was wide open, by invitation of the shaft. In Blacktooth's opinion, acceptance was the only sane thing to do, but Chunter Cardinal Hadala was adamant. All you who repent your sins, I absolve you, he announced to the assembled troops at dawn. In nomine patris filii et spiritus sancti. And if you die in battle for God's glory and the Holy Father's righteous cause, you will attain heaven without purgatory's purifying pain. I now bless you. This, Abelot whispered, from a man with the Holy Father's excommunication in his pocket. Surprised that other conscripts were not jeering Hadala, Blacktooth asked, Didn't you tell the others what I told you to? Abelot was meekly silent. Nimi looked him in the eye, then laughed bitterly. Everybody knew that Abelot was an outrageous liar, not to be believed. Besides, where would he get the courage to accuse a cardinal behind the cardinal's back, when every man would in the end point his finger right at Abelot and say, I heard it from him? Well, Blacktooth would have to spread the word himself, or at least enlist one of the Yellow Guard. It was not easy to get close to them, however. They were close only to Cardinal Hadala, as they had always been to Brown Pony. Water was rationed. The supply of jerky was exhausted, and with no hunting possible, the men ate beans and biscuits. The enemy waited for Hadala to move. Hadala waited for Gleps from the valley to attack the enemy from the rear, but this seemed wishful thinking to Blacktooth. On the third day of the standoff, in plain view of the Valana forces, Scharf Braum sent a messenger under a flag of truce to the Texarch commander. This further traffic with the enemy increased the cardinal's fury. At Gleaver's orders, several townsmen shot at the messenger, but he was riding beyond range for accurate rifle fire. 
That night before the moon rose, fourteen grasshopper warriors stole into camp, killed two sentries, and stole or drove away most of the horses. After the rise of the gibbous moon, a detachment of Texar cavalry, which had approached noiselessly in total darkness, mounted and rode through the camp, screaming and killing with sabers and horse pistols. Several attackers were killed in turn by the well-armed militiamen. After dawn, eighteen bodies were buried, five of them wearing Texarc uniforms. There were seven non-fatal casualties as well. Abelot had lost his right ear to a Texarc saber. You never left your bedroll, you bastard, he said to Nimi. I guess I slept through it, Blacktooth lied. The loss of the horses drove the Hadala over the edge. He ordered an infantry attack on the now entrenched Texarc position. The cardinal took a cross and proceeded to march proudly with it at the head of the army, his red cap and sash making him a conspicuous target. Major Gleaver shot three men who refused to move out. Three companies of green troops with bayonets fixed to their excellent rifles moved forward behind sporadic covering fire from three cannon. Ulad, furious as usual, led the way behind the cardinal Crucifer, but kept looking back to see that the others stayed in line. Terror whitened men's faces as they came into range, and some of them began to fall from a crackle of fire by the enemy. Nimi kept his eyes half closed and prayed to the Virgin. He was astonished that there was no artillery fire directed at them from the Texarc rear. When they had covered half the distance to the enemy lines, he could see that berms of earth and sod had been thrown up. Imperial troops were firing at them from well-protected positions, and the effect was devastating. About a third of the men had fallen. Twice Ulad ordered the attackers to halt and fire, but each time the enemy's heads ducked behind the berms. Double time march! Shoot while you run! In terms of accuracy, it was a waste of ammunition, but it kept the enemy's heads down. After five shots, it was necessary to slow to a walk in order to reload. Most men had brought two extra cylinders already loaded, but while it was faster to change cylinders than to reload individual chambers, it was necessary to stop altogether to avoid dropping the pins, and to stop was to be shot by a spook officer. Look, they're clearing out! Run, damn it, run! Terror changed to a furious glee as the townsmen realized that the Texarc rifle fire from the forward berm had ceased, although there was still shooting in the distance. Pope's children, my people are there! A dollar was shouting back at them. He kept waving his cross like a club toward the foothills. They're attacking from the rear! That explains why cannonballs aren't raining down, Nimi said toward Abelot's bandaged ear. The message was not received above the sound of gunfire, but he added, Maybe the Glepps Cardinal is not as crazy as we thought. The Texarc army was not at all defeated. Forced by guerrillas from the valley to defend their rear, they had retreated from the attack out of the west to defend their artillery from an attack out of the east. The retreat was limited. When militiamen climbed the first berm, three of them were shot down as they went over the top. Gleaver called a halt. Obviously there were defenders of the second berm. But the attackers could use the enemy's first berm for their own shelter while they ate pocket rations and sipped from canteens. Nimi looked up to see Guy C. crawling toward him up a shallow gully. He was not hiding from the enemy, he was hiding from Hadala and the officers. Is it true? asked the Asian warrior monk after taking a careful look around. Yes, Nimi told him. If you got it from Abelot. Guy C. nodded grimly and crawled away by the same route. Now something would happen, he thought, but it did not happen immediately. The sun was scorching in early August, but by mid-afternoon a light westerly breeze came up. Blacktooth noticed that the restless grasshopper had moved again. The nomads had reformed and split into three groups, positioned to the north, west, and south of the wagons. They were still out of range, visible against a background of smoke, but the groups to the north and south were in place for a flanking attack against either the Hannigan or the Cardinal. The fires seemed to be moving slowly eastward. They marked the probable confines of the battleground and defined the possible lines of advance or retreat for the nomad groups who had likely set them. Soon afterward, during an assault on the second berm while trying to shoot over a man's head, Nimi shot him down. Facing Blacktooth, the Texarc trooper lay on his back on the sandbank just as he fell when shot. 
a glep, a glep in Texark uniform, with Adala's dappled skin and the rather common hairy ears. He stared up at the former monk, trying to see him against the smoke-blurred orb of the sun. His hands were raised toward his face, and they hung limply from the wrists. He looked like a puppy begging for a morsel. Why surrender with a ruined abdomen? He clenched his lids, waiting, hoping to be shot again. But Blacktooth dared not to waste ammunition on pity, or even take time to reload, because Ulad was watching him with deep suspicion. Every time he felt such tension, Wuxin's face and words came to his mind. Life is a dewdrop and a flash of lightning. That's the way to look at it, Nimi. Touching the point of the bayonet to the man's throat, Blacktooth severed the carotid artery. A blade of lightning, a drop of red dew. The drop became a spurting stream. He stepped back, looking around. His throat hurt and was dry. It was a hot day, and the air was full of smoke from burning grass. Each man, each being, is a world. There are innumerable worlds, my friend. Each world of this innumerable array contains and interpenetrates all the other worlds throughout the myriad cosmos, for there are no barriers between the worlds. Metaphysics from an executioner. For the axe, religion was a martial art. He wanted to talk to Guy C. or Wu So Lo about it, but they were always with the Cardinal and the officers, and he was made afraid by Guy C.'s crawling to him in a ditch. It's just that I have cut my own throat somehow, he thought, looking at the corpse. So murder feels like this to the murderer. Holy Mother of God, forgive me, but I don't feel very much. Sergeant Ulad was still watching him from the left, shaking his head. He must be careful not to waver or hesitate. Ulad was suspicious of his piety. He could see two men beyond Ulad. Corporal Victros had climbed to the top of the berm. He motioned the attack party upward. The sandbank flanked a scythed and well hoed but useless, firebreak. Blacktooth climbed the berm and cautiously peered beyond, but the patrol had fled. Why? It was the best place to stop and fight, unless they thought the Valanans' firepower overwhelming. Or, more likely, they might know that greater safety for them lay ahead, and that the Glep guerrillas must be prevented from seizing their artillery. Standing atop the berm, he looked back toward the wagons. What had happened to the men guarding them? He could see nomads in the distance, but no militiamen with the wagons. Without horses to draw them, they were lost anyway. Somewhere to the north, the tall grass was burning faster. They had been crosswind of the fire, whose smoke veiled the foothills in the northeast, but they were almost downwind now, and still the breeze was changing. He began to smell the smoke and could see to the north distant horseback warriors moving west out of the fire's path. If the wind kept veering, the wagons would be in danger. He motioned to you, lad, that the enemy had fled. They went over the sandbank and continued their cautious advance, camouflaged shadows flitting from knoll to knoll in the great ocean of grass. Watching from a distance on a hill crest south of the battle, the grasshopper Scharf could see some of the fight going on around the Texark artillery pieces. Texark was temporarily in trouble, and he was pleased. Demon Light hoped to influence the outcome of the battle by moving warriors about in a menacing way from time to time without actually exposing them to fire. His only intention at the moment was to keep the wagons from being captured by anyone except himself, although if he got them, the grasshopper had no pressing need for extra ammunition, and the horde's arsenal was already wealthy in new guns. He was not opposed to giving the Glep's guns if it became possible. Now it seemed it might be possible. It was clear that the Texarch force was being harassed from the rear. The fact surprised him as much as it did the Texarchy. Demon Light had warned them of Hadala's expedition but they had trusted him only enough to send two companies of cavalry, two of light horse, and a few artillery pieces to the region where he told them the townsmen would try a border crossing. Surprising to Eltyr was the fact that many of the Texarch troops were gleps, drafted from the valley. They had not expected a glep attack from the rear, and had not come well prepared. They would regret not having taken him seriously enough. Such regret might incline them to trust him more next time. When he sent them a message under a white flag, they had listened politely to the messenger as he laid claim to the contents of the wagons, and if this claim were honoured, there would be no reason for hostilities. 
He had also warned the Texar commander that he was about to steal the townsmen's horses. About the wagons the commander gave a polite but evasive answer, and he smiled on the horse theft project. In this situation, Demon Light was reluctant to attack his hereditary enemies except to prevent seizure of munitions. Nothing prevented his enjoyment of the conflict unfolding before him except a report by a scout from his southwest detachment that a band of motherless ones had approached but stopped a few minutes' ride away and occupied a hilltop there. To Braum they were a damn nuisance, and they too wanted the guns. He was aware that many of the motherless ones in the south part of the Wild Dog Lands had been armed by Dion and sent against the enemy in the province, but these outlaws were far from that battle, and if they were able to get their hands on the new weapons, they were as likely to shoot at his people as at the Texarchy. But they were even more likely to sell the fancy guns to the Hannigan, who had been slow in getting them. Though it would spoil his view of the fight for a time, he decided to withdraw his detachment from the north where the fire was beginning to crowd his rear, then to skirt around the townsmen's position and join all his forces together again between the militia and the outlaws. It would give other commanders something to wonder about, and the fires had become the grasshopper's allies, as the grasshopper Scharf knew they would when he practiced his family motto and set them. As he rode between the Valanans and a group of his own men to the west, he noticed with approval that the horses stolen from the wagoneers were being kept out of sight beyond a ridge. None of his warrior's mounts were broken as draft horses, so seizing and keeping the grass-eater's animals was essential to his plans. He sent a messenger to tell his cousin to the west of him to post enough men to guard the horses and join the rest of the detachment with Elchur's main force. Sundown was approaching when the enemy resumed fire and Cardinal Hadala was among the first to fall. Elswich Gleaver rushed to his side, inspected his wound, which he seemed to find in the back, and turned to look around at the men. This time Blacktooth saw Guy C. lift his pistol again and shoot Major Gleaver in the forehead. At the same time a high-pitched scream came from the rear. Eulad's voice. The blade of Wuso Lo's sword rose bloody into the air and fell again. Junior officers were shouting angrily. Brother Blacktooth St. George threw away his rifle, picked up a pistol from the body of a slain officer, and ran south for his life. A bullet struck the ground near his feet, but he was unsure which of three sides was shooting at him. As he ran around the bend near the crest of the ridge, he noticed a wide tunnel under a rock where something made its home. It was just big enough for him to slip into, and he dived for it feet first, praying earnestly that the owner was absent. The tunnel sloped downward as he slid into it and it was somewhat deeper than expected. He braked his slide and found his face two feet from the sunlit opening. Between the straps of his sandals he felt wriggling fur with his feet. Something bit his big toe, tiny fangs but sharp. He kicked it off. Other mouths were chewing on his sandal straps. My God, I'm in a cougar's den and I'm going to die. Today is like any other day in being the day of death. Today a war is going on, and I am not a Daniel in this den, those St. Leibowitz. Still, it's the only day I've got. Last week it was a thunderstorm and the wet body of a lightning-struck warrior. Year before last a cyclone killed seventeen jackrabbit peasants. Then the locusts, the locusts, the locusts, and the emaciated corpses found frozen last winter. Just like any other day, he noted, as a bullet ricocheted off the rock above his head. The spent lump of lead fell into his waist, and he picked it up to inspect in the dim light. It was no bullet from a grasshopper or Valanan weapon, but a musket ball from a Texarch or an outlaw piece. The fact gave him a general idea of the direction of the enemy. He felt around with his feet, kicking kittens away. Their teeth were needles. What was keeping their mother? Afraid of the fires, perhaps. He too feared them. In here we'll choke to death he told the kittens. While he was thus indulging himself in more fear and self-pity than was usual before he had so recently killed a man, something came and darkened the light from the end of the tunnel. He prepared to die. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Ho! Oh, who is down there? The language was Rocky Mount, but the accent was from Asia. Then he looked up to see a rifle aimed at his face. Don't shoot, it's Black Tooth! Is it safe to come out? It's not safe anywhere yet, said Guy C., and the fire is getting too close. Give me your hand. 
Nimmy shook a playful kitten loose from one trouser leg and crawled upward into the smoky light of late afternoon. The din of battle had subsided, except to the east where Texarch troops were still holding off glefts trying to get at the weapons. The warrior and the monk climbed the ridge and lay on the ground to look over the top. They could make up the bodies of Chunter Hadala and Major Gleaver. Both had been killed by Guy C., who, like Wu Xin, was prepared to execute anyone who betrayed his master. Where is Wu So Lo? You lad shot him when he saw me execute our master's enemies. But I saw my brother lived long enough to kill his killer. Nimi observed a detail of grasshopper warriors hastily hitching three of the wagons to draft horses they had stolen, for the fire was coming closer. The wagon's defenders had scattered during the infantry skirmish. The Valana militia had been destroyed by death, desertion, and the absence of command. From the east, Texar cavalry was riding toward the scene, but warily, for behind the ridge to the south was the Demon Light's main force, and just to the north was the advancing wildfire. Half a mile from where they lay, a Texarch trooper rode to the top of the ridge to observe the grasshopper order of battle. Guy C. rolled over, lifted his rifle, aimed very high, and fired. The impossible shot fell close enough to frighten the trooper's horse, and alerted the grasshopper who joined Guy C. in firing on the scout. The scout retreated. Guy C. stood up and looked south. Eltur's warriors were watching. Evidently they were not shooting at militia uniforms. Look! said Gysi, pointing. Somebody killed a big cat. Blacktooth stood beside him, then went to investigate. The animal lay on the rocks twenty paces west of them. It was a female. Come on, he said to Gysi, and went back down the ridge to the cougar's den. Soon they had recovered the kittens, but three nomads rode up with drawn guns and spoke in grasshopper. Drop your weapons at once, citizens! Surrender! They complied, but Nimi smiled at the polite word, citizens, and replied in the same language. The troopers are riding toward the wagons, you know. We'll gladly surrender, but we'll need our weapons to get home again. One warrior rode to the top of the ridge. The other dismounted and recovered the guns. As he unloaded them, he spoke to Blacktooth. You are the man who came out to parley with the Scharf. He says you are a servant of the highest Christian shaman. Is that so? It used to be so. The warrior handed him back his unloaded pistol, then returned Guy C.'s empty rifle. You are the man who killed the cardinal and the major, are you not? Guy C. nodded. The other warrior came down from the ridge and said, We'd better tell Scharf Elture it's time to attack. Let's go. They both rode away, leaving the two to follow on foot with empty firearms. As soon as the warriors returned to their command, the main party of nomads split into two groups one of which rode to the bottom of the ridge, dismounted, and climbed it on foot. They took prone positions on the crest as snipers. From the fact that heavy smoke was blowing south over the ridge, and that the snipers did not commence firing at once, Nimi deduced that the fire was delaying the movement of the cavalry toward the wagons. Every time a trooper mounted the ridge to the east to reconnoiter, he was fired upon by the main nomad party. The Texar commander probably wished to cross the ridge before riding west but the grasshopper made it impossible. At least some of the wagons were being pulled west by Valanan draft horses driven by nomads. The rest would soon be caught by wildfire, if not captured first by Texark. By sundown, the rest of the wagons had been swept up in the fire. Some exploded, all burned. Burned, too, were the bodies of the slain, but the wind subsided at twilight, and the blaze did not cross the ridge. Sharp Braum had rounded up and fed all the militia survivors who surrendered their arms. The few who refused to give them up, mostly spook officers who feared revenge by Valanan conscripts, he ordered killed. He ordered his warriors to treat the prisoners of war with courtesy, but the grasshopper fighters were too full of playful malice toward farmers for the farmers' comfort. Food was shared but dipped in sand. One warrior lent Nimi a leather pouch large enough for three cougar kittens, then claimed the monk had stolen it. There were less than forty exhausted captives, but some other deserters had perhaps escaped capture by the Texarchy or the nomads. When he saw Nimi among the refugees, Demon Light called him to his side as interpreter. After laughing at the kittens, he returned the monk's pistol and ammunition. Nimi immediately asked permission to turn the weapon over to Guy C. My eyes are too weak to hit anything. I killed a man by mistake when I meant to miss him. 
Elchur sent for Guy C., and after a brief conversation through Blacktooth concerning the warrior monk's continuing loyalty to Brown Pony, the sheriff gave him his weapons back. Then he looked to the smoky sky. Your Pope's wife has come. Look, the sister of the day, maiden. Overhead a large bird was circling the battlefield. In the smoke and the light of the late sun the buzzard appeared to be bright red. Other birds were gathering. They seemed small and dark by contrast, but perhaps they flew at higher altitude. It means the battle is over. Nimi and Gaisi were eerily silent. Tomorrow we leave for the tents of my tribe, Braum said. The wounded can stay there until they heal. The rest of you will be taken west to be judged by the Kisok Zivedar, hung on this lecture. Then I imagine you will be escorted back to Valana, or in your case, Nyinden, to your brown pony. Tell this to the others. Tell them they must travel with us, or they will fall into the hands of the motherless ones. We have recaptured enough of Hadala's horses for you to ride. Demon light seemed quite friendly, and Nimi dared ask, Are you satisfied with today's outcome, Sharf Braum? The Vurrigan will not eat grasshopper bodies. I lost no men, said the nomad leader. We captured five wagon loads of rifles and pistols before the fire or the motherless got to them. The ammunition wagons exploded. The Texarchy must have got about four loads of weapons that went through the fire. Those guns were ruined. Ruined as weapons, maybe, but not as patterns for Texarch to copy, Nimi said. You think so? And how long will that take? I don't know. Months, probably. There is one other matter I do find troublesome, Nyinden, said Elchur. Do you know that there were many gleps among the Texarchy? Nimi frowned. The man I killed was a glep. That surprised me. It seems that the Emperor is either impressing able-bodied gleps from the valley or hiring them as mercenaries. It suggests he is short of manpower. Or he is sending some of his main force to the east of the Great River, as we hoped. There was dissent in the Texarch ranks. My messengers told me so. Do you understand why? I think so. Cardinal Hadala was expecting a force from the valley to strike the troopers' rear. When they did so, the Glep troopers probably refused to fight. Maybe that's why they retreated from us. Elchur snorted. You townsmen make good corpses, but not good killers. It had to be the reason. Now, tomorrow we must go to a messenger family and send today's news to the Lord of the Hordes and your Pope. You may, if you wish, write to Brown Pony yourself, so long as you tell me what you say to him. Of course, you may read it. Demon Light laughed scornfully and departed. Blacktooth's face burned. He had forgotten that the shaft was without letters. Blacktooth was prepared to write his letter on cowhide with ink made of blood and soot, but the messenger family to which Braum brought him the following afternoon kept paper and pens for such emergencies, although they themselves were barely literate. He wrote hurriedly because the shaft was impatient to return to his family and tribe. I understand that Scharf Elchur Braum is sending you an oral account of the battle fought here, and to his words I would add nothing. While most of the weapons were recaptured by the Grasshopper War Party, Texarch troops found a number of them that passed through fire and are probably unfit for use, but the Mayor's gunsmiths may learn much from studying the design. I am ashamed, Holy Father, that I was not present in your time of peril. I was staying with the late Pope when you departed from Valana and then I fell into the hands of your betrayers. Sorley Cardinal Norwat has sought asylum in Texarch. Chunter Cardinal Hadala was executed by Brother Guy C. when he learned of his treason against your holiness. Many townsmen died in this futile battle. My body was unharmed, but my soul is a casualty, for I killed a man. I have been invited to stay with my distant grasshopper relatives, yes, the sheriff knows who they are, of his tribe, until I receive orders from your holiness, Abbot Olshewan, or the Secretariat, concerning my future duties and destination. Meanwhile, Sharf Braum wants me to be tutor to his nephews. I would find this work congenial, but with no books and no proper writing materials, it will be difficult. Again, I beg your forgiveness for my absence without leave in your time of need and shall gratefully accept and perform any penance it may please your holiness to impose. Your unworthy servant, Nyinden Blacktooth.
St. George, AOL. The relay horses of the messenger families were fast and frequently changed. In late August the moon was waxing, permitting them to ride by night. Still Nimmy was astonished by the speed of Brown Pony's reply. It was very simple. Honor the slaughtering festival, then come at once, said Amen the second only three weeks later. His cousins had been teasing him unmercifully about joining the fourteen-year-olds who would be undergoing the rites of passage to manhood at the festival, which normally occurred during a period of several days around the last full moon of summer before the autumnal equinox. They will stop calling you Nimmy if you endure the rite, the great-granddaughter of his own great-great-grandmother told him. Thank you, but the first man to call me Nimmy was Holy Madness, the Lord of the Hordes, and he intended no insult. I am not a warrior, I am not a nomad. This was the same festival which had been declared a movable feast last year, when its usual time coincided with the funeral of Grand Uncle Brokenfoot. The farmers celebrated a harvest festival at about the same date, but for the nomads it marked the beginning of the time of killing off old cattle and weaklings who could not survive the winter. Women culled out the horses not fit for war or breeding, and sold them to farmers north of the Misery River, or had them butchered and barbecued. Many of the slaughtered animals were converted into jerky for the time of deep snow, and the wild herds were hard to reach. It was a time for dancing, for drums, for gluttony, smoking keneb, drinking farmer's wine for fighting by firelight, and for celebrating the ravishing by empty sky of the wild horsewoman. Young men crawled into the tents of sweethearts, and Black Tooth was visited in the night by the dark form of a woman who would not reveal her name, but began removing his clothes. He was careful to do nothing that might offend her, and it turned out to be a hot and sweaty night. The following morning one of his female cousins smiled whenever she caught his glance. Her name was Pretty Dances, and she was chubby as a pig, but cute and comely. He thought of Idria and avoided her glance as much as possible. He had established his honor by fighting several young men his own size, and did well enough to avoid further teasing, but they still called him Nimi more often than Nyinden. On the day before his departure from the lands of his ancestors, the grasshopper double agent Black Eyes brought him a book he had obtained in a transaction with Texarc soldiers. Black Eyes had occupied the cage across the aisle when he and Brown Pony were prisoners in the Emperor's Zoo, and he still admired Blacktooth for an alleged attempt to kill Filpeo. The book cost me seven steers, he told the monk. The shaft thinks it might help you teach his nephews, because the soldiers said it is written in our own tongue. I don't understand how a book can have a tongue. Nimmy looked at the nomadic title and felt a rush of grief and shame. The Book of Beginnings, Volume One, by Virus Sarquis B. Dulles. The Texarch publisher had done a good job of duplicating Blacktooth's pan nomadic orthography, with the new vowels which permitted any nomad of any horde to hear the words as pronounced in his own dialect. In the front matter, there was an acknowledgment that the translation had come from Leibowitz Abbey. But there was, of course, no mention of the translator's name. Blacktooth had not included it in the original. The face of the late abbot Jared loomed large in his mind, and Jared's voice spoke to him as before, saying, All right, brothers and George, now think. Think of the thousands of wild young nomads or ex-nomads just like you were then, your relatives, your friends. Now I want to know. What could possibly be more fulfilling to you than to pass along to your people some of the religion, the civilization, the culture that you found for yourself here at San Leibowitz Abbey? Why are you crying, Nyinden? asked Black Eyes. Is it the wrong book for nomads? Chapter 25 If a pilgrim monk coming from a distant region wants to live as a guest of the monastery, let him be received for as long a time as he desires, provided he is content with the customs of the place as he finds them, and does not disturb the monastery by superfluous demands, but is simply content with what he finds. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 61 During the two months Mother Iridia Silentia spent at the court of Pope Amen II in New Jerusalem, one of the Pope's informants called it to his attention that this princess of the church and bride of Christ visited Shard's Idria in her house of arrest three times a week 
every week. He hesitated to inquire into this, for it was assumed by anybody who noticed or cared that Mother Iridia was either practicing spiritual therapy or teaching the girl the latest edition of the Catechism as rewritten and promoted by Pope Amen I. The edition already condemned as heretical by several Eastern bishops. Soon it became clear to her jailer that the girl wished to join the Ridia's religious community. This caused no alarm, and only Brown Pony stirred and became restless. Prisoners often converted to religion in jail. Mayor Dion, as commander-in-chief of the insurgent forces in the province, was gone most of the time, and Slow John's only interest in religion was as a tool to be used in the governance of men. When Idria took her simple vows as a nun of the Order of Our Lady of the Desert on Saturday, the 12th of August, Mother Iridia visited the Pope and complained that the secular government of New Jerusalem was keeping one of her nuns in prison. Brown Pony smiled and sent for Slow John. You are holding Sister Claire of Assisi in detention for unspecified offences, said Amen II. Messer, must I tell you that you have no jurisdiction over religious? I don't even know a Sister Claire of Assisi, Holy Father. You know her as Shards Idria, said Brown Tony. She became a nun on the feast of St. Clare last week, and so Mother Iridia named her Clare, which is what she will be called in her cloister. Slow John sputtered. Her offences are not unspecified. She violated the law by leaving the community without a permit from the mayor's office and she is suspected of espionage. She is innocent of espionage against this realm, to my certain knowledge, Brown Pony growled. As for your other complaint against her, the Church does teach obedience to legitimately constituted government such as yours. Since she admits her guilt in disobeying the law while it was in force, I promise you she will be appropriately sentenced for that offence by me. I must take note, however, that you are no longer enforcing the law that she broke. That is your affair. Sister Clare is our affair. You shall release her immediately to an ecclesiastical court. You well know the sanctions incurred for usurping church jurisdiction. My predecessor of beloved memory excommunicated the Emperor of Texarch himself for jailing me and my secretary. So that's the trick. Well, it won't work with me. Slow John turned and walked away from the papal audience with minimum courtesy. Brown Pony immediately drafted a letter to all clergy throughout the succaments, commanding that the sacraments be withheld from the mayor's son, until he obeyed the order to release Sister Idria St. Clair into the custody of the curia. The Pope knew that Slow John would not give any weight to such a sanction, except for the humiliating effect of the bad publicity when the letter was prominently posted for all to read in every church in the mountains. Still, Slow John would not budge until his father returned from battle a week later. Dion conferred with the Pope. First they discussed the war in the province, which had stalled around the 98th meridian. Then they discussed Idria. Whatever he might believe privately, Dion was a public Catholic. After the conference, he released Sister Clare into the custody of Mother Iridia Silentia, O.D.D., who became her defense counsel. The sanctions against the mayor's son were lifted. In an unusual move, the Pope permitted Slow John to assist the schoolteacher Abraha Cardinal Lincono as inquisitor and prosecutor. The outcome was inevitable, and the only point in dispute became the sentence to be imposed upon the nun by the supreme pontiff. Brown Pony noticed that the beauty of the barefoot sister who stood before him had not been diminished by motherhood or completely obscured by her coarse habit. She was radiant, smiling at him faintly, and her eyes were attentive and unafraid. That was bad. It implied that there was a conspiracy, and it had worked. Slow John already knew he had been duped, but he noticed the faint smile. Thus spoke Amen the Second with some attempt at sternness. Sister Idria St. Clair of Assisi, you are remanded into the permanent custody of Cardinal Silentia. For your offence against the laws of New Jerusalem, a legitimate secular authority, we sentence you to cross the brave river and spend the rest of your life in exile there, or until your sentence is commuted by the Holy See. Should you cross the river again from south to north, 
you incur excommunication by the very act of doing so. Idria's smile did not change. The sentence imposed was not different from that which her vows imposed. She came slowly forward and knelt to kiss her judge's ring. Where is Black Tooth? she whispered. Brown Pony suppressed a chuckle at her audacity, and whispered back, I have no idea. Thus it came to pass that the Lady Cardinal departed from New Jerusalem with Sister Idria St. Clair, and the three nuns who had been her conclavists in Valana. A coach was provided, and four mounted soldiers were appointed to escort them all the way to the brave river. At the last minute Iridia paid the Pope another visit, and sweetly asked his permission to make a rest stop at Leibowitz Abbey, a detour which would add no more than a few days to their journey. Brown Pony gazed at her in surprise. Cardinal Salentia was almost his own age, still gauntly beautiful and full of charm, if not grace. But now he saw that she was being charmed by Idria. She wants to know if Black Tooth has gone back to the Abbey, the pontiff sighed. That had occurred to me, Holy Father. But the guest house there is adequate and secure. The brothers and my sisters will see each other only in church, if at all. Very well, but if you lose her, you are both in trouble, he told her. His permission was based on his belief that neither Black Tooth nor Abbot Olshuan wanted to see the other ever again. However, if you meet Brother St. George anywhere, tell him I require his presence here immediately. Iridia knelt and withdrew. That was three weeks before Nimi's letter came to him from a battleground on the eastern plains. Brantoni found the letter irritating, and said to the messenger, Tell him to honour the butchering festival, and then deliver me his butt. But as soon as he said it, there came to Pope Amen II a flash vision of Blacktooth's future. In shock, upon learning of Idria's sudden calling to religion, and of the Pope's sentence passed upon her. Shock, and maybe fury. He resolved not to see the monk immediately upon his arrival. Let him hear about it from Kum Do, Jingu Wan, Wuxian, and the two Oriental secretaries he inherited from Cardinal Ri. They understood his motives and his necessity. Brother St. George would eventually apply his religious thing to his fury, and then it would be safe for the Pope to see him. Late September came and Blacktooth had still not arrived at Pope Amen II's log cabin, Vatican. His Holiness gulped the rest of his brandy, put his heels on the table, leaned back, and smiled at his elderly bodyguard. A single candle lighted Brown Pony's private office in the Papal Palace with its log walls and fired clay floor. But there was an exceptionally bright full moon shining through the big southern windows, and everything seemed to glow in its light, including the faces of the Pope and the warrior. Axe, do you know what tomorrow is? Thursday, the twenty-ninth, Holiness. It is a feast of St. Michael, the commander-in-chief of the heavenly hordes. I thought it was the heavenly hosts. No, no, all angels are nomads, and there are hordes of them. So, what of it, Holiness? Axe, the cathedral of St. Michael, angel of battle, is in Hannigan City, and belongs to Urian Benefice. For him tomorrow is a day of pomp and high masses, and I shall offer the same mass in a quiet way. The gospel for the day is the first ten verses of Matthew 13, and at first glance it seems unrelated to the archangel Michael. In it Jesus calls a little child to him and tells how we must all become little children again before we can enter heaven. Isn't that strange? No. To the children the angel's sword gives life. Brown Pony paused. He knew what Axe meant, but what an odd way to say it. An old Jew once told me that this, our angel of battle, is the defender of the synagogue, just as we see him as defender of the church, and, of course, of her children. That explains the choice of the gospel, I think. But do you know that a bunch of old nomad women married me off to the Burrigan, the buzzard of battle? I believe you have mentioned it several times, Olinus. I hope it is a happy marriage. Oh, it is, it is. We're winning the war, I think. The Pope poured himself another glass of brandy. But I feel strange praying to Michael now. I hope the commander of the angelic armies forgives me. It was a forced marriage. 
Must I apologize for imagining Benefiz's angel of battle pitted against my supernatural bird-wife? No. Oh, you have an opinion. It was a rhetorical question, Axe, but why do you say no? Because the angel and the buzzard are the same. I wish you had said they are on the same side. You'll never be a Christian, will you, Wushin? And yet you have certain shocking insights. Tell me about Man-Killer again sometime. Again? I don't remember telling you about him a first time, Molinus. No, I just heard part of what you were telling Blacktooth one day. Who is Man-Killer? The Compassionate One. His capital letters were audible. Brown Pony stared at him by moonlight and wondered. Wu Xin added, An ancient saying among my people goes, The sword that kills is the same sword that gives life. Have another glass of this good mountain brandy. But to whom has a sword ever given life? The axe declined the brandy. Whenever there is a fight, the sword gives death to one man and life to the other and life to his family, his retainers, and lord. Yes, I suppose your sword has given me life once or twice. The saying is less than profound, though. Some things you say make a lot of people think you confuse God and the devil, Wuxin. I hope your holiness is not among them. No, but what do you say to the charge? I deny it. How can I confuse them? I see they are not two. Brown Pony laughed. Axe, did you ever take paradox lessons from Pope Amen Specklebird? No, but he kindly spoke to me a few times. You say I'll never be a Christian. Foreman Jing says the same, but if I could have been St. Specklebird's student, I might have become one. You just canonized him. That's my job. Are you an atheist? Oh, no. I honor all the gods. How many belong to that all? Countless. And one. How meaningless. Holiness, let me hear you count to one. One. Point at that one. Brown Pony stirred restlessly. Finally he tapped his index finger against his temple. Bushin laughed quietly. Wrong. You had to think about it too long. And you didn't count to one. You counted from one and stopped. The one is countless. The Pope changed the subject. He was no mystic, but he seemed to attract mystics. Specklebird, Blacktooth, and Wushin, they all had a streak of it, and they were all quite different. He was fascinated, but he did not understand. In Hannigan City in mid-September, the Emperor called together his generals and waxed gleeful about the captured weapons. Fire had not ruined them for study, only for use. Stocks and grips were burned, some cylinders had exploded, and some barrels were bent by the heat and by bursting kegs of powder. Filpeo handled them lovingly, and his hands were black with soot. According to his gunsmiths, it would be possible to begin duplicating this West Coast weapon as soon as they could tool up, produce the right kinds of steel, find copper for making brass for cartridges, if his forces could hold out that long. Meanwhile, Admiral Efondolai, Copios Robbery, was already equipped with several dozen of the repeating weapons. Soon he and Esset Loit, he whom the troops called Wooden Nose, would begin their raids from north of the Misery. The wolf-skin Texarc forces, disguised as motherless outlaws, would wreak enough havoc on the nomad women and horses left behind to draw off the left flank of the anti-pope's crusade. "'Admiral!' protested General Goldim. "'I thought Carpi had been made a field marshal.' "'Admiral for now,' Filpeo answered. "'An admiral is a pirate with a uniform, and a pirate doesn't think in terms of capturing territory.' His method of warfare is perfectly suited to the ocean of grass that is the nomad homeland. Time as well as terror was on the Emperor's side. The opposing armies of Pope and Empire, Church and State, were dug in on opposite banks of the Washita. And it was easier for Felpeo to feed his men than for Amen II to feed his. 
Moreover, Brown Pony was counting on forces he did not control. The Antipope thinks he holds the undying allegiance of the wild dog horde, but I am not so sure, Philpeo told his generals. They say Sharf Oksho licks the false Pope's footprints, but Hungan Isle Chur seems to have risen above his wild dog partisanship to become the Sharf of Sharfs, so to speak, of all three hordes. Even Sharf Demon Light pays respect to his lord, and we know how the jack rabbit leaped into his arms and arose against us. No doubt El Chur is as much our enemy as his brother Hultor, but he is cautious, he is clever, he is reasonable, and unlike Hungan, he is no Christian. We may be able to negotiate. I'm not sure you mean what you seem to be saying, sire, said Father Colonel Potskar. You speak as if Christianity demands submission to a false pope. No, Potsy, it just means Sharf Elture with no Christianity cares nothing about disputes internal to the church. Therefore he is free to negotiate. A few days later the glee of Philpeo Hark surpassed all bounds and he danced a three-second jig in his private quarters when his uncle Urian came to him with the news that sorely Cardinal Norwat had defected from the service of the false pope. His jig-dancing stopped when he realized that he should have heard the news about Norwat before his uncle heard it. "'Why didn't a commander who accepted his defection report it to me?' he demanded. "'I made arrangement with Sorley while he was still in Valana and I made the border guard honor it. I had advanced knowledge he was coming because he agreed to cross over only if my archdiocese granted him sanctuary. Bastards! You subvert my own military. Heads are going to roll. And he wants sanctuary from whom? Me? Philpeo barked. Of course, and I don't think you'll take Father Colonel Potscar's head or mine. Damn! Why, with me the cardinal is completely safe. I'd give him a state dinner. That's what he's afraid of, and from you he would be safe from harm, but not from interrogation. What has he got to hide? Everything. He is here to separate himself from this maniac in the western mountains, not to betray him. He will give no aid and comfort to either side. He is neutral, but only under my protection. The emperor tugged at his nervous earlobe and paced for a time. My God! he said at last. When this is all over and you elect a real pope, who to choose? Who better than a cardinal who remained principled but neutral? He turned to watch the archbishop's face and immediately laughed. Uncle Urian, you stand accused of too many bad habits to be the next pope. I'm sure the accusations are false, but... he shrugged. Yes, said Benefiz. I suppose Sorley has thought about Hoydock's slander. Treat him well, uncle, even if you fear his ambition, and let me visit him in your place. Invite us both to dine with you. Not unless he is comfortable with the idea. If he is comfortable with it, I'll invite you. Otherwise, you won't even get an explanation. The invitation to dine at the Archdiocesan Palace came to Philpeo after only three days. The Emperor eagerly accepted and warmly welcomed the dissident Norwat to Hannigan City. But he began to question him as soon as his uncle briefly excused himself after a whispered message from the subdeacon Torildo. Brown Pony is under a suspended death sentence throughout the Empire, Philpeo told the Oregonian as soon as Benefiz was out of earshot. His election itself was an act of war by the Valonan Church against Texarch. If he is caught, he will go to the chopping machine. He should not blame you for turning your back on him. No, sire. But you call his election an act of war by the Valonan clergy, and I helped elect him. I did not, we did not, think of it as declaring war on you, I can tell you that. The Valonan clergy elected him, you say? not the sacred college? Sire, in exile the Valona clergy is the clergy of Rome. The sacred college is the clergy of Rome only because each member maintains a Roman or Valonan church. But in an emergency situation 
the clergy of the Roman diocese elects its own bishop. The college was a later development in church history. Oh, I wondered how you justified that so-called conclave. I believe it was justified. But afterward it was Brown Pony who abandoned the curia. You may think of this war as his alone, although others do claim it and do pursue it. I was in Valana and was not consulted before he proclaimed the crusade. I am not even sure his war is just, let alone holy. And yet I am told that there was a council of war before the election, and that you attended. And how is it that you join Chantor Hadala's attempt to bring arms to the valley? I merely accompanied him across the plains, sire. I left him before the battle started. Yes, well, tell me this. How long ago did Brown Pony begin to pile up an arsenal in the Suckerman range? Did Cardinal Benefez not tell you that I would give no reply to questions about military matters? I am not a spy. Archbishop Benefez returned to the table, and having heard the last exchange, began berating his nephew for breaking his promise not to badger the Cardinal from Oregonia. Nevertheless, the Emperor went away happy that night. The defection of Sorley Cardinal Norwat, now a guest in the Episcopal Palace of his uncle, added respectability to Filpeo's cause. Even though Norvat declined to be interviewed by intelligence, and made it plain that he considered himself the equal of his host, the Emperor was delighted at the prospect of establishing good relations with the Oregonians, who were Norvat's people. It was the odd move of a knight on the continental chessboard, two squares west and one north. Oregonia was not far from what the Emperor had concluded to be the west coast source of Brown Pony's arms. The man owned land there and received revenue from it. Filpeo would bestow gifts upon the Oregonian ruler as soon after victory as possible, whoever that ruler by then might be. To the east, while Hadala was preparing his expedition from Valana before the time of harvest, the king of the Tenesi had taken advantage of the mayor's problems with the grasshopper and with Brown Pony's army in the province. He attacked the Texarch puppet state of Timberland on the east bank of the Great River. Filpeo Hark sent his regulars across the Great River to drive back the Tenesi from his burned and looted ally. But the Tenesi were expecting them. They retreated into impenetrable mountains, which the Texarch general then decided to penetrate. Brown Pony in due course learned about these battalions, which constituted a regiment of cunning mountain fighters. The Pope sent a courier to express his wish that the Tenesi might encourage the Texarch troops to extend their stay in the east until spring, by a minimum of necessary hostile engagements. The courier carried the message as a coded tattoo in his crotch, and he was too fat to lean over far enough even to see it himself without a mirror, and he did not have the key to the code anyway. Brown Pony did not worry about him. There seemed to be no point in torturing the messenger. Nevertheless, agents from Imperial Intelligence caught and tormented him into revealing that the tattoo was a message to the Tenesi, and tormented him some more to establish his ignorance of the code. The I.I. men decided not to kill him, but they strapped him to an operating table and removed the message with a skinning knife. He was then free to go, but could not walk because of the pain between his legs. They salted the skin, tacked it to a board to dry, and sent it to Hannigan City for study. The skinning knife had not been sterilized, and the Pope's fat courier died of septicemia. Upon learning of his messenger's fate, Brown Pony could only heap more ecclesiastical sanctions upon an already excommunicated and anathematized Philpeo Hark Hannigan and his uncle, the apostle of platonic friendship and other deviations from orthodoxy. Uchin did his best to console his master. It seems to me, Olinus, that the Tenesi will be doing what you asked them to do anyway. So my message needlessly sacrificed the messenger? Wuxin was silent, remembering that his master, even if he did share the warrior's indifference to life and death, would never allow himself to realize it. How simpler it must have been to manage a war with the methods of communication of the Magna Civitas. Our generals receive our commands, if at all, weeks after we send them, and by then the situation has usually changed. Yes, Olinus, 
and that is why in my people's tradition a general in the field is obliged to consider his emperor's commands only as fatherly advice, unless he is fighting very close to the imperial court. As for the Magna Civitas, Brother St. George told me that generals in those days complained bitterly because commands from the rulers were so numerous and came so quickly that the war was mismanaged by politicians. Look what happened to the Magna Civitas. I should not try to tell the Tennessee what to do. Wu Xin was silent again, and Brown Pony smiled. Acts, if it were up to me, you would be the commander of the operation in the province instead of Magister Dion. I have no ambition to command an army, Olinus. It was November before Blacktooth came limping into the snowy mountains with a sore toe, and in the company of Abelot and a glep cougar kitten, with one blue ear and a half-bald skull. He had been robbed of his mount by outlaws after his wild dog escort left him on the papal highway, and then Abelot, who had returned first to Valana and then taken the highway south in the hope of seeing the sister of Jesus again, found him moaning and half-conscious, with a ravenous kitten sucking at his bloody big toe. When they arrived at the military checkpoint at Arch Hollow, Blacktooth's name was found to be on the guard's list of admissible persons, but Abelot's name was not. He was here with me last year, and we were both here as emissaries from the Secretariat in Valana. There is no Abelot on the list, and I don't think he is one of us. Neither am I. The guard stared oddly at the monk. No, I could have sworn. Abelot broke out laughing. You're a spook, Nimmy. I've known it since Idria told Anala you were. Blacktooth sputtered. To the guard he said, I'll vouch for the idiot. The guard called an officer. Blacktooth was made to sign a guarantee as Abelot's custodian. If he breaks any laws, you'll take his punishment. What a wonderful opportunity for me, said Abelot. When I'm naughty, you'll get whacked. And you'll get shot, the officers snapped. But as soon as they arrived at the new and temporary holy city, they found themselves in the polite custody of Wuxin, Kumdo, and Foreman Jing, and for the second time Nimi had to inform them of the death of a comrade serving their common master. They expressed concern about Guy C.'s continued absence. I think Sharf Demon Light is keeping him for a while as a teacher of his arts to young Jack Rabbit warriors. He wanted to keep me to teach them to read. Now when may I see His Holiness? He found himself looking at Abelot and three, uh-oh, expressionless yellow faces. Chapter 26 It happens all too often that the constituting of a prior gives rise to grave scandals in monasteries, for there are some who become inflated with the evil spirit of pride and consider themselves second abbots. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 65 when they told Blacktooth what had been done to Idria, they were prepared to restrain him and tie him down until he listened to the whole story, including their master's promise to commute her sentence as soon as the Pope could leave New Jerusalem. Instead, Nimi listened in silence, wept a little, but in the end said, Good, but what about Guy C? Has he come back yet? We have heard nothing, Axe told him. Nimi wanted an audience with the Pope, but Axe convinced him the time was not right. They waited five more days for the warrior's return. Then Blacktooth said to Foreman Jing, Come with me to Arch Hollow. Why? Because I am no longer the Pope's servant. Nor was Guy C. when he started obeying Hadala and Norwat. The guards will not answer my questions. They may talk to you. Jing agreed. They left the municipal area in the early morning and were back to their servants' quarters before sundown. Blacktooth allowed Jing to tell Wuxin the bad news. Guy C. arrived at Arch Hollow a few days after Blacktooth and Abelot. The guards there seized him, charged him with murder, and escorted him straight up through the mountain passes. They took him to Slow John's court in the central square. There he was indicted, and thence he was sent to the cage. Slow John went directly to the Pope and informed him of the action. They met alone with no witnesses. I remember that meeting, said Axe. I did not know what it was about. Of course, said Kumdo. You were there too, he said to Jing. 
So why aren't you looking angry, Axe? Blacktooth asked. At whom? At the Holy Father, of course, for approving Guy C.'s arrest. So unthinkable was the suggestion, so irreverent to their master, that they all glared at him. Well, false friends, I am going to see the Pope about Guy C., said Blacktooth. No, you're not, said Wuxin, laying a hand on his arm. His Holiness is not ready. Having called him a false friend without provoking him, Blacktooth slapped him. So unexpected was the event that Axe failed to evade the blow. Nimmy stepped back defensively. You'll have to kill me to stop me, Axe, and your master won't like that. But you're not supposed to crash in without— That's not for you to say. I am going to see the Pope. Come along if you want, all of you. He glanced at Rhee's warriors. Kum Do and Foreman Jing were standing at hand on sword alert. Either of them would abandon Guy C. to his fate without protest, if their master so much as frowned at him. So would Axe. Nimmy turned his back on them and walked out of the house. He could hear them coming behind him. He had recovered from the beating he had taken from the outlaws. The earth felt good under his feet again. However briefly he had visited his ancestors. While with them he had seen something within himself as in a mirror. The earth, any earth, was his to walk on now. Moreover, he had seen the nomad wife of the pontiff, red as the sunset, soaring over the corpse-strewn landscape. Guy C. was only the beginning of what he wanted to see the Pope about. Blacktooth was vaguely conscious of casting aside his vow of obedience, but felt no qualms about it this time. Idria was in his mind like a vision, but he had nothing to say about her. At the entrance to the audience room, a member of the papal guard armed with a halberd blocked the doorway. Blacktooth stamped the guard's slipper with his heel, seized the halberd, and rammed his stomach with the butt of it to get inside the door. His oriental companions watched the fight without comment. Once inside the doors, he was seized by Cardinal Lincono and the Grand Cardinal Penitentiary. Axe stepped in to assist them now, but Brown Pony called out from the throne, Let him in! Let them all in! Blacktooth strode up to the dais and fell to his knees before his pontiff. The Pope reached down to lift him up, but the monk evaded his hands and stood erect. Brown Pony regarded him with faint amusement. Is this so urgent, Brother St. George? We were discussing policy with our eminent brethren. About Idria. It's not about Idria. Who do you see here besides your eminent brethren? Why, I see an unhappy monk and three of my personal guards. Why not four of your personal guards, Holy Father? Oh, I did not know that you and Guy C. were close. It is unfortunate. We were not close at all, and your betrayal is worse than unfortunate. Brown Pony frowned as if not quite believing his ears. I see it is possible for a pope to do evil. Again these insulting words to the master, swords were drawn. Nimmy turned his back on the pope and faced his companions. If your master wills my death, cowards, why do you hesitate? Hit! Immediately he turned to Brown Pony again. Can't you see what you've done? Right here before you, they're ready to do what Guy C. did, except that Guy C. thought he was right, and they know they are wrong. And your holiness accepts this kind of loyalty and good conscience? Brown Pony was watching his former nomadic secretary in apparent fascination. Blacktooth heard one sword return to its sheath. That would be Foreman Jing, he guessed. Wu Xin would kill him without the Pope's nod, if he thought the Pope's best interest would be served by the killing. Blacktooth, you were always a quick study, but this is a new role, isn't it? Holy Father, as a Catholic, I have to believe that what you bind on earth is bound also in heaven, and I have to believe that when you are speaking about faith and morals, the Holy Ghost prevents you from speaking any error. You have to believe, but do you? I have a question. Is a declaration of war an assertion about faith and morals ever, even if you call it a holy war? Father Suarez taught, and he was extending St. Augustine's teaching, that a war to convert the heathen can never be just. Can a war against heretical Christians be holy if a war against the heathen is unjust? A war is against neither heathens nor heretical Christians. It is against a tyrant who usurps the apostolic power and oppresses the whole world. 
But it's heathens and Christians who are killed while the tyrant still lives and the apostle is still in power. Brown Pony seemed to swear under his breath for a moment, then recovered. You wrote me that you killed a man in battle, Nimi. Is that what's wrong with you now? Blacktooth nodded and spoke slowly. The man in a Texarch uniform was a child of yours, Holiness, a glep from the valley. I meant to miss him. My aim was bad, and I hit him in the belly. What he wanted from me then was a bullet in the brain, but I cut his throat instead, because a sergeant was watching. Yes, I think that is what's wrong with me, Holy Father. Eltio Braum, because I had already killed, would have made me a nomad warrior with only the initiation, without the ordeal of battle. Then they would stop calling me Nimi, he said, and stop laughing about it. I don't mind the name or the laughter. I want never to kill again. But I don't want to see Guy C. punished. He saw Hadala as a fugitive from your commands. He couldn't arrest him or Gleaver. He did what he thought was necessary. He had no license from me. You accepted his services as a warrior. Did you really withhold from him the license that he assumed was his? Pope Amen frowned and called out for everyone but Blacktooth and one guard to leave the room. It was the guard with the sore stomach who stayed, and who sealed the doors after the others were outside. Go on, finish what you have to say. Blacktooth looked around to make sure Cardinal Lincono was gone. For one thing, Guy C. is a member of a religious order, and— I see, Brown Pony interrupted. I claim jurisdiction in Idria's case— why not in Guy C's? Because no pope has yet recognized the order to which Rees men say they belong, that's why. I meant to do it sooner or later, but I can't do it just to free Guy C. It's too transparent. But go on, if you have more to say. I cannot, your holiness, speak to the vicar of Christ on earth as freely as I did to my former employer, the secretary for extraordinary ecclesiastic concerns. I don't know the vicar of Christ. It seems to me you've been speaking freely enough. But suppose I just take off my zucchetto and tell you that the Vicar of Christ has taken the day off. I am still Elia Brownpony, the bastard son of a lesbian nomad and a Texarch rapist. So, Nyinden, farm boy nomad, sometime monk, sometime lover, speak your mind. I may throw you out, but I won't throw you in a dungeon. Then release Guy C. from a dungeon. I didn't imprison Guy C. Cardinal Lincono did. Without your permission? You don't understand the situation here, Blacktooth. We are the guests of the city. I won't say we're captives here until I try to return to Valana and see if they let me go. Cardinal Lincono informed me of Guy C.'s arrest. Chandradala played bishop to these people because he was bishop to the valley whence they came. Slow John and everybody here knows that I sent men to arrest Adala, and, well, oh, so when Guy C. killed him, they thought you ordered the execution. Not yet, but they will certainly suspect it if I secure his release now. He killed a bishop and prince of the church. Cardinal Adala was popular here. I was there when it happened, Holy Father. All along, Gleaver and his officers had been shooting those of us who wavered or held back. In that light, Guy C. shot in self-defense and the defense of us all. But first he crawled up to me under fire. He asked if it was true that Cardinal Hadala was defying your orders and betraying you. I told him it was so. I knew what he might do when I told him that, and I hoped he would do it. So I am the one who sentenced the Cardinal to death. Have them arrest me too, Holy Father. I'll see what I can do, Brown Pony said darkly, and beckoned to the guard and breathed a quiet order. The guard with the sore stomach seized Blacktooth's arm, led him straight to jail, and put him in Guy C.'s cell. Guy C. embraced him. During the embrace, the guard reached through the bars and punched Blacktooth hard in the kidney with the butt of the halberd. "'I'll be back for you soon,' he said with a sweet grin. Guy C. was not alone in jail. Two men who claimed to be political refugees from the Empire, and who now sought asylum in New Jerusalem, were imprisoned there until their claims were thoroughly investigated. One was Yurik Thon Jordan, S.I., the Ignatian, who was also a professor of history at the Secular University at Texarch. 
and whom Brantoni had suspected of hiring the thugs who tried to kill them on Easter before the last conclave. How desperate the man must be to escape Texarch, that he should come here for asylum. He glanced at Blacktooth once, but neglected to recognize him. The other man was Torildo. Blacktooth, my God! You can't imagine what that beast Benefus did to me! Nimi sat down on Guy C.'s bed and fell to questioning the warrior. He tried to ignore Terildo's confession of the intimately brutal sins the Archbishop of Texarch had perpetrated upon his person. According to Guy C., Jordan and Terildo were refugees, not from a terrible emperor, but from a furious archbishop who had suddenly been made to realize that he could never be pope, even if his nephew conquered all of his enemies. At the university, Jordan had made the mistake of saying openly that Benefiz was now non papabilis, and Torildo himself was part of the archbishop's problem which ensured that he would never wear the tiara. In each fugitive's case, it was his own confessor who, after hearing the rumbles from the top of the mountain, advised his penitent to do his penance in some land far from the reach of the Imperium and the diocesan ordinary. So there they sat in a new Jerusalem jail, hoping to be of some value to a pope who had the power to set them free. Blacktooth found this interesting and ironic, but decided not to concern himself with their fate. After a while the guard came back for him, and they returned to the throne room. He asked Wu Xin in a whisper if he knew about Jordan and Terildo, but the axe ignored him. Is Guy C. sick? Brown Pony wanted to know. Is he mistreated or badly fed? He is sick at heart. Keeping him caged is mistreatment, and so is the food. If you had not been hiding out with Amen Speckleburg when they blew up the palace, none of this would have happened, Brown Pony told him. You would have come here with me. Now you are furious, as if it were my intent that you fight or kill in battle. I was not hiding out with the Pope. Just praying? Not quite. We talked. One thing we spoke of was war, and I made the traditional mention of the church militant on earth, the church suffering in purgatory, and the church triumphant in heaven. But the Pope said to me, There is no church triumphant in heaven, although I have heard that foolishness before. I asked him why he said that in disagreement with all the elders, and he told me, John says it, chapter 21, Apocalypse, and I saw no temple therein. In the presence of God the Church is a discarded crutch. What I am saying to you, Holy Father, is that if the Church militant on earth does not produce members of a Church triumphant in heaven, then its militancy is not. Stop! I bow to all the words of my predecessor, but not to your explanation of them, especially not on the subject of war. Nimi fell silent, feeling stupid. It wasn't murder when you accidentally shot that man. You don't need absolution for it, but I can shrive you if you like. The Pope stared at Blacktooth's face for a time and began to frown. I think you would not accept absolution from me if I gave it to you. You have already given me a plenary indulgence and a passport to paradise in Scitote Tyrannum, Holy Father. What more could I ask? Brown Pony reddened at the sarcasm. But Blacktooth persisted in standing there with his hands spread wide as if to receive gifts. In reality he was frozen in fright by what he had said. "'Get out of here!' Brown Pony erupted. "'Go visit your patron saint at the Priory. I don't want to hear this.' "'May I be excused now? Stupid again.' "'Yes, go!' Blacktooth glanced at the Pope's hand. Brown Pony did not lift his ring, and Blacktooth did not reach. He made a fast genuflection and beat a faster retreat. He did not see Brown Pony again during that winter. He took residence at the Priory of St. Leibowitz in the Cottonwoods, where Prior Singing Cow St. Martha assigned him work in exchange for room and board. He was not required to assist in the divine office, but he was not forbidden either. So he added his voice to the choir, took dictation and penned letters for the Prior, washed dishes, and took his turn as cook. The brothers were kinder to him here than at the abbey, although they were the same monks. He had known them all at the monastery in the desert. They were all specialists, 
Brother Jonan, who used to wake Blacktooth every morning for lords, was a mathematician. Brother Elwyn, who had been Terildo's lover and went over the wall, had come back repentant and become skilled in his previous studies, mechanics and engineering. Old brother Tudlin, whom Blacktooth had barely known because he had been on leave from the Abbey for so many years at sea, was a naval architect, astronomer, and navigator. He seemed somehow out of place this far from the ocean, but Brown Pony, like Philpeo, had ambitions. Tudlin had built a schooner in old Tampa Bay, and it was supposedly the property of the Order. Here on the mountains, where the air was thin and clear, he was grinding a telescope mirror. The others were specialists in church history, in political and military history, and in the work of Bidellus, among other authorities, on the Magna Civitas and its catastrophic collapse. Persuading Mayor Dion to permit the opening of the Lebowitzian Priory in New Jerusalem had been no small undertaking. Singing Cow had only high praise for the Pope as a persuader and as a devotee of their patron saint. His Holiness convinced Dion that we would be of educational value to the community here, but so far no schools have called on us. Lincono runs them. These spooks don't want their super babies growing up to be monks. There are two layers of religion here. Catholic above ground and New Adventist below ground. They are out to save the world. Hadala was typical. The old Jew Benjamin told me about them, said Blacktooth. But he kept mumbling, it's still not him, still not him, and I don't know what he meant. Singing Cow smiled as if he knew, but said nothing. He confessed to Father Pryor Moo, as the brethren sometimes called him. As one ex-grasshopper farm kid to another, it proved a strange experience for them both. Were you taken into the nomad war cult, my son? Father said Martha asked, in connection with Blacktooth's confession of killing a man in battle. No, Father. The grasshopper people treated me with kindness, as they would a boy who had not yet passed through the ordeal. I did not intend to shoot the man. Of course not. But you intended to cut his throat, did you not? I thought he was begging me to. I still think so. Singing Cow, who sometimes liked to think of himself as a nomad, mentioned that the church frowned upon assisting a suicide, but that he would probably have done the same. Still, it was an act to be repented. Nimi failed to mention disobedience among his many sins. Singing Cow did not remind him. Absolution was forthcoming, and the penance was mild. Pray five mysteries of the rosary, and begin singing for his supper. One cold night he and the cow were walking home through the snow after singing Compline in the neighborhood church, which they shared with the local pastor and his small flock. Compline was the night prayer of the church, concerned with sleep and wakefulness, life and death, sinning and receiving grace. But it was no lullaby, and left him feeling lonely. I can tell you something I think you'll want to hear, Father. Tell away, said Singing Cow. Remember when we ran away and tried to join the grasshopper? They fed us, let us rest two days, and then drove us out of the camp with whips and a snow like this. Were you as bitter as I was? Those rope whips. Listen, I still don't know what we did to offend them. I used to think that you or Wren must have made a pass at a girl, because our parents farmed. Was that why? Yes, I was bitter, and grasshopper nomads still make me uncomfortable. If we had fought back, we might have had a chance. Instead, we just cringed and ran. There is a grasshopper Weegis there who thinks she remembers three wandering orphans at about the time we visited their tents. She explained to me why they offered us no more than food, water, and two nights' sleep. Explaining cruelty doesn't absolve it. Perhaps not but I'll try to repeat what she told me as best I remember. Who wants to adopt a teenage Nimmy, she said, no matter how he was raised? A Ouijus spends four or five years feeding him, clothing him, and teaching him the horses. In exchange for what? Unskilled and lazy labor. He's horny, and he gets in fights. He starts trouble with other families. Maybe she catches him coupling with one of her own daughters, but they can't be married under the breeding rules. Or worse. He runs off to marry a daughter of her horse-breeding rival. A family that mourns a dead son would be better off adopting a young cougar than another boy. Singing Cow laughed. 
she knew about your kitten? I was carrying Librada when I visited her. She herself had adopted a pubescent orphan girl. But among nomads, when a girl grows up, she stays with her mother. A boy grows up and leaves her and her whole family when he marries. Motherless boys are as welcome as leprosy there, unless they can fight and join the war cult. Rope whips. Cow was ruminating on it. That was more than twenty years ago, father. This year the Scharf himself wanted me to stay and tutor his nephews. I would have been adopted at my age. Well, I'm glad you told me why they were cruel. Charity is rarely convenient. Sometimes it's completely impractical. Singing Cow thought for a moment. The Scharf's grandmother probably believed your vow of chastity protected all of the daughters, he added. Blacktooth looked away and blushed. You're supposed to forget what I tell you in confession, he complained as they entered the monk's dormitory. At the small priory each man took his turn at cooking or menial labour. Blacktooth had been told by the axe that the Pope had wanted his recipe for Samanabish stew, and when his turn came to cook he asked Father Moo's permission to prepare the dish for all the brothers who needed permission to eat meat. When permission was granted, Blacktooth bought the ingredients from a local butcher, prepared the feast, and sent a quart of it to the papal palace. The lack of a response seemed an indicator of the Pope's disfavor. Librada consumed the leftovers with gusto. She had caught a mouse on her first day, thus ensuring her room and board. Why did you name her Librada? What does it mean? Cow asked. It was Spanish and means set free because that's what she'll be before she's much bigger and eats one of us. The winter of 45-46 was the mildest in memory. Most of the wild dog horde moved their cattle south as usual. Hannigan's agents among the motherless outlaw bands observed the migration, but saw nothing unusual to report until March, when all the warriors of the horde assembled as an army under Lord Hungan himself, with Ox Show second in command. They rode swiftly eastward for several days, then south to the river. Before Pilpeo Hark learned about the movement, the nomad horsemen had forded the Nadian and attacked from the rear those Texarch forces dug in along the east bank of the Bushita. With them they brought three grasshopper dog trainers and nearly a hundred dogs who would kill any unmounted man who did not smell like a nomad. At least six of Scharf Oxshow's warriors were bitten for not having the usual grasshopper aroma. By the light of the full paschal moon, the dogs tore out the throats of Texark soldiers in the trenches along with some of their reluctant jackrabbit allies who ate too many onions to smell friendly. The dogs' attack on the night of Holy Saturday enabled the forces of Inmu Kun to cross the Bushita without coming under fire, until they charged the fortifications with fixed bayonets. By Easter's sunrise the trainers had regained control of ravening dogs, and the battle was won without further jackrabbit casualties, and Mayor Dion's well-rested men crossed the river to carry the war eastward on horseback. After the fray, Hungan Usle Chur met with Unmu Kun in the middle of a battlefield at dawn. He then rode with the jackrabbit's forces without taking command. This was his reason for defying his shamans. The jackrabbit were lacking in respect for Unmu the smuggler. Their respect for the Lord of the Hordes was enhanced by the fact that he was not jackrabbit. Such was the self-contempt of a conquered people. Father Steps on Snake had recently come to the vicinity, and he now celebrated the Mass of the Resurrection at noon on March 25th, the earliest Easter in many years, and gave the Eucharist to Lord Hungan Isler, together with Scharf's Oksho Zon and Unmu Kun, in the sight of all the warriors and the jackrabbit population of the region. Thus did the faithful rejoice in the victory of the nomad over tyranny at the same time as the victory of the Christ over death. Never in the memory of old steps on snake had the subject people expressed such jubilation on this highest feast day. Holy Madness spent nearly a week building up the jackrabbit's esteem for the jackrabbit shaft by accompanying him everywhere, listening to Unmu address the rebel fighters and civilian groups then reinforcing the Scharf's words with a few of his own, bringing on rousing cheers from the multitude. There were about seven hundred unwounded prisoners. Jackrabbit warriors had begun to maim them until Holy Madness put a stop to it. 
That nomad custom had been abandoned soon after the Texarc conquest, except for captured spies and saboteurs. But the jackrabbit was only trying to honor the custom, for they had been told by Unmu what Hungen had done to Esset Loit. But the forces of the Hannigan were rushing westward to rejoin the battle against the jackrabbit rebels, and Unmu's gathering army now marched to meet them following Dion's light horse. Having destroyed the enemy forces in the immediate vicinity and inspired the jackrabbit fighters with a new enthusiasm for battle, Hungen and Oksho withdrew the wild dog horsemen from the area by crossing the Washita and riding westward to cross the Nadian at a point where their movement would not be observed by Texarc scouts. When the warriors rejoined the rest of the wild dog horde at their wintering grounds, Hungen Usle first sent messengers with an account of the battle to Scharf Brom and Pope Amen. Then he summoned Father Omroz as well as his senior bear spirit shaman and his own Ouija's mother. He told them to prepare immediately to accompany him to New Jerusalem and the court of Amen the Second. The Lord of the Hordes and his party arrived in New Jerusalem at the end of April. They were greeted by the Pope and the Mayor. Dion was briefly home from the wars, with high ceremony. The Major General Quigler Durod was already in town as plenipotentiary from the King of the Tennessee. Durod had taken the trouble to learn a nomad dialect, jackrabbit because in his youth he had served in the province as a Texarc mercenary, and he made friends quickly with Hungen Usle. Besides Durod, armorers had come from the west coast, bringing samples of their latest model firearms. Although Hungen Usle, as Kisak de Riverdar, spoke for all three hordes, Brown Pony expressed regret that Scharf's Braum and Unmu Kuhn were unable to attend the Council of War. Three days later an angry grasshopper emissary rode up from Arch Hollow to confront the Pope. The grasshopper messenger was not a Christian. He stood defiantly before Amen the Second and six members of the Curia to voice the demands of his Scharf. Unless you release Nyinden and the swordsman Geisi into my custody, the grasshopper will make war not against your enemies, but against you. Perhaps your scharf has been lied to by someone, the Pope said. Nyinden is staying at the priory with the other monks. If he wants to go with you, there is nothing to stop him. And the yellow warrior? Where is he? He's in the city's jail. I did not put him there. The only man in this room with any voice in city affairs is Cardinal Linconu, who grew up here. Your Eminence, would you please? He beckoned to a short man with a white beard who looked like a gnome wearing a red skullcap. Then he said to the messenger, I think your scharf would want his message to go to the right man. I am the wrong man, and his eminence, Ibraha, is not the right man either. But he can take you to the right man. Are you not the most powerful man in this awful place? Not Pope Redbeard, the lord of the Christian horde? The nomad demanded. Not really lord, as you understand it. You might think of my office as that of a high priest. Lincono limped up to stand beside the nomad, facing him, and spoke in a voice surprisingly deep for so small a man. His nomadic was heavily accented, but understandable. Young man, why is this an awful place? Brown Pony himself explained. The nomads say evil spirits come down from the mountains, especially the old Zarks, and inhabit wombs. The belief explains why a nomad woman sometimes gives birth to a glep baby. I see. Well, young man, compare our pope to your oldest bear spirit shaman. Neither he nor your scharf has to obey the other. The scharf in this place is Mare Dion, but he just left here to go back to the war. His son takes his place. This, the church, is like the bear spirit council. There is nothing we can do for you here, my nephew, except pray. Lincona was smart enough not to say, my son, to a nomad, but this nomad did not like nephew either. My only uncle is Demon Light, Grey Runt. My name is Blue Lightning, and I am the eldest son of his eldest sister. We both witnessed Hadala's crimes. Surely you mean the crime against Cardinal Hadala? I mean Hadala's crimes, for which he was executed. The gnome's jaw fell. Crimes under what law? Nomad law? The Treaty of the Sacred Mare. 
He violated it by bringing an army into our lands. Hadala violated the law and defied our sharf. By his order, his officers killed his own men. If Nyindan and the Yellow Warrior hadn't put him to death, my uncle would have done it. I had not thought of it in that way before, Brown Pony said. He's right, you know, Ebra. Hadala clearly violated the treaty. Holy Father, I can't believe what I'm hearing. Blue Lightning grabbed the small cardinal by the shoulders and shook him. I can make war or peace, little man. My words are my uncle's words. Perhaps we cannot bring war to you here in your evil mountains, but we can join the war against your men who fight south of the Nadian. Take me to the man who jails the victim instead of the criminal. Linkono limped toward the exit as fast as he could move, with the burly nomad crowding his heels. When they were gone, Brown Pony turned to his personal guard. Axe, go with them and take Jing and Kumdo. Keep that nomad out of trouble and make sure Slow John has to look you in the face when he talks about Guy C. Then to the Cardinal Penitentiary, who was also his personal confessor, he said, Go to the guests' quarters, please, and tell Hungan Ursletur what has happened here. Blue Lightning does not realize that his Kisok Dri Verdar is in town. In the administration building, Slow John haughtily dismissed the nomad's claim. The nomad grabbed him by the ears and hauled him, squeaking in pain, across the desk. A sergeant drew a pistol, and instantly three swords were in the air. "'Drop it, or lose your head,' said Axe. The sergeant dropped it. Eltyr's nephew now stood behind Slow John with his arm in a hammerlock and a knife held to his throat. He pushed him toward the door. "'This fart is going to jail,' said the nomad. Slow John screamed as he felt his own blood running down his chest. "'Stop him, Wushin, stop him! "'Only you can stop him, my sir. "'Take him to the jail in peace.' "'Brown Pony is behind this. "'No, the Pope is not. "'The man behind it is also behind you right now. "'You did violate the treaty, my sir. "'All right, we'll go to the jail.' The trip to jail was halted by the sudden entrance of Hungen Usletur and his two shamans. Blue Lightning took one look at him, gasped, and released the mayor's son. He made a sweeping cook eye to the chosen one of the day maiden, husband of the prairies, then fell silent to await orders. The Lord of the Hordes asked for an explanation of the problem. Blue Lightning spoke first, then Slow John and Axe. Then the Kisok de Rizurdar told the mayor's son that he, Hungun Usletur, ruled in favor of the grasshopper claim and made the same threat to Slow John that Blue Lightning had made. The hordes would turn against New Jerusalem for breaking the treaty and might even carry the conflict into these feared mountains. The jackrabbit would turn on the spooks in battle and kill Slow John's father as well. Thus it came about that the charges were dropped and Guy C. was released into the protective custody of Blue Lightning. Because the nomad claimed plenipotentiary power to speak for his uncle, Brown Pony invited him to attend the Council of War, which had all but ended upon the departure of Dion, but was now renewed in the presence of the grasshopper. The Pope dispatched a message to Brougham through the nomad relay network to assure the sharp that Geisy and Nyinden were free. He also thanked him for sending Blue Lightning, who added to the document his initials, Blacktooth had taught him to draw them, and peace was restored among the Allies. After his harsh beginning, Blue Lightning proved a well-rounded diplomat. In spite of his initial threat to abandon the Alliance and join the other side, he brought intelligence gathered from several sources. On balance, the news was good, but there were things to worry about. Filpeo had new repeating arms now, but not yet enough of them to turn the outcome of any foreseeable battle. The countryside surrounding New Rome was by no means demilitarized, but the occupation forces there were thinned out by the withdrawal of troops being sent to the province to halt the eastward advance of the armies of Unmu Kun and Mayor Dion. Scharf Braum estimated that no more than 700 men, Texarch cavalry and Glep mercenaries, remained to block access to the gates of New Rome. And there was trouble in the valley. Texarch recruiters had been ambushed and killed. I wonder who could be doing that, Quigler Durard asked innocently, provoking laughter. 
Everyone present knew that Tennessee agents disguised as Gleps had crossed the Great River and infiltrated the Wachita Ozark region. Further recruiting in the Valley of the Mistborn was inhibited, if not halted. If we don't strike now, Hungan said, the Emperor's firepower will increase rapidly. We will lose the advantage the Pope's weapons have given us. Blue Lightning murmured assent. General Durard wanted to know if it was possible to use the Nomad Relay Network to contact his men in the valley. If you have a secure cipher, maybe, said Blue Lightning. There is a risk of a messenger being caught. He must not know what your message is. Pope Amen came to a sudden decision. We shall mount an expedition to capture New Rome, and do it as soon as possible unless one of you disagrees. Nobody objected. After so many decades in exile, the Holy See was going home. Pentecost came on May 14th in 3246, and Blacktooth had known for a week that Holy Madness and other important guests were in town to consult with the Pope. But the consultations were private, and he was as ignorant as any local citizen of what happened behind the closed doors. Prior Cow wanted all eight of them to attend the Pontifical High Mass in the Pope's Log and Stone Cathedral, but Nimi begged off. Instead, he attended Mass at their usual neighborhood church, sang the Veni Creator Spiritus with the small choir, and assisted the priest in distributing the Eucharist to local spooks and their beautiful children. Singing Cow found him sitting in the garden, trying to extract a still fluttering pigeon from the jaws of his growling glep cougar. Librada slashed his hand and clamped down on the bird. Nimi gave up. I think it's about time for Librada to be Librada, he said to the prior. We'll take care of it, Nimi. You're going to be too busy. It's up to me, father. I brought her here. She ought to be let go as far as possible from humans. She's not afraid of anybody, and why do you say I'll be too busy? I think you will be. The Pope wants to see you right now. He's going away. Away? To New Rome. As a conqueror, I believe. Now go bandage your hand and run over to the palace. As soon as he saw the guy see had been set free, Black Tooth felt shame for his earlier impudence toward his Pope, and he looked for an opportunity to apologize. But Axe had assigned him to a place in the baggage train in the rear, and the procession had been in motion for three days before he found an opportunity to approach his former employer. They were both on horseback. Don't thank me, thank God and the grasshopper, said the Pope after waving aside Blacktooth's apology. I don't understand, Holy Father. You don't have to, Brown Pony snapped, and after a pause relented. Somebody told Sharf Braum that you and Gaisi were both in jail for killing Cardinal Hadala. Hadala was violating the sacred mayor treaty by bringing an army onto nomad land. The Sharf would have killed him if Gaisi hadn't. I don't know what made him think you helped to kill him. I did help, Holy Father. I told Gaisi that Hadala was defying you, and I knew what I was doing when I told him. Elchir knew this. I see. Well, he became quite angry and sent his nephew with an oral message to Gaisi's jailer. Which nephew was this? Stutzil Braum, Blue Lightning. He's up ahead with Hung and Isle's party. At first he thought I was the jailer. He told everybody that unless you were released at once, he would make peace with the Hannigan and attack Dion's forces wherever he found them. Hung and Isle stepped in at that point and took over. He even threatened to hit New Jerusalem. So you can thank the nomads, not me. I'm only bringing you along to satisfy Iltu Braum. So that's why. That and your prowess as a soldier, said Brown Pony, and spurred his horse to get away from the conversation. Chapter 27 Except the sick who are very weak, let all abstain entirely from eating the flesh of four-footed animals. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 39 Chief Hawken Cardinal Irikawa, who had departed Valana for his own country some months ago, returned suddenly to rejoin the curious wagon train. He explained that his road home north of the Misery River was temporarily blocked by the presence of Texarc troops in the region. The lands beyond the Misery were considered open range, 
and both grasshopper and wild dog peoples drove cattle there in season, although the campsites were not permanent and there were no breeding pits. If Texar troops were in the area, it was in violation of the Treaty of the Sacred Mare. The Pope was alarmed at first, but those who questioned the Cardinal closely concluded that what he had encountered was a band of well-dressed and well-armed outlaws, imitating Texar cavalry maneuvers. It was strange, but only Scharf Oxsho seemed worried. Too many outlaws on the move, he said softly to Father Ombros. Too many to believe. The Pope's train gradually gathered a multitude as it moved east. Parties of ten or twenty warriors converged with the growing army every few hours. While passing through wild dog country, the legion grew to sixteen hundred horsemen and their animals. Sometimes when the moon was bright in June, nocturnal riders thundered into camp with obscene war cries, followed by laughter as sleepy men scrambled out of their bedrolls. There was talk of victory in the air, talk of spoils and of farmers' women, and rebuke for such talk from Scharf Oxshow's lieutenants. Blacktooth rode in the back of the hoodlum wagon with Librada, his cougar. He had made a rawhide collar and kept her on a short leash. A sickness of the spirit had come over him. He was unable to pray except to God in his cat. That was the summer of the year of our Lord, 3246. On the eve of the solstice, the moon was pink and full over the western horizon when dawn broke on the plains. As Blacktooth crawled from under the hoodlum wagon, he could see that breakfast fires were already being extinguished here and there about the militant horizon. Groups of armed men, horses, cattle, and cannon as far as the eye could see. It was seething, but not yet boiling, this pot. The Hannigan knows we are coming. When will he respond? There was no haste to resume the journey, probably because today was a special day. Blacktooth could not be certain, for he was out of touch with those in command. A tripod with the remains of a slaughtered cow hung near the wagon. He scraped some raw meat from the bone with the hood's stolen bayonet. A monk of Leibowitz never ate such meat without the abbot's permission, which was rarely given except on high holy days or to the gravely ill. I am gravely ill, he said to Jared, breathing over his shoulder. The hood handed him a pancake, a cup of tea, and the usual morning insult. The hood was a wild dog nomad whose name was Bitten Dog, drafted by the Pope's chef as cook's helper, and Blacktooth was supposed to be the Bitten Dog's helper, but diarrhea and deep sadness made him useless. His only work became the gathering of dry manure for fuel during stops, and the polishing of kitchen implements during days in the wagon. As it turned out, the day was indeed a special day. The nomads ordinarily celebrated the nomad feast of the bonfires at the solstice, and the church once had observed on the 20th of June the feast of Pope St. Silverius, the son of Pope Hormistas. Silverius had offended the Empress Theodora, and she exiled him, a punishment which led to his suffering and death in 538 AD, and therefore to his being called a martyr. Pope Amen Speckleberg had borrowed his feast day, which had been borrowed twice previously, for the observances of Our Lady of the Desert, patroness of his order. But now it was not Speckleberg's feast that Brown Pony chose to celebrate, but the mass of a sovereign pontiff, see Didigius May. For to consecrate a bishop was his aim, during an early mass that day, in the midst of his armies on the hot and arid plain. Amen II gathered about him the eight cardinals who accompanied the train. He called it a consistory, and made the intended announcements. He and Wolfer Poiliff, bishop from the north country, together with Bishop Varley Swineman of Denver, consecrated Father Jopo Eladen Ombros, S.I., as Archbishop of the ancient but moribund diocese of Canterbury, and then made him vicar apostolic to the nomads, including, of course, the jackrabbit nomads, whose present clergy was now fleeing from the advancing crusaders of the Western Church. The reluctant Bishop Ambrose was obedient to Brown Pony, but less than elated by his own elevation. The Pope made him a cardinal as well, as announced in consistory. The elders of the bear spirit would, Ambrose said, laugh at his finery, and he would be called Cardinal Cannibal in Texarch. Ambrose was now the ninth cardinal accompanying the main army of the crusade, and Brown Pony confided in him and in Wushin that he would be naming a tenth cardinal soon. He did not mention a name. 
from what little Blacktooth saw of the Pope from a distance. It seemed to him that Brown Pony looked more ethereal and spiritual than before. Maybe closeness had made him miss something in the man. The change, however, was not necessarily good. Brown Pony looked at the sky a lot, other observers said. He always seemed to be looking for something in the clouds or on the horizon, and gave little attention to those around him. Blacktooth wondered who had suggested to Brown Pony the motto he had inscribed upon his new coat of arms as Amen the Second. It said, like hell you will, in ancient English, instead of the usual Latin. He understood it, but he wondered if the Pope really did. When Brown Pony's coach overtook Eldur Braum's coach one day, Jopo Cardinal Ombros was the only member of the college who knew enough ancient English to laugh at the juxtaposition of their mottos. It was to celebrate Omroz's ascension to the sacred college that Unmu Kun had travelled north with Father Steps on Snake and a party of thirty jackrabbit warriors. They arrived well before the event and brought with them disease, although none fell ill until days after their arrival. Blacktooth, already ill, was one of the first to get sick after Unmu came up from the south to meet the train. He heard talk of epidemic in the province. At first they blamed the water, but a week later three of the warriors and several grasshopper children fell ill, and then Blacktooth St. George, who already had the runs. As Ummu explained it, the Crusaders in the south at first attributed the affliction to poisoned wells left by retreating Texarch forces. But the cattle that drank from the wells were not so afflicted, and the disease seemed to spread from the men who had drunk of the wells to men who had not. So far the enemy was not affected by the plague, if such it was. The disease, whose symptoms were something like those suffered in Valana before the election of Pope Amen I, was not yet epidemic. To contain it, certain fighting units were quarantined. Blacktooth did not attend the mass of a sovereign pontiff or Father Ambrose's consecration, but watched from a distant hilltop while squatting in the grass, taking a long, painful dump. Blacktooth had given himself over to the devil. He had stopped praying the divine office, except when it came to him in snatches. He listened to himself fart and said, Amen. He had ceased to meditate except for an occasional rosary in honor of the Virgin, but then his mind dwelled on Idria in the role of God's mother. He assumed that he would never see her again, for she was now a nun. He had not and would not ask Brown Pony for assurance that he had done what he had said he would do as soon as they were gone from New Jerusalem, that is, commute her sentence from permanent exile. He had no evidence for believing that the Pope had remembered or kept the promise, and he could not ask. He knew he was going mad. The origin of his cosmic madness was his inflamed bowel, which was caused by his guilt, which was driving him crazy during this summer of the year of our Lord, 3246, the year of the reconquest, not the previous year, when he had killed a pitiful drafted glep, for that had not been a year of diarrhea and fever. His days of madness made him reclusive. Only the responsibility he felt for Librada, the duty to return her to the country of her birth, kept him from abandoning all hope and fleeing. Father Steps on Snake was available to him, but he did not confess. The idea of confession seemed to make his diarrhea worse. He had made himself a stranger to his master by his insolence. The journey was misery, and every few days he had a day of delirium and uncontrollable behavior. But it was on such a bad day that the dead Pope Amen came to comfort him. Your Christ is the true man of no identity, Amen Specklebur told him while he took a dump at sundown. The one not wearing a mask. He comes and goes through your face where your mask is. He comes and goes as he likes, fore and aft, and your mask sees him not. A mask sees self only in a mirror, but the true Jesus without a mask is alive and well. Austere he sits in solitude under the bridge where the Christ sleeps and takes a dump. Are not all sins in themselves their own punishment? Blacktooth asked impertinently. He thought he remembered Specklebird saying something like that during the nine days of prayer they had shared. Punishment like your congress with old Shard's daughter, the Pope replied with a grin. 
and disappeared before Nimi could say that was not a mortal sin. Besides his illness of body and spirit, another factor discouraged flight. Just out of sight beyond the southern horizon, another train was traveling eastward on a parallel course, and another might be coming behind it. There was too much chance of being caught. Dust from the other train was usually visible by day, and the glow of its wagoners' fires by night. A rare glimpse of the wagons and riders occurred when the train mounted a low hill in the distance. Some of the wagons flashed in the sunlight as if they were covered with metal, but with the heat and the distance even the hills seemed to be made of red-hot metal in the late light. The nomad riders stayed clear of the mysterious train. They had been so ordered. No one to whom the monk talked knew much about it, except that it had departed from New Jerusalem after the Pope's train, and that someone who knew someone who knew Wuxin said that it carried secret weapons, and that it was under the command of Magister Dion. A few days later, Blacktooth became aware that they had penetrated into tall grass country. He knew it without looking up from where he lay on the feed sacks in the back of the bouncing hoodlum wagon. He knew because the bands of incoming warriors were beginning to speak the dialect of the grasshopper, and their animals began to include dogs. The dogs were not immediately friendly to wild dog nomads and were noisily hostile toward churchmen and new Jerusalemites. Because of the dogs, Blacktooth began sleeping inside the cramped hoodlum wagon instead of under it. Pursued by a pack of the wolfish beasts, a screaming man leaped upon the tailgate of the hoodlum wagon one morning, and Blacktooth helped haul him inside. A snarling dog refused to let go of his shin. Librada shrieked. Cat and Monk lunged for the dog at the same time. The man's shin was well wrapped in military leggings, but he kept screaming until Blacktooth beat the dog off with a faggot and restrained the cat. Thank God, and thank you, Nimi. I didn't know you were with us. Abelot, what in hell are you doing here? I'm just here for the crusade. Wu Shin let me join the team. Damn, it's bleeding. Your cat did that. You've been on the train all along. Sure, but this is the first day I've had free. Blacktooth thought for a moment. When the Pope's party of churchmen had left New Jerusalem, they brought with them seventeen wagons and an elite fighting team from the Suckermints, men whose only loyalty to the Pope was guaranteed by their frightened respect for Wuxin, their sergeant-general, a rank created for the occasion by the reigning pontiff in a moment of whimsy. The wizened old warrior wore gold chevrons and a star in his plaid tunic, which Amen the Second had given him. That he had accepted Abelot among his so-called crack troops strained Nimi's credulity, but the students swore it was true. Blacktooth was glad for the company, at least for a day. Are you ready to run away again? the student asked. Like last year? Nimi snorted. Last year one mad cardinal was leading a crowd of amateurs. This year the vicar of Christ is leading three hordes of warriors and two small armies. Two? Where's army number two? It's moving south of us. Oh, you mean the tanks? That's different. That's something I'm not supposed to talk about if I know anything, which I don't. Tanks? Secret weapons? Water tanks, for all I know. We'll need a lot of water. While they marched across grasshopper country and the Pope watched the sky, the Berrigan flew over the procession so often that it became a nomad joke. During this time, Pope Amen I appeared to Blacktooth more than once and warned him against continuing his rebellion against his master. When he answered the old black cougar, Bitten Dog the Hood accused him of talking to himself, and he sent a message to Wu Xin saying that the monk needed a witch doctor. The doctor who came turned out to be the Pope's personal physician, although the patient had never seen him before, and was unable to guess to which of several schools of medicine the doctor belonged. He wore nomad leathers, and he swore nomad oaths under his breath but he carried a black bag full of pipes, needles, pincers, and charms, like a member of the ancient and mystical school of allopaths. The doctor told him that the Pope was also not well, although he had not yet contracted the four-day fever, as it was being called. His symptoms reminded Blacktooth of Meldown. Blacktooth described the venerable Bedellus's summonabish stew. The doctor immediately claimed it was an old nomad dish, and became enthusiastic when he learned that Brown Pony had thrived on it. 
When he left Blacktooth, he went to see the cook. The reinstitution of Summonabish stew as a foundation of the papal diet was thus probably responsible for Blacktooth's elevation to the cardinalate when the Pope had another whimsical moment. Because the movement of armies of horsemen was also a religious procession, each day must be begun with a sunrise mass, and the Christians among the nomads must be fed the bread of heaven before the march resumed for the day. Out of deference to his lord Hungen, Eltjur Braum put up with this sanctimony for a whole week before he went over his lord's head and asked the Pope's leave to lead his warriors on ahead as skirmishers. It was a bad idea only if one assumed the worst of the grasshopper's shaft. Brown Pony had done his best to see the man without assumptions. The Pope took the shaft by the arm and led him into the tent of the Kisok de Rivurdal. Hungen Usle Chur opposed the grasshopper's request at first, but the Pope said, There is merit in moving to separate a strong striking force from liturgical encumbrance, especially as we grow closer to the enemy. That enemy knows very well we are coming. That is true, said Holy Madness. And what worries me most is that we don't see him doing anything about it. But I am not ready to relinquish my command to Scharf Braum. With Holy Father's permission, I will take the Scharf and as many of his warriors as he wants to bring, along with an equal number of wild dog warriors under my command. And we shall advance as skirmishers toward the frontier. The Pope turned to Wushin, who quickly endorsed the plan, but added, The Lord Hungen is right to worry. We must find out soon where the Texarch force is massed, but skirmishers should avoid battle until our main force arrives. It is possible that they are embattled in the east, Brown Pony suggested. They do not lose control of the great river. If it is so, Axe said, New Rome may not show much defense. Hanagan City will have the defense. It was agreed then. At least six hundred warriors, part from each horde, stacked their arms for the Pope's later blessing and knelt beside the wagon tracks to pray at their last mass before battle. Scharf Braun and perhaps two hundred active disbelievers, both Grasshopper and Wild Dog, waited on a distant hilltop for the mass to end. The two forces then united and rode east. Holding court in a field of sunflowers in the heart of Grasshopper country, the Pope mentioned the name of the next candidate for a papal battlefield promotion to the sacred college, whereupon Wushin went into a waking trance, while Jopo Cardinal Ombros blinked and walked away uttering mysteries. The fall from grace by Blacktooth Brother St. George ended with a thud, when the Pope, in a recurrence of the whimsy which had moved him to create the rank of Sergeant General for his bodyguard, created Black Tooth St. George a cardinal deacon of Brown Pony's old Roman church, St. Maisie's. The monk was not immediately informed of this signal honor, for such announcements normally emerged from a full consistory, but he got wind of it in small whiffs, as when Abelot first addressed him as Your Eminence. Mimi correctly attributed this to sarcasm. He therefore blamed Abelot again when Wuxin rode back to the hoodlum wagon on the Pope's white stallion and used the same form of address. The Holy Father sends me to thank you for the special stew, and to ask about your eminence's health, said Axe. Black Tooth glared quickly at Abelot and responded, I shit sixteen times a day, Axe. I'm weak. Every fourth day I have fits, and bitten dog ties me up. Except for that, I'm very well, thank the Holy Father. I'll tell him you're dying, Wuxin grunted and left. The physician returned that afternoon to check him over again. You have the Hannigan science to thank for your illness, he told the monk. Jack Rabbit warriors brought the curse up to us from the south. Sometimes the physician spoke Rocky Mount with a grasshopper accent, and sometimes he spoke grasshopper with a Rocky Mount accent. He made Nimmy eat bits of charcoal from a mostly dung fire and drink a slurry of its ashes. He put Blacktooth on a diet of meal boiled in milk, and gave him some bitter bark to chew. These measures could be either nomad medicine or allopath remedy, but he blew Kenab's smoke toward the four quarters, mumbled a litany, and prescribed Kenab to be smoked on Blacktooth's crazy days. 
The Pope apparently liked this medicine man, and Blacktooth was grateful to Brown Pony for his care. Before he left, the physician gave him a small package. The Pope sent you this. I almost forgot. Blacktooth neglected opening it. A gift from his former master would make him feel more guilt. Sometimes he wanted to go to the Pope and prostrate himself as he had often done in his early years before Jared and his brethren to obtain their forgiveness for putting a lizard in singing cow's bed or for yodeling in choir. But that was within a brotherhood of equals under the equalissimus. His present Lysi Majestatis Culpa seemed much less forgivable. But that, of course, was before he opened the package and found the red hat. It was not the big red hat that was customarily nailed to the cathedral ceiling after the first wearing, but only an extra scarlet zucchetto borrowed from Chief Hawken Cardinal Irikawa. It was identifiable by the hole in the brim through which the Cardinal Monarch inserted his feather. Now we shall have to ordain you deacon of St. Maisie's, said Brown Pony's note. The Pope gave him three days to recover before summoning him to the head of the papal caravan. Blacktooth refused the honor. The Pope refused his refusal. Put on the red cap, he said. It means you get to vote for the next Pope. It is not a reward for holiness or good behavior. Then for the stew. Not even for the stew of many blessings, Nimmy. A punishment for sin, then? Blacktooth wondered. Ah, symmetry. Either punishment or reward. You were always a symmetrical dualist, Nimmy. A symmetrical duelist? asked the Kisok Reverdog. What is that, Holy Father? Ambidextrous swordplay, the axe told him in an aside. Blacktooth was still holding the hat between thumb and forefinger as if it were dripping slime. Grab him, axe, said the Pope. Wuxin seized his shoulders. Brown Pony took the zucchetto from his hand and centered it carefully upon his stubbly tonsure, then patted it down. When the sergeant-general released him, his hand darted toward his head, but the Pope grabbed it and laughed. "'Do I have to wear it all the time?' asked Blacktooth Cardinal St. George, deacon of St. Maisie's. When news of the war finally came, it came from the rear. Texarc cavalry had descended mysteriously out of nowhere to fall upon the wild dog families in the West. They were dressed like motherless ones, and they made a great slaughter of the Weegis women and their breeding stock, the messenger said. At one family compound, that of Weetalk Enar, there was a complete massacre, apparently to eliminate witnesses. But two daughters nevertheless survived, and one described a cavalry colonel with a wooden nose and long hair that covered his ears. The other, Potea Weetalk, lived long enough to name her former husband Colonel Essit of Weetalk Loit as the commander of the troop of Texarc marauders. She had watched them shoot her whole family before he, full of hate, personally shot her in the lower spine so that her death was slow. The Texarchy seemed to know just which horses to kill among the breeding stock in order to ruin every Weegis as a breeder. Between murderous raids on family encampments, the marauders were observed doing something to the nomad cattle whenever they had made camp for the night. When all this was reported to Brown Pony, the Pope became sad, but was not surprised. He looked at Hawk and Irikawa and said, Your Majesty was right. They were Texarchy you encountered in the north, although I'm surprised they made it that far west without encountering the wild dog. He turned to Sharf Oksho and said, You'll have to take care of it. To Blacktooth it sounded like neither a command nor a suggestion, but simply an observation about Oksho's fate, or perhaps his own. Sharf Oksho called together the wild dog warriors who had not ridden on ahead with the skirmishers. There is a difference between being a shepherd of the Lord's sheep and a cowherd to Christ's wild cattle, Brown Pony said mildly as he watched a fourth of his army prepare to advance to the rear. He sent the wild dog messenger on eastward to report the raids to the Lord Hunganusle. Three days later, Hungan returned to confer with the Pope and Wushin. He brought no news from the east. No Texarc patrols had been encountered, and even the motherless bandits were staying clear of the hordes as they advanced in battle array. The grasshopper Scharf had sent patrols toward Texarc, but they had not yet returned when Hungen left the skirmish line to come here. 
They took a census of the forces remaining to them after the homeward departure of Oksho and his warriors. Their strength had diminished by a quarter. All leaders conferred and were joined in conference by the spook commander from the secret of train to the south. There could be no change in the master plan. The strongest force would be directed southeast toward Hannigan City, as before, and only the force of the assault on the protectors of New Rome would be diminished. But tonight the Pope determined that for a few hours at least there would be no more talk of war. Since leaving New Jerusalem, the same group of people always gathered around the Pope after supper on the trail. The summer nights were hot, and everyone sat well back from the fire, but close enough to hear and be heard. In the beginning, the cardinals had wanted to say Compline at this time of evening, followed by religious silence. But the Pope objected to this as an imposition on non-Christian nomad leaders who were part of his court, and he called this his Curia Noctis, and encouraged the telling of stories. Tonight he had determined that the subject would be saints and holy men, although anything but talk of war might be permitted. Because holy madness was still with him, he sent for Cardinal Blacktooth to join them at the fire. The monk was too weak to walk alone. Axe gave him a shoulder to lean on, but at last carried him on his back to the Pope's vicinity. Where is your red hat? Brown Pony demanded. It was stolen by a holy man, holy father, said Blacktooth. Really? Who's the holy man, your eminence? Your predecessor, holy father. You have been visited by Amen Specklebird, Brother St. George? He comes to see me every fourth day. If so, he should have cured you. Tell him we need miracles to canonize. I don't think he wants to be made a saint. Why, Blacktooth, nobody makes a saint. He is already a saint, or he isn't. And that is up to us to decide. Of course, Holy Father. Well, make him give you your hat back. Don't come back here without it. Blacktooth confided in Wushin. Tomorrow is my crazy day. I already feel queer. Don't let me do anything disgraceful. Some of the cardinals seemed to be dozing. There was a long silence at first. The Pope looked at Wushin. The axe cleared his throat, then offered a few words to open the session. I admire the saints. You may not think so, lords and eminent fathers, because I myself am not religious. But my people do honor holy men, and one of them was called Butza, when he had squeezed his way out from his mother's gateway at Perth, he stood erect. He pointed upward with one hand, down with the other, and said, Sky above, ground below, and I alone am the honored guest. Ambrose laughed. Every squealing baby says that before I baptize it. That's exactly what the kid's howling about. He is all too much the honored guest. Sitting cross-legged, Axe smiled as if his point was made. He closed his eyes and became a sixteen-foot golden body, weighing seventeen tons. Then he vanished and became a blade of grass. Blacktooth noticed that Pope Amen I, having come earlier than expected, was standing in the fringes of the firelight. He had stopped there to piss. Having retucked his long black member into his robes, he slowly approached the fire, but he cautioned Nimi by touching a finger to his quiet smile. It was plain that nobody else could see him. Blacktooth could even smell him, and he smelled like death. Made nervous by the smiling speckled bird spirit, Blacktooth broke the silence. St. Leibowitz spoke at birth, too, you know, said the monk. He stuck his head out of the birth canal and asked the midwife, Now what? The midwife answered, For ninety-nine years, a great waste. Ugh, it was a low grunt from the axe. St. Isaac said, Begone! She vanished. He lived ninety-nine years, you know. The Pope smiled wryly. St. Leibowitz had the devil for a midwife, then? Does this story come from the basement of Leibowitz Abbey? You can find strange legends down there, Holy Father, Blacktooth admitted. The earliest life of St. Leibowitz was anonymous. A man could be hanged for writing a book. We have no bylines from those decades. But that's not the only story that connects Leibowitz with the devil. Tell another, said the Pope. I can't, really. 
Did you ever hear of Faust, Holy Father? I think not. It's about a pact with the devil. We have only pieces of the story. I can't tell you why the venerable Bedullus thought Faust was Leibowitz. Didn't the simpletons think he made a pact with the devil? Yes, but the venerable Bedullus was no simpleton. Amen the second laughed. The word simpleton had come to be a polite form of address, and Nimi had just asserted that Bedullus was no gentleman. I mean, he was not a simplifier who thought the devil inspired all books except scripture. And the venerable Bedullus didn't think so? The questions were making Blacktooth dizzy. He watched Pope Amen II, who slowly and in a serpentine manner was becoming the sixteen-foot golden body of the idol Baal. Blacktooth, after a moment of dizzy indecision, lurched up to smash the Pope idol until Wushin objected. They took him to the hoodlum wagon, bloody but unbowed, and they helped Bitten Dog tie him down. It was another day of the plague, and the war that disappeared only at the Curia Noctis. During his dementia, the cougar Librada ran away. Chapter 28 In time of famine, when the garden fails, when the brothers are eating yucca roots, cactus paddles, chaparral, cocks, snakes, and the laying hens, and yet are near to starving, let the abbot pray for St. Benedict's blessing, and allow them to eat the four-footed livestock, unless there be able hunters among them to stalk the wild blue-head goats. Rule of St. Leibowitz, Deviations, 17. Abbots were not all alike. Jerome of Pecos, abbot before the conquest in the time of Pope Benedict the Twenty-Second and Mayor Hannigan the Second, had thrown open the monastery gates to the world, and had allowed his sons to listen to natural philosophy lectures by practical atheists and play with electricity machines in the basement. What had happened to the religious vocation in that time, Abbot Olsherwin could only wonder. The monks of Leibowitz Abbey, under his guidance, had kept themselves as unaware as possible of the changing world, including the controversial pontificates of the two Amens. Without offending the Pope, such isolation had not been possible under Abbot Jared, who was also a cardinal, but Dom Abiquiu had discontinued Jared's policy of letting the monks know about church affairs outside the monastery. Always conservative in his interpretation of the rule of St. Leibowitz, the abbot withheld most news, including ecclesiastical news, of the outside world from his cloistered flock. The only monks he had told about the bull Scitote Tyrannum were the abbey's business manager and those brothers native to Texarch or the province whose families were in the path of war, and these were told to keep silent. But Amen II, when he marched out of New Jerusalem to conquer New Rome, sent Olshewin two letters. The first told him that he, the servant of the servants of God, was undertaking a crusade to correct the errors of his beloved son, the emperor, and that the SOSOG needed the prayers of all the monks of Leibowitz to support this holy cause. The second letter ordered him to grant sanctuary at the abbey to a certain sister Claire of Assisi in case she chose to avail herself of the Pope's clemency and return from her exile at the monastery of the nuns of Our Lady of San Pancho Villa of Cockroach Mountain, south of the Brave River. Brown Pony did not mention that Sister Clare was formerly Blacktooth's lover, but the abbot knew this anyway. Iridia Cardinal Salentia had visited Leibowitz Abbey on her way south. Olshuan had been startled to observe that the young sister accompanying her was the same girl who had impudently flashed herself at him from the roadway the previous season, before she followed the old Jew to the mesa. He stirred unhappily at the memory, but the command to grant her a temporary refuge was the Pope's. Olshewan was strict in matters of the rule, but he was neither a rebel nor an especially brave man. If he must lead his congregation in prayers for the Pope's intentions, he felt he must tell them about the crusade, and if he must grant sanctuary any time soon to a barefoot whore in an ODD habit, he must begin construction immediately of a special extra cell. The messenger who brought the Pope's letters to Walshawan had ridden as fast as possible to Leibowitz Abbey from New Jerusalem, and the next day he had to ride on south as fast as possible to San Pancho Villa Nunnery, 
evidently with a message of clemency for the girl. Upon receipt of the Pope's letters, the abbot immediately sent a message of his own to New Jerusalem, summoning Singing Cow home from his priory. This, too, was irregular. But the abbot needed to know how the departure of the Pope from his Succament Mountain Sanctuary might affect the relations between the government of New Jerusalem and the monks of the Priory of St. Leibowitz and the Cottonwoods, a mission of the order. The special extra cell was a lean-to against the north wall of the guesthouse, but there was no door between them. Compared with the monks' cells, the whore hut, as Olshewan thought of it, was luxurious, having its own running water, a charcoal stove for cooking or heating, a wooden tub for bathing, and an adjacent one-hole privy only three paces from a side door. Like the monks' cells, it had a cot with a straw mattress, one chair, one table for writing or eating, one prie dieu for praying, and one crucifix before which to pray. A missal, a psalter, and a copy of the Rule of St. Leibowitz were on the bookshelf. If the cook brought her food, the trollop would not need to leave the guest accommodations even for meals, unless she came to Mass, which the abbot considered unlikely. The abbey had two guests already. One was Snow Ghost, a younger brother of Sharf Oxshow, who wanted to become a postulant. The other was Thon Elmofire Santalot, SCD, VAC, ORD, who, besides being an associate professor at the Texarc University, was a major in the reserve cavalry. His unit had been called to active duty, but he was on a leave to pursue his studies at the Abbey, where he spent all his time in the vaults and the clear story reading room, joining the monks only at meals and at Sunday's mass. No one, not even the abbot, knew the purpose of his study at the Abbey. Seventy-two years ago, Abbot Jerome would have begged him to tell them all. Now, Dom Abicu begged him not to discuss anything with the monks. Snow Ghost spoke no Olzog. Santa Lot spoke no Wild Dog, although he had learned a little jackrabbit while serving in the province. Both of them knew a little church speak. They had trouble communicating, but since they were enemies, this was just as well. Snow Ghost was already attending Mass and chanting the hours with the other monks in choir, although his habit was still being tailored for him. The abbot had warned him sternly against discussing politics with the Texarch scholar, but the warning proved unnecessary. Snow Ghost seemed thoroughly afraid of the man. Thorn Santalot, whose life seemed to be driven by curiosity, became curious at this time as to why the extra cell was being built when the guest house was nearly empty. Snow Ghost could tell him nothing. Brother Carpenter said it was for a special visitor, and that was all he knew. The expected trollop was never to occupy the extra cell, however. In late June, the old Jew who never died came out of the east and collapsed outside the gates. The abbot ordered him carried to the guesthouse, but when he began raving in Hebrew, Thorn Santalot became frightened of him, and so Don Abiquiu housed him in the whore hut and fed him bread and boiled goat's milk. Brother Medic was unable to diagnose the ancient hermit's illness, which seemed to abate on the day following his arrival. He insisted on going back to his mesa, but on the fourth day before he got underway, he went wild again and had to be restrained. When he recovered temporarily from his fever, he insisted to Walshwin that he was a danger to the community, and exacted a promise of sanitary measures. He said he had caught the disease while traveling behind the lines in the province, where he had sold military weather to both sides. He insisted that to prevent spreading the contagion, the doors and windows of his cell were to be covered with cloth to exclude insects. Knowing that old Benjamin had medical experience, the abbot readily consented. When Elmo Fire Santalot heard of the nature of old Benjamin's illness and where he caught it, the scholar went straight to the abbot's office. The abbot was out, so he gave the abbot's secretary a bottle of pills, explaining that he had needed them to avoid catching Hilbert's disease from the troops in the province. The scholar was having a late breakfast in the refectory the following morning when Dorm Q sat down beside him, placing the bottle of pills on the oak table. If you take one pill a day, it's a preventative, said the scholar. Take twelve a day for five days, it's a cure. You should have enough to give two pills to any monk who had contact with him. And you want me to give the rest to Benjamin? If you want to save his life, it is not usually lethal, but he is so old and feeble. Old, yes. Feeble, no. 
but I don't understand how you happen to have these with you. You called it Hilbert's disease? Thorn sent a lot looked around the empty refectory. It was almost time for lunch. Beside the abbot, only Brother Cook and Brother Reconciliator were listening. Thorn Hilbert's disease is no longer a secret, really, I suppose. Our forces have prophylaxis, these pills, and the invaders don't. Go about your business, said the abbot to the other monks. When they were gone, he asked Sandalot, Are you saying that Hannigan's military is deliberately spreading the disease in the province? Certainly. Those who wage war have always used disease, don't they? Pestilence is one of the horsemen of the apocalypse, is it not? Olshuman shook his head. No. Well, there are various interpretations. You must remember that a sexual disease was one of the weapons used in the so-called flame deluge. A disease was used by Hannigan too on the plains back in the last century. But Hannigan's was a plague of cattle, not human beings. Well, yes, it is being used again on cattle. Horses, too. That was part of Hilbert's work. He isolated the microorganisms. Today we can infect the nomads' animals directly without driving diseased herds among them. How is that done? I'm not sure. The cavalry carries it around in bottles. It can be sprayed from upwind, I think. You called it Hilbert's disease? murmured the abbot, who often became quiet when astonished. Who is Hilbert? Von Brandio Hilbert is, or was, a brilliant epidemiologist, formerly occupying the chair of life science at Hannigan University. Was. Formerly. Is he dead? No, he's alive, but he's in jail. He conscientiously objected to the military use of his work. Well, here they come for lunch, Domne, and I must return to my research. Thank you, Brother Cook, for feeding me at this odd hour. As they left the refectory, the abbot knelt to pray at the feet of the wooden figure of another conscientious objector who had founded the order. Olshuan managed to pray for the Pope's soul and the Pope's beloved son, Errant, the Emperor, without mentioning victory in battle. He prayed only briefly, then returned to the refectory with his flock to consume his daily bread, red beans, and milk. Afterward, he took the pills to the old Jew. The cure was effective. A week later, the patient returned to his mesa after leaving instructions for decontamination of the cell he had occupied. The procedure involved burning sulfur and leaving the cell vacant for several months, during which time it could not serve its designed purpose, if and when the need for a whore hut arose. If Singing Cow resented the abbot's midsummer summons, he kept it to himself, but his return from New Jerusalem did not seem a happy homecoming for him. Ultrawan suppressed his eagerness for news of Brown Pony's crusade, for Cow seemed half dead of heat exhaustion, and he let him rest for a day before interrogation. But on the following day, the prior of St. Leberwitz in the Cottonwoods claimed ignorance of the doings of the papal court. Further said Father Moo, the relations between his priory and the government of Magister Dion could not be affected by the crusade, because no such relations existed by Brown Pony's design. When Olshuan wanted to discuss Sister Claire of Assisi, Singing Cow knew her only as Blacktooth's Idria. And since this knowledge had come to him through the confessional, he would say nothing about her, nor would he listen patiently to the abbot's gentle slanders. The abbey had accepted seven jackrabbit refugees as postulants that season, so Singing Cow's old cell was occupied. The abbot put him in the guest house with the wild dog postulant and thorn Elmo fire Santalot after telling him what Santalot had said about Hilbert's disease. Father Moo remained expressionless. Don Q went away with a faint smile. He had not asked Singing Cow to question the scholar. Three weeks elapsed and no one else at the abbey became infected. Singing Cow requested permission to return to Leibowitz in the Cottonwoods. Olshuan realized that it had been a minor mistake to summon him, but he was reluctant to let him go without putting him to good use first. I want you to go over all the work that Brother St. George left behind, not only the Bidelaria, but also the Duran manuscripts, and see if you can make a glossary. A cloud of dust arose far to the south of Sanley Bowitz. 
At the time, three novices happened to be standing on the parapet wall where they were recording the altitude and azimuth of the sun for comparison with an ephemeris. The purpose was to reset the monastery's clock. A coach escorted by two men on horseback emerged from the distant dust and entered the village and reappeared a few minutes later on the road toward the monastery. The novices watched, transfixed, as the richly decorated coach stopped outside the gate and the two uniformed soldiers of the Loraden King opened the doors, whence emerged Sister Claire of Assisi, an unknown sister, and the cardinal herself, Mother Iridia Silentia, O.D.D. Five for the guest house, someone called out. It was after the evening meal and almost time for Compline. Iridia Silentia appeared at the abbot's office, but seemed reluctant at first to sit down. She seemed nervous, but full of enthusiasm. Sister Clare is a vessel of the Holy Spirit, Domne. I am certain of it. The reason I am certain is that she cannot command this talent, and she will not pretend to heal when she can't. She is deeply sympathetic, and in some cases it might be helpful to pretend to be healing someone whose ailment is partly emotional, but she will not pretend. Does she attribute it to God? I think it would not be prudent to ask her that, the cardinal said sharply, and Dorma de Cue reddened. Eurydia finally sat down. If she said yes, she would become a problem for the church. If she said no, she would become a problem for the church. This is why we cannot accept such a treasure in our community. She has taken our vows, walked on our stones with her bare feet, prayed with us, eaten God's body with us, and we quickly came to love her. But she is a treasure, and she has to be released. Did Brother St. George know about this talent? She told me she had teased him. I think she meant she showed him her gift in minor ways. You can see how we cannot have anyone special in our midst except the Lord. So you have brought her to me. It was the Cardinal's turn to blush. "'because the Pope told me to. "'No, not quite. "'The Pope told me to send her here if she wished to leave us. "'I decided she should go, and I helped her to wish it, "'and I brought her myself. "'If I sent her, I would not be able to tell you about her.' "'You could have written a letter?' "'I could not have written a letter, "'nor can you put anything at all about her in writing "'unless you want to destroy her, don't you see?' "'Dorma de Q was briefly silent.' like asking her if her gift is from God or not. The cardinal smiled warmly, causing the abbot's heart to squirm. She needs to go home if the mayor's son will let her. You need keep her here only until the Holy Father can arrange it. You are aware that the Holy Father is otherwise occupied? Silentia ignored Olshewin's irony. I'll tell Sister Claire that she must avoid talking to anyone outside the guesthouse. There is one of our postulants in the guesthouse. Then she must. But I'll get him out. Who is the other sister? My assistant. She will return with me to San Pancho. Brother Livery Man appeared in the doorway, caught the abbot's eye, and in response to the abbot's nod asked, Donny, did you tell our guests to choose their own rooms? Yes, of course. Is there a problem? Only that one of the nuns chose the... Uh, isolation cell. You must get her out of there. It's not safe yet. She said it was built for her. I don't know what she meant. The cardinal studied the abbot's expression for a moment and said, I think I know. She arose. Well, Domne, I am very tired and would like to retire. If I may be excused, I shall say Compline alone in my room. I'll speak to my student. I do thank you for all. Student? The word lingered in the abbot's office behind her. That evening, Sister Clare abandoned the abbot's whore hut for a cell in the guest house with the others, saying that she knew it had been meant for her originally, but that she had been unaware of the quarantine. Singing Cow suppressed his curiosity about her and said nothing. Three nuns, two soldiers, a scholar from Texarch, a nomad who was a possible postulant, and Father Singing Cow now shared the guest house. Idria stayed in her cell except when they all went to the refectory or to mass together. The cardinal, her assistant, and the wild dog nomad Snow Ghost were often absent from the building, presumably singing the divine office with the brothers. Singing Cow was busy in the scriptorium, making a glossary from the work of Brother Blacktooth, 
and Thorn Elmo Fire Santaloft was usually busy searching the bookshelves in the basement, or reading and making notes in the clear story. The Laredan soldiers were left alone most of the time, with Idria staying behind a closed door. One of the soldiers rode into Sanley Bowitz on the second day and brought back a jug of local hooch. When the soldiers were both solemnly drunk, the bolder of them knocked upon the pretty nun's door and offered her a drink. Idria opened the door, took the proffered jug, tilted it, and swallowed mightily. Thank you, Corporal Brauka, she said with a smile, then closed the door and clicked the latch. Brauka knocked again, but there was no answer. You saw her smile at me? Father Moo and the nomad youth returned from church, and soon after Santalot came in. The soldiers offered everyone a drink, but there was little left in the jug, and no one accepted. The cardinal came in and sat down in the reading room for a moment before retiring. The soldiers hid the jug and pretended to be sleeping. We shall leave here after lords in the morning, said Mother Iridia. We must all thank the monks for their hospitality. She was speaking church speak, which was the only common language among the monastery's guests. The soldiers spoke it poorly, but as soldiers they were very curious about the military campaigns of the present Pope, and had many questions asked and unasked. In two days at the Abbey they had learned very little. In the morning, after a last conference with the abbot, Mother Iridia bade her student a tearful goodbye, and she and her servants departed. Idria cried in her cell for an hour after they were gone. She shared the guesthouse now with Singing Cow, Snow Ghost, and Elmo Fire Santalop, the scholar. Abbot Olshawan told Snow Ghost he could now move to a cell in the dormitory, but Snow Ghost resisted, saying he was not yet quite ready for silence and solitude. Surprised, the abbot glanced quickly at Idria as if he wondered whether the nomad was not quite ready for chastity either, but he did not press it. Nomad vocations were rare, and except when Singing Cow was present, Brother Wren, the abbey's cook, had no one to talk to in his own tongue or a related dialect. It was during the feast of St. Clair, one year after her taking her vows, from which she was now released, that Idria, sister Clare of Assisi, performed a miracle in the guest house of Leibowitz Abbey. In late August, Brother Wren got permission to visit Singing Cow in the guest house, and Idria, sister Clare of Assisi, became aware that Brother Cook had a cancer eating his throat. His voice had diminished to a hoarse whisper. He called his cancer Brother Crab and joked about it. Idria came up behind him as he sat and talked with his old friend Moo. He started up as she touched him, but then settled back in his chair with a smile and let her hands explore his throat. He started again when she pressed down hard with her fingertips below his Adam's apple. Relax, brother. Does it hurt? Not much, Wren whispered. What have you done? Something popped. She continued caressing his throat for a while, then left him and went to her cell. Father Moo crossed himself. Brother Wren noticed and followed suit. Better not tell anyone, Singing Cow said. Within three days, Wren began to get his voice back. Word got around. Within a week, Sister Claire had healed infected blisters, a hernia, an abscessed tooth, and a probable case of gonorrhea of the eye. All this might have passed unnoticed, but when she cured the old librarian brother Obol of his myopia, and he got a look at the beautiful woman who had laid hands on his eyes, his squawk of astonishment was followed by the joyful noise of his thanksgiving, and this fell upon the ears of Dom Singing Car was present in the guesthouse when the abbot strode to the closed door of Idria's cell. I told you not to mix with the monks. I have not mixed with the monks. Cardinal Silentia forbade you to practice your healing tricks. Sister Clare opened her door. Beg pardon, Domne, but she did not. I do not have any healing tricks. You argue with me. Where is your religious training? You prefer brother librarian half-blind? It was my fault, Domne, put in Father Moo. He ventured a lie. I sent him to her. What? Olshuan gasped and paused for self-control. You are not to lay hands on anyone else while you are here. Do you understand? Yes, Domne. Will you obey? Yes, Domne. The abbot glared at Singing Cow. I think it is about time you returned home. Thank you, Domne. As soon as Dom Abiquiu was gone, he said, Hallelujah! 
Sister Claire smiled. Will you carry a message to my family and the mayor when you go? She asked. But Singing Cow had not yet departed when her wounds began to appear. When Idria went to Mass, she knelt in the back of the church behind a pillar where she was not visible to the monks in the choir. Thus she always left the church first. Following her back to the guesthouse, Singing Cow noticed dark spots in the prints of her bare feet in the sand. When she walked across the guesthouse floor, the blood was even more apparent. He called out to her, asking how she had hurt her feet. The young nun stopped, pulled up the skirt of her habit, and looked down. She stared, then looked back at Father Moo. When she lifted her hand to her face, he saw that the palm was bloody. She seemed very confused. Who hurt you, sister? Her voice trembled. I don't know. It was dark. I think it was the devil. He was wearing a robe like yours. What? Someone actually attacked you? It's like a dream. There was a hammer. She stopped, looked at him wildly, then bolted into her cell and latched the door. Singing Cow could hear her praying. He went to look for Dorma BQ, whom he found praying before the wooden Leberwitz in the corridor. She said it was like a dream, Father Moo told him. But she thinks somebody with a hammer, maybe the devil. Was she raped? She didn't say anything about it. Let's go. Did you tell Brother Pharmacist? He is on his way. The pharmacist had already arrived when they entered the guest house. The door to Idria's cell was open, and she was lying on her cot. As they started to enter, the pharmacist pushed them back outside, joining them and closing the door behind him. Her wounds? the abbot whispered. The wounds of Christ, the medic answered softly. What are you talking about? The wounds of the nails. The wound of the spear. The stigmata. You're saying the female, the, uh, sister, has the stigmata? Yes, she does. The cut in her side is clean. The wounds in her hands and feet have bruised blue edges. She speaks of a hammer. Devil! It was as close as Oshua never came to swearing. He turned and walked out of the guesthouse with Singing Cow at his heels. Retaliation, he spat. Retribution. Excuse me, what do you mean, Domni? I forbade her to use healing powers. This is her answer. Singing Cow was silent for several moments as they walked toward the convent. Then he shook his head. Domni, I am leaving tomorrow for home. Abbot Olshewan stopped. Without asking permission? You already gave it, remember? Of course. The abbot turned on his heel and walked away, alone. A few hours later, when Brother Wren St. Mary came to inquire about a change in the diet for the sick, he found Abbey Q. Olshewan lying on the floor of his office. He could not move his right leg. When he tried to speak, he squawked. Brother Pharmacist came directly to the infirmary where Wren had carried Olshewan. Is it a stroke, Brother? Wren asked. Yes, I'm afraid it is. The abbey had its own prior again, and Father Devendi was immediately summoned along with Singing Cow. Wren went back to the kitchen. Prior Devendi turned to Prior Singing Cow. Can you get the sister who heals to come? You know about her? Tom Abbey Q told me what Mother Aridia told him. I know he was alarmed, but he may die, you know. I'll go ask her. She was uh, injured, you know. Did Brother Medic tell you? No, put in the pharmacist. Describe the wounds to Father Tavendi, Father Moo told him, but don't interpret them. I understand. Make sure she wears shoes of some kind and doesn't walk on the bandages. Singing Cow glanced at the abbot. Don was shaking his head from side to side with his eyes closed. It meant nothing, Moo decided. Cow found a small pair of sandals in the storeroom. They were very old and might once have belonged to him or to some other adolescent nomad whose feet had not finished growing. He took them to Sister Claire and told her they might once have been blacktooths. She said nothing to that and put them on without protest. Where are we going, Father? To see Dom Abiquiu. He needs you. 
Idria had become accustomed to obedience and came without asking why she was needed. When she limped into the infirmary and approached the bed, Don Mabicue groaned mightily and shrank back from her, his eyes wide and his face a mask of dread. He used his left hand to shield his eyes from her. Idria stopped and stared. Oh, pigs, she said abruptly and crossed herself with a bandaged hand. There is nothing I can do for him. What do you mean? asked Prior de Vendy. I mean I can't do it tonight. And he told me not to do it again anyway. She turned and started to leave the room. Sister Claire, please, he may be dying, said Singing Cow. She crossed herself again, but walked on down the corridor without looking back. The next day she was missing from the guest house, and her small travelling bag was not in her cell. No one had seen her leave, but there was a note on her bed. I'm sorry about your abbot. Thank you for your hospitality. God bless. No one knew where she had gone. On his way back to New Jerusalem, Singing Cow stopped in the village of Sanley Bowitz to ask about her. She had been seen going toward the Mesa of Last Resort. He followed the trail to the foot of the cliff. Once he found a spot of blood on a stone, but no other sign of her. She was with Benjamin then. Father Moo was certain the old Jew would cure her of the Lord's stigmata. Feeling a little guilty for abandoning her and Dormaby Q, he steered his mule toward the papal highway leading north. It was already September, and he travelled by the dark of the moon. Chapter 29 Just as there is an evil zeal of bitterness which separates from God and leads to hell, so there is a good zeal which separates from vices and leads to God. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 72 Blacktooth Cardinal St. George, deacon of St. Maisie's, was on the hillside taking a long and painful dump, his first of many for the day, when he heard the pop, pop, pop of repeating guns. He was coming from the main encampment in the wooded bend of a wide, shallow creek back over the hill. Blacktooth couldn't see the camp from where he was standing, or rather squatting, for his morning ritual, which was the only one he found the leisure to perform in privacy, he preferred the western slope of the little bluff, a hill so small that it barely cleared the trees. Truth was, Blacktooth was homesick. Not for a particular place. He had never had anything even approximating a home except for Leibowitz Abbey. And while he sometimes, indeed fairly often, missed the companionship of the brothers and the security of the routine and the rule, he never missed the abbey itself. He was homesick for the desert, the grasslands, the country of empty sky. Even though he could see nothing to the west but more trees, Blacktooth knew there was open land beyond, rolling plains that went on and on, treeless and townless like eternity itself, and the sky seemed definitely bigger to the west, unsmiling, unspeaking, unlimited. From here I greet you, empty sky. Pop, pop, pop. Blacktooth stumbled as he stood up, hurriedly wiping himself with a wad of grass, then slowed, no longer alarmed, recognizing the sound. It was celebratory, ceremonial, not real, not a firefight. The grasshopper sharp's warriors, disciplined for firing the precious brass cartridges, but bored by the lack of military action, had perfected the art of imitating the sound of the new repeating Pope rifles. As with everything the nomads tried, they had quickly learned to do it well. Blacktooth had first noticed it and the outriders returning from a scouting mission a few days before. He had remarked to his boss, Bitten Dog, that the warriors were mimicking the sound of the brass shell-firing guns from across the sea. Imitate the sound of pots being scoured, your eminence, Bitten Dog had growled. The pop, pop, pop was joined by the sound of dogs. It was not barking, but the alarming half-howl, half-growl of war dogs being brought up on leash. All this was coming from the camp of the Pope's armies down to the edge of the trees, in the bend of the creek called Troublesome or Troublesome. Attempting to shade his eyes from the early morning, late September sun, tying his habit back around him with his book-legger's cord, Blacktooth crossed the crest of the hill and started down toward the camp. He took off his sandals and carried them so that he could walk barefoot in the pleasantly wet grass. Through the trees he could see horses milling and stomping, warily watching the dogs that circled them like a dust devil. The pop, pop, pop was punctuated by whoops and cries, 
and Blacktooth could see the grasshoppers now, painted up, pumping their weapons into the air. More than a small party, too. Something was afoot, or rather, a horse. Blacktooth was almost glad. For several weeks now, on the final approach to New Rome, the tension had been growing among the nomad warriors that had attached themselves to the Pontiff's Crusade. As the twelve hundred strong party, now fully a day's march long, crawled east, the arms of trees extending out into the prairies had become more numerous, longer and thicker, until it had changed in a day, and Blacktooth remembered the day, into arms of prairie extending into trees. It was like an optical illusion, one thing turning with a trick of the eye into its opposite. As they left the tall grass country and began to penetrate the woodlands, the warriors had expected resistance from the Texarch troops Hannigan II had, supposedly, left behind to guard the approaches to the holy city. There had been none. The warriors had expected resistance from the semi-settled grasshopper farmers, and the settlers Filpeo had sent to live among them. There had been none. Foraging horsemen had found nothing but abandoned farms, barns burned or burning, cattle killed or driven away, leaving behind only their footprints or their still soft droppings. The log homesteads were burned or looted, sad-looking little homes bereft of even doors or window glass. The grasshoppers in particular had looked forward to breaking glass, and this made them even more impatient. The contemptible grass-eaters had either broken or taken their windows with them. The new cardinal was as firmly attached to the hood wagon as the old monk had been. But several times Blacktooth had deserted his pots and pans and explored one or two of the abandoned houses, hoping perhaps, although he never admitted this to himself, to find signs of Librada, his glep cougar that had freed herself before he could set her free. But Librada didn't eat carrion, and the few farmers and farm families Blacktooth had found had been mostly carrion. Several times he had watched as parties of the nomad horsemen, singing death songs and seated well forward on their ponies, had gone out into the trees, nervously at first, and then with growing confidence, finally with boredom. The countryside around New Rome had been stripped of its people. There were no warriors to fight, no women to rape, or even to be restrained from raping. Nothing but trees, dumber than horses and stiller than grass. The farmers, many of them of grasshopper origin, had deserted their farms, and whatever troops Hannigan II had left in the region to defend the city were gone as well. In fact, some said it was the troops that had driven the farmers away. An old man found wounded on his barn floor and brought back to the camp to die had told the Pope and his curia that it was the Texarch soldiers who had shattered his window glass and torched his fields and his neighbors as well. But Blacktooth thought he was lying, or at least partially lying. Truth was as rare as beauty in wartime. It occurred by accident in unexpected places, like the glint of sun off a button on a corpse. Pop, pop, pop. And now some action at last. Blacktooth felt like two men, one who dreaded the excitement and one who desired it, one brother who slipped eagerly down the hillside toward the milling horses, and one who held back, heels digging into soft dirt. He valued the hilltop because it carried him above or almost above the trees. Descending into them was like descending into a prison. Pop, pop, pop. One of the shots at least sounded real. Perhaps the Texarch main force had been located by a scouting party, and a battle was planned for the day. It would have to be to the east. As he half slipped and half walked down the hill, Blacktooth squinted out across the sun-bright ranks of trees. Beyond them was New Rome, within a day's ride at most. And beyond the city, also unseen, was the Great River, the Mispee, the grass-eaters called it. Blacktooth had dreaded the Crusades' arrival for months, but now he looked forward to it, even if it meant a battle. Much to his eternal regret, Blacktooth knew battle, and he knew that even worse than the fighting was the long waiting, the constant tension, and the heavy smells of men on the move. The camp smelled like shit and smoke. It smelled like Hilbert's fever, the bowel-emptying sickness that Blacktooth shared with at least a third of the men, nomad and Christian alike. The smell had thickened as the tall grass had turned to trees, as the world of empty sky had given way to a world folded in branches, hedged by trees. Darkness and mud and stumps and shit, in greater and greater profusion as the Pope's crusade approached New Rome. The Mother Church was coming home. Pop, pop, pop. 
Down in the camp, the huge night fire had been rekindled. Logs as big as corpses smoldered and smoked, as reluctant as corpses to flame back into life. Everything here in the woodlands was damp. The edge of his habit wet from the long grass, Blacktooth joined the milling crowd around the fire pit at the center of the camp. Horses and people and dogs made an uneasy mix. More warriors came from the smaller wild dog and grasshopper campfires, joined by the Kisok Dvi Vurdar and his personal guard. Nomad warriors were spitting into the fire and stomping and firing their imaginary shots toward the impenetrable gray of the sky. It looked like rain again. It had threatened rain now for a week. The grasshopper shaft, Eltur Braum, came out of the trees, holding up his repeating rifle, joined by a squat shaman in an intricate hat riding a white mule. Pop, pop, pop. Brown Pony was conspicuously absent, but a small contingent of his papal guard joined the party, leading uncomfortable-looking horses. Their rifles were identical to the ones the wild dog warriors carried. Blacktooth was surprised to see Abelot among them. Don't look so sad, your eminence, said the pudgy Valana student, holding a repeating rifle anything but sheepishly. Where are you going? Blacktooth asked, ignoring his old friend's sarcasm. To get a biscuit. Abelot gestured toward the morning wagon, where there was a line, all wild dog and grasshopper, or rather all men with guns. Come. Wushin, the axe, was in the morning wagon line, and he let Abelot and Blacktooth in beside him. This was, Blacktooth knew, acceptable practice among the nomads, who regarded every man as an extension of his friends and family. If a man was in line, his connections were in line as well. Morning, Axe. Good morning, Cardinal Nimi. Why so sad? Do I really look so sad? Blacktooth wondered. He shrugged. Perhaps it was the sickness. It seemed he had been sick for years, although he knew by the marks he had made on the inside of the hood wagon that it was only two weeks. Maybe it is war, he said. War makes men sad. Some men, said Abelot. He reached up under his long hair and touched, as if for luck, the little knob of gristle where his right ear had been sliced off by Texar cavalry. All men, said Axe. The line crept forward, feet sucking in the mud, which seemed to be always laying in wait, even under what looked like dry grass. Perhaps his eminence is mooning over his little lost cat said Abelot to Axe. She's not so little, said Blacktooth, and I wish you would stop calling me his eminence. Sorry, Cardinal, said Abelot. It was his turn. He took two biscuits and gave one to Blacktooth. Apparently they were distributing extra biscuits only to the men with rifles. Blacktooth took it grudgingly. Life was difficult enough without Abelot's continual sarcasm. He followed Axe and Abelot back to the fire, which was now blazing. It's a war party, said Avalot. The early patrols, wild dog, I think, entered the city yesterday. There was no resistance. Today we go in with Eltur Braum and his shaman. He nodded toward the old man on the white mule. Maybe we'll get to see the Basilica of St. Peter's. You're going? Blacktooth asked. With permission, along with most of the Pope's guard, said Avalot, glancing toward Wushin, the Pope's sergeant general, who shrugged. Wushin was staying behind with his master. Abelard held up his rifle, pumping it toward the sky, as the nomad warriors did. Pop, 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 he said, but not convincingly. He smiled, showing Blacktooth his bad teeth, and opened his hand, showing three brass shells. His greatness, the Scharf, didn't want to take us, but his holiness, Pope Amen II, insisted. We are his eyes and ears. And rifles, Blacktooth said. That, too. It was looking more and more like rain. Blacktooth secured his cardinal hat under the cover of the hood wagon. He was afraid the red would run if it did rain, and gathered up the morning pots and pans that had been left for him by Bitten Dog. His elevation as the crusade's tenth cardinal had not released him from his duties as assistant to the assistant pot scrubber, nor had it reduced the intensity or frequency of the fevers that raged through his body. A third of the camp, almost a thousand men, were sick. The rich smell of human excrement mixed with the usual camp smells of horse and smoke. The overall feeling was one of gloom. Maybe it will rain, Blacktooth thought, as loaded down with pots and pans, he stepped over and around the ubiquitous dog turds. Better rain than threatening rain. 
Impermeable to almost every kind of adversity, the nomad seemed to fold up in the rain. He finished the pots, scrubbing them with sand in the feeder creek that ran from under a slab out of a thousand-year-old drain. He took the long way back to the hood wagon between the Pope's carriage, like hell you will, and the gleaming metal wagons of Magister Dion's caravan, which had joined them two days before, where the long arms of the door prairies were merging into one narrower and narrower grassy swale, interrupted by pitchers of shattered concrete and stone. This morning was the first time Blacktooth had seen Dion's wagons up close in the daylight. They looked like stoves on wheels. Tanks, Avalot had called them, but who would carry water from the dry plains to the rainy east? They were clearly weapons of some kind. A glep was dozing on the seat of one of the wagons. When he saw Blacktooth, he smiled an idiot smile and crossed himself, laughing. Blacktooth thought the man was mocking him until he saw a brown pony standing with Dion almost out of sight behind one of the metal wagons. They seemed to be arguing, and Dion seemed to be getting the worst of it. Blacktooth couldn't see Brown Pony's face, but he recognized the slow hand movements of lawyerly persuasion passing into papal compulsion. The monk, now cardinal, turned away and hurried on toward the center of the campsite. He knew that he would be in trouble if Brown Pony saw him without his zucchetto. It was late afternoon before the rain finally came. The clouds that had been massing in the northwest all day, like riders on a hilltop, descended just when the grasshopper sharp's party was returning. There was no pop, pop, pop this time, no strutting horses. The warriors looked gloomy and damp. One of the horses carried double, and the white mule carried a corpse tied on like a pack and left uncovered in the rain. The side of the mule was pink with rain and blood. The sharp's shaman, Abelot said to Blacktooth, who was helping him dismount. He tried to hand the monk his rifle, but Blacktooth wouldn't take it. Texark troops? Abelot shrugged. Snipers, he said. They fired on us from the great houses. Great houses? Piles of stone, really, although some of them still have windows. We have the better guns, but we couldn't see them. We never saw any Texark troops. Four women untied the shaman and carried him away. The dogs were howling, straining at their leashes and jumping up to sniff the side of the white mule that was smeared with blood. They must have been Texark troops, said Blacktooth. I don't think so. There was a lot of fire, but they only hit two men, and we were all in the open. I was right behind the shaman when he fell. He was singing some Ouija's song, and they shot him through the throat. I think it was a lucky shot. Lucky, said Blacktooth. Lucky for someone, not so lucky for him. Abelot showed Blacktooth three empty cartridges nestled in his palm like little empty eggshells. I fired all three of my shots, though. I liked that part. Not like you. He was referring to Blacktooth's depression after killing the Glep warrior in the battle two days' march behind, at the edge of the grasslands almost a year before. I fired all three. Pop, pop, pop. It was Blacktooth's turn to shrug. I liked that part, Abelot insisted. Abelot had been more impressed with the city than with the fighting. The city of New Rome wasn't a hole in the ground like Danfer, he said, or a collection of shacks like Valana. It was mostly stone grown over with weeds and trees. The center of the city is all great houses. They mine them for stone and steel. They don't care about defending them either. What is there to defend? What can you carry off? You can't fight men who won't fight. They fought you, said Blacktooth. That wasn't fighting, said Abelot. There wasn't that much firing, even. They are hiding in the city, taking pot shots at us. Did you find the cathedral? Abelot shook his head. We rode out behind the scharf. Who will burn them out, he says, and toss their livers to the dogs? He smiled sardonically, gesturing behind him to the center of the camp, where the dismounted nomads were milling angrily, confused, ashamed. A wail came up from the women, tending the wounded man. The wounded man was dying. He had been shot in the side with a gun that fired stones. Blacktooth left Abelot for the medicine wagon where the wounded man was being bandaged. He was wondering if the Texarchs had managed to duplicate the repeating weapons yet, and he imagined that he might be able to tell from the man's wound. But the wound was just a wound and not a sign. It did not speak. The ugly welt cut through the nomad's flesh and hair like a road ripped heedlessly through grassland. In the back of the wagon, the grasshopper shaman's body was being prepared for burial. The old man's neck wound was already stuffed with clay the color of shaman's skin. Ashes to ashes, dirt to dirt. 
Both men would be carried out of the trees for burial under the haughty, uncaring glare of empty sky. But not until the rain had ended. The women and the medicine men shooed Cardinal Blacktooth away, even though he was wearing his zucchetto. The next day a smaller party went out while the grasshopper Warshaw met with the Kisach and the Pontiff. As a member of the Curia, Blacktooth was invited to take part in the discussion, after he had finished the pots and pans, of course, and freed Bitten Dog for a day of drinking mare wine and playing bones. Brown Pony's suspicion that the Emperor had withdrawn all his regular forces from the Holy City was confirmed when the rear guard of Eltur Brougham's war party came back with its only live captive, a farmer armed with a stone-firing musket. He had been dragged from one of the great houses, along with two of his colleagues who had not survived the ten-mile trip back to the Crusades' war camp. Under questioning, the grass-eater revealed that he and the other farmers had been driven from their homesteads into the city by the Texarch regulars, then armed with leftover weapons and stationed in the tallest ruins. They had been told that if they surrendered, they would be cruelly tortured by the anti-pope's wild dog, grasshopper, and jackrabbit fanatics. But that if they held out, they would be rescued by returning Texarch reinforcements from Hannigan City. Brown Pony doubted that the last part of this was true. So did the rest of his curia. As for the torture, the farmer died before he could be convinced that it was propaganda. Abelot thought it was a trap. But you think everything is a trap, Blacktooth reminded his friend. The two were sitting on the side of a wagon in the unfamiliar sunshine, listening to the interminable martial speeches of the nomads. Even though the speeches decided nothing, they had to be suffered by the Pope and his curia. Everything is, whispered the former Valana student. His long hair was smeared with grease and tied back to show his missing ear, a badge of honor. He held his repeating rifle between his legs. Though he was technically at least a member of the Papal Guard, he wore the bone earrings and hair bracelets of a wild dog horseman. He looked, Blacktooth thought, like a man who had avoided the trap of the Mother Church, only to fall into the trap of war. We can wait them out, Brown Pony was saying. His nomadic had gotten better, and he no longer needed Blacktooth as translator. If they were driven into the city, chances are they don't have enough food to last through the winter. The winter, said the grasshopper sharp. The winter is far away. Our women are far behind, and like the wild dogs, they are threatened by the motherless ones who strike from above the misery. Without the Ouija's, our medicine is weak, but our war power is strong. We must strike now while we can. We can take them with just a few men. We can burn them out. Grunts of pleasure and assent greeted these words. Wettened fingers were held up as if to confirm that the prevailing winds were from the west. The fingers were also, for the nomads, a signal of impending fire, of their willingness to watch the world burn. Amen the second stood, looking unusually ethereal and spiritual. When Blacktooth had seen him the day before, he had not realized how sick he looked. Brown Pony's hair was mostly gone. His face looked like something drawn on an egg, a bad egg. This is the holy city of New Rome, he said in measured church speak. It is sacred to the Mother Church. There will be no burning. We are here to take the city, not destroy it. He sat back down. There was grumbling as his words were translated into grasshopper and wild dog. The grumbling fell silent as the Kisok V. Vildar, the war shaft of the three hordes, stood to speak. We were going to faint south for Hannigan City, said Chur Hungen Usle. There is the heart of the Empire, not New Rome, which is nothing but a ruin. We will still head south, but now instead of fainting we can actually strike south. Now that we know there are few defenders in New Rome, we have more men to strike south at Hannigan City. The war will be over sooner. We can return to our women and our winter pastures. He spoke in Wild Dog with only a few words of Rocky Mount and none of church speak. Blacktooth thought it was ominous. The crusade was becoming less of a crusade and more a depredation of the three hordes. There were grunts and clicks of approval from the nomads as the Kisach sat down. He had a boy behind him to arrange his robes when he sat. Another watched the feathers on his headdress in case of wind. The numbers of the nomads had increased, so that now men, and a few women and children as well, stood on all sides of the wagon on which Blacktooth was sitting. 
It had turned from a meeting of the courier to a public meeting attended by warriors and drivers and hangers-on. That, too, seemed ominous. Cardinal Blacktooth St. George was feeling trapped. His bowels were grumbling like the crowd, and he began to look for an avenue of escape. A few hundred men left here will be enough to drive the farmers out of New Rome, said Elcure Brougham. Wuxin was shaking his head, but, as usual, remained silent. Brown Pony stood up to answer the shafts. He stumbled as he stood, and Blacktooth was surprised and a little shocked to see that he was wearing an empty shoulder holster over his cassock under his robe. Holding on to the side of a wagon, Pope Amen II made one last plea. We need the fighters here, he said. With a show of strength we can force the farmers out of the city without much fighting. Blacktooth knew that Brown Pony was trying to avoid a battle. He wondered if it were to save lives, or to avoid damage to the city and St. Peter's. As soon as he asked himself the question, he knew the answer. Lives were cheap. The Pope sat down, seemingly unnoticed. There was no grumbling. He was not even granted the honor of dissent. The power Blacktooth had watched him exercise over the conclave in Valana was gone. Perhaps it was the meltdown, or perhaps his rhetoric was useless with the warshafts and their warriors, who excelled at oratory when they wanted, but were not in the mood for talk these days. Or perhaps it was the trees. They seemed almost evil. There were so many of them crowding in on every side. Blacktooth touched the cross that rode under his habit, and called up, as he did when he was panicked, the image of St. Leibowitz. But instead of the dubious smile of St. Isaac Edward, he saw the harsh glare of the desert sun, and he felt a sudden wave of homesickness so powerful it almost knocked him off the wagon bed. "'What's the matter?' whispered Abelot. "'Are you okay?' "'Are you?' answered Blacktooth. The warriors on the edge of the crowd were starting to make the pop, pop, pop. They were tired of waiting around for battle. Neither did they wish to ride into a city where the defenders were shooting at them from the windows of great houses. They're going to burn them out, no matter what his holiness says, said Avalot. Where are you going? Elchua Braum had risen to speak again. Blacktooth slipped away through the crowd toward the main trench, which was, even at this hour, even with all the excitement of the debate, busy with grunting men. When he got back to the campfire, it was too crowded to get close. The grasshopper shaft was still speaking. Blacktooth's fever was raging, and he felt weak. He dragged himself off to the back of the hood wagon and rolled up on a blanket and went to sleep. In the distance he could hear drumming and the marshal's celebratory pop, pop, pop. That night, while Blacktooth slept, Amen the First came to visit him for the first time in over a week. The old man had the face of a cougar. Had he always had the face of a cougar, Blacktooth wondered in his dream? But of course. And Idria was there. She was sitting beside Specklebird, smiling, riding a white horse like the Fuji-Go. But no, her robe was open, and what he had thought was a white horse was the light coming from the gateway he had once... Someone was shaking him, pulling his foot. It was Avalot. We are leaving, he said. Leaving? Who is leaving? Blacktooth groaned and sat up. Avalot was outside the wagon, leaning in. His face was painted. His greasy hair was pinned back. Beyond him, Blacktooth could see the sky, a metal gray. He could hear horses stamping and men cursing and laughing, in the near distance, dogs. They'd been up all night, said Avalot. After you went to bed, there was another conference, but this was among the shafts. The Pope was sent away. Sent away? Wuxin was allowed to listen, but he was thrown out when he disagreed. Blacktooth was amazed. No one threw axe out of anything. Thrown out? Blacktooth was still woozy, half in and half out of his cougar dream. As he sat up, he realized with a sudden and unusual moment of clarity that his entire life since leaving the Abbey, since he had met Brown Pony, in fact, had had the quality of a dream. So why was it that Specklebird, instead of Brown Pony, came to him in his dreams? Brown Pony was in the real dream. Avalot grinned and shrugged. Not exactly thrown out, then, but asked to leave. Blacktooth got out of the wagon. The rain clouds that had rode across the sky for days had disappeared, and the camp was almost as bright as day, even though the sun hadn't yet risen. They are leaving only a few men from each horde, about three hundred in all, Apollot said too loudly. The rest are heading south with the Kisak Driverdar to take Hannigan City. I'm going with them. But you are in the Papal Guard. 
the Pope's guard is going, all except Wushin. Besides, the Pope didn't give me these. Abelot opened his hand. In his palm were three empty shell casings had nested the night before. Now there were six, and each was filled. Each had a dark bullet peeping out of one end as though eager to be on its way. Goodbye, then, Blacktooth said angrily. Wrapping his robe around him against the morning chill, he half walked, half ran toward the latrine trench. As he squatted through the bushes, he could see hundreds of men stirring, grumbling, dressing, farting, laughing. Pop, pop, pop. Some were pulling at dogs, some at horses. The pall that had fallen over the camp in the last few days, the pall of rain and forest, was lifting even as the skies brightened toward the east. Almost a thousand warriors were crossing the creek, many of them slapping the sides of the metal wagons to hear them ring. He's taking all the healthy men, Blacktooth muttered to himself. There aren't that many healthy men, said the man at the trench beside him, who sounded and smelled very unhealthy. And I'm not that healthy, and I'm going. He spoke in wild dog. Before Blacktooth could answer, he was off and running, barely wiping. Through the shrubs that cloaked the latrine, Blacktooth watched the horses cross the creek, and then crawled back into his bed. It would be an hour or so before breakfast, and he wanted to get some rest. He searched for Idria and Amen through his dream, but it was like prowling through an abandoned house, empty even of furniture. When he woke again, his fever was back. He sat up, dazed. He could see by the sound on the wagon's hood that it was almost noon. "'Your eminence,' said Bitten Dog, "'His holiness and whatever his eminence the Pope wants to see you. Brown Pony, he wants your butt in his Pope wagon right away.' Brown Pony had stopped shaving, but it had hardly changed his appearance. There wasn't much left of his beard, just a few wisps of hair on his chin. Some were dark and some were light, giving him the look of a sketch that had been abandoned. He was finishing his breakfast of horse meat jerky and plums when Blacktooth found him at a small table that had been set in the shade of the papal wagon. Nimi, he said, where is your Zoketo? I have a commission for you. As a soldier? Blacktooth answered. He was ready to refuse. As an ambassador, Brown Pony said, ignoring the novice cardinal's sarcasm. As the papal legate to the farmers, they are all that is left in the city. Hannigan's troops have abandoned the place and left them there to fight. We could have avoided the fight altogether by peacefully slipping a thousand men into New Rome. A thousand nomads are not peaceful, Your Holiness, replied Blacktooth. And besides, the farmers have shown an inclination to fight. True. Perhaps you're right, Brown Pony said. Perhaps this is all for the best. We have only three hundred men anyway, mostly the grasshopper. The Pope waved an astonishingly skinny arm around at the camp, which looked deserted in the harsh daylight, like a dream only half remembered. Brown Pony looked weaker than Blacktooth had ever seen him. Surely he thought it was the meltdown. Nunshorn, the night hag, was claiming her husband, calling him to her cold bed. The Warshoff of the Three Hordes, the Kisak Driverdar, our old friend and companion, Kyur Isla Hingen, has taken almost a thousand of my crusaders south to Hannigan City. Even Magister Dion and the new Jerusalemites have gone with him. They intend to join the jackrabbit warriors and the gleps that are preparing to besiege the city, and instead of a siege we will have a battle. Brown Pony sat down wearily. Perhaps it is all for the best. Not so, said Wushin. My sergeant-general disapproves, said Brown Pony. But what does it matter? It is done. The Pope's hands fluttered in the air like two birds. Blacktooth watched, intrigued. With that motion this most worldly of men suddenly reminded him of Amen the First. I'm sick anyway, Blacktooth said. We're all sick, said Brown Pony. Except for Wu Shin, of course. Where is your hat, Nimi? Here. Blacktooth pulled his red cardinal Zucchetto from his robe. I don't wear it around the camp. It might blow off my head and fall into the dog shit. No wind here, said Wu Xin, who disapproved of Blacktooth's attitude toward his master. Oh, yes, the dogs, said the Pope distractedly. We get to keep the dogs. The Kisak didn't want to take them on the campaign south. 
We have been left with three hundred men and almost as many dogs. And the grasshopper shaft, of course. The farmers don't know this. Not yet. What I want you to do is go into the city, Nimi, and make them an offer of peace. Extend to them my offer of peace. The Pope's hand in peace. Before they discover your numbers have been reduced, Blacktooth said scornfully. Why, yes. Wear your hat and your robes. I will give you a papal seal to carry. They will shoot me before they see it. Put it on a stick, said Wushin. Blacktooth could see from the yellow warrior's eyes that he wasn't going to be allowed to refuse the mission. He resigned himself to it. He was curious to see the city anyway, and sick to death of pots and pans. So what if he got killed? Wasn't that bound to happen sooner or later anyway? You look very sick, Cardinal Nimi, said Wushin, his voice almost gentle. Tell the farmers that we wish them no harm. We want to settle things peacefully. The Empire has deserted them, but not the Vicar of Christ. And don't mention that the Vicar of Christ is down to three hundred men and as many dogs, Blacktooth said. I will overlook your insolence, since it has never been an impediment to your vocation. Indeed, Nimi, sometimes I think it is your staff. I hope for your sake it is not your crutch. Better get going, though. This has to be done today, or at least attempted. I have to walk. Elchul Brougham has a white mule you can use, said Brown Tony, and God go with you, Nimi. He made the sign of the cross and allowed Blacktooth to kiss his ring. The grassy swale had been a highway a thousand years before, and now it was a highway again. The muddy tracks of wagons crisscrossed in the grass. Who knew how many years this door prairie had pointed like an arrow from the plains into the forest and then to the city, or, Blacktooth thought, the other way. Though the monk had never thought much of the Pope's plans to return the papacy to New Rome, lately the holy city had been appearing to him in his dreams. It had arrived with the fever. In the dreams it beckoned on the distant horizon like small steep mountains. How different was the reality! There was no horizon at all. The road ran straight between trees and low ruins that were just mounds of earth, some with openings where they were mined, others barricaded where some pitiful creature had chosen an intact basement or a mined-out room as a cave. The farmsteads were smaller here, close to the city, usually just a weedy vegetable patch and a ruined building or two, perhaps a shed emptied of pigs and chickens. Just when Blacktooth had given up all hope of seeing New Rome, just when he least expected it, the road topped a small rise, and there it was, just as it had always been in his dream. Whoa! Blacktooth needn't have bothered. The white mule only moved when he got on, and only stopped when he got off. He slid down, and the mule stopped to nose at skunk cabbages beside the road. They were at a turn. The road went at an angle down the last hill before the valley of the Great River, or Mispee, as it was called locally. Blacktooth couldn't see the river, but he could see the distant towers of what once had been a bridge, and he could see a low line of tree-covered bluffs on the other side, like a mirror image of the hill he was on. And in between, a few miles away, were steep brush-covered stumps of towers, like low, steep mountains, just as he had seen them in his dream. New Rome. But it was already afternoon, and there was no time to enjoy the view, even if it was the first horizon Blacktooth had seen in almost a month. He got back on the sharp shaman's white mule, and it started down the hill, and soon they were in the trees again. There was more concrete and asphalt here mixed with the grass. It would have made for treacherous passage on a horse, but the mule seemed unbothered. There were fewer farmsteads and more houses, even though the houses were just sheds attached to the sides of the ruins. Blacktooth even saw smoke coming from one or two, and shadowy shapes that could have been children playing or their parents hiding. Gee up! he said to the mule, just to hear his own voice, and to let whoever might be watching know that he was in control and on a mission. He wished now he had bothered to learn the mule's name. It was late afternoon before he passed the gates of the city, a low barricade now abandoned. A couple of corpses in the sentry box showed how the nomads had avenged their murdered shaman, and how little the grass-eaters cared about their dead. Of course, the corpses might have been Texarch soldiers, Two pigs were rooting at the door, seemingly eager to find out. Gee up! 
The white mule stepped over the rubble, and Blacktooth rode on through, holding up Amen the Second's papal seal. It was made of parchment stretched over sticks like a kite, and held aloft on a spear decorated with feathers and the cryptic symbols of the three hordes. An amalgam of the sacred and the profane, the civilized and the barbaric, like Brown Pony's papacy itself. There were more pigs on the street here, though there were no bodies. New Rome seemed deserted. The streets were straight and wide. The great houses Blacktooth had seen from the horizon were less impressive up close, but more oppressive somehow, dark ruins shot full of holes. There was no movement. Blacktooth knew he was being watched, though. He could feel it. He could feel more and more eyes on him as it got darker and darker. Whoa, he said, but the mule didn't stop. Ahead Blacktooth saw a single figure in the center of the street. It was a man carrying a rifle. Gee up! Blacktooth kicked his mule, but the mule walked at the same slow pace, whether kicked or not. Wait! Blacktooth shouted at the man, but the man backed slowly into the shadows. I have a message! Blacktooth shouted just as the man knelt and fired. Blacktooth slid off the mule, which was the only way to stop it. He waited behind the mule for another shot. The silence was excruciating. The man was gone. The dialogue was too one-sided. His only chance, Blacktooth saw, was to push on toward the center of the city and hope that he came across someone with either some sense or some authority, and preferably both, before he got shot. He got back on the mule. Gee up! It was dark when they shot the mule out from under him. Blacktooth was almost in the center of the city, under the biggest of the great houses. It must have been a long shot, because the animal went down before Blacktooth heard the shot. The crack came rolling through just as he was falling on his side, under the mule, which fell as heavily as an abbot having a stroke. Blacktooth scrambled to his feet, looking for the papal seal on a stick, which had snapped and was lying half under the mule. He was tensed through his shoulders, waiting for the next shot, which he knew he wouldn't hear and might not even feel. It never came. With the papal seal he ran back into the rubble of the great house, where he hid under a stone slab. From here he could see down the street both ways. It was almost dark. The sky was a salmon pink turning to rose in the west, and a darker blue ahead in the east. The mule was on its side, braying violently. It wasn't bleeding much, but clearly it was done for. Its front legs were kicking, but the rear legs were still, maybe spine-shot. Blacktooth felt his fever growing, and then a fit of diarrhea hit him, and he squatted behind the stone slab. Should he hold the papal seal aloft, or did it just make him a better target? Not now, he prayed aloud, not like this. Finished, and still not shot, he decided to continue on with his mission. He had to find someone, and soon, before it got dark. Otherwise he would be sleeping alone in the dark in one of these great piles of stone. Holding the papal seal aloft, he started walking. He knew he was still feverish because he could sense Amen the First beside him, his cougar face composed and quiet, free of concern as well as anxiety. Amen had nothing to say. Lately he had had little to say. The problem was the mule wouldn't shut up. It kept braying louder and louder the farther Blacktooth walked away from it. I have to go back, he said to Amen. He knew the old man couldn't, wouldn't answer but he wanted to hear the sound of a human voice, even if it was just his own. "'I'll do for him what he did for the glept soldier,' he said aloud. "'It'll be a sin, too, just the same.' "'A sin, but he had to do it. Wasn't that what a sin was, something you had to do?' "'No, that's duty,' replied Specklebird, with his unquiet, ambiguous smile. "'You have often confused them.' It was a long way back to the white mule, and Blacktooth's legs were getting wobbly. He walked backward, holding the seal high, his shoulders tensed against the shot he expected. The mule was almost quiet by the time he got to it. The braze had turned to hoarse, honking moans. The front legs were still kicking rhythmically. The big eyes looked at Blacktooth with neither curiosity nor fear. Blacktooth knelt and said a prayer, a made-up one, as he put his knife to the creature's throat, and said a second prayer as he pulled it across. It was like pulling a string and watching the grain flow out of a bag. The mule sank in with sudden, quiet restfulness. Blacktooth wiped his knife on the mule's coat. He was about to stand when he felt the knife on his own throat. 
Stand, said a voice, and he did what he had been about to do anyway. He started to drop his knife when a hand took it from his. Grass eater, he thought, but perhaps he said it aloud, for someone hit him from behind, almost knocking him down. There was the smell, the grass eater smell. There were too many hands, he thought perhaps it was a glep, and then realized that it was two men who held him, and a third who picked up his papal seal from the ground where he had laid it before taking out his knife to cut the mule's throat. They marched him back down the street, the steps he had retraced to kill the mule. He felt a gun prodding him through his cassock. As he passed the corner where he had turned back, he thought, why hadn't they taken him here? Had they been waiting for him to come back? I have a message for your leader, he said, from his holiness, amen, too. I am his papal— Shut up, said one of the men, in a tongue Blacktooth recognized as a variant of Grasshopper. He was taken into a basement room that reminded him of the library at the Abbey. It was lit by oil lamps, and several men were inside, armed with iron swords and old rifles. Most of them were dressed in rags, but one wore the jacket of Hannigan's Texarc cavalry. He spoke to Blacktooth in church-speak. "'Are you sick?' was his first question. "'You smell bad.' "'I come from His Holiness the Pope with a message for your leader,' said Blacktooth. "'We are all sick. We all smell bad. There are thousands of sick, bad-smelling warriors, bloodthirsty nomads on the outlying reaches of the city preparing to strike. I am here to give you a chance to—' "'Shut up!' said the Texarch soldier. He nodded at one of the other men, a farmer, who handed Blacktooth a cup of water and a handful of brown pills that looked like rabbit pellets. "'Take one,' the soldier said. Blacktooth smelled the pills. He shook his head. "'Take one!' A gun prodded him in his back. Blacktooth took one. "'I am here to give you a chance to surrender the holy city peacefully,' he said. "'The empire is finished. The papacy is returning to New Rome.' The Pope, His Holiness, Amen, too, wants only to occupy his rightful place in the— Shut up, I know who you are. I am His Holiness, Amen, too. We know who you are. The Archbishop sent us word to look for you, the Texarch soldier said. He unrolled a scroll that had already been untied. Are you not Blacktooth St. George, secretary to the anti-Pope, and banished under sentence of death to the far reaches of the Bay Ghost and the Nadian? Blacktooth was at a loss for a reply. A gun prodded him in his back. Say, I am. And what's that hat? Military? I am a cardinal, Blacktooth said. Suddenly the seriousness and the ridiculousness of it all struck him simultaneously. The enterprise had been foolish, perhaps even the crusade. Now here he was, back in the Hannigan Zoo. A joke, really. Cardinal, Pope. Soldier! The pill was making him dizzy. He wondered if he should take another. We have orders to shoot you, said the Texarch officer, rolling the scroll back up tightly and tying it with a ribbon. But first you should get some rest. The pills will help you sleep. Take him to the death cells. It was cool under the street. By standing on tiptoe through a barred window, Blacktooth could see an alleyway and an occasional dog or pig. The pigs wearing medallions that identified Blacktooth presumed their owners. One pig was especially friendly. It kept coming back and sticking its nose into the bars, perhaps for the coolness of the iron. As darkness fell, Blacktooth felt his fever subside, like a stream sinking into the sand. The chamber pot on the corner of his cell waited empty like the pig. The guard came just after midnight with a jug of water but no food. Blacktooth took another pill. This time they were going to shoot him, and he had little doubt that they would keep their promise. Somehow the thought of it made him drowsy. That night again he dreamed of Idria. She was waiting for him under the waterfall while his old friend, the white mule, grazed on the rocks outside. There was no grass, but it sprung up as the mule ate. It had a hole in its throat like a wound, and Idria had wounds too. She showed her wounds to Blacktooth. Where have you been? she asked in church-speak. Where are you going? Since he knew she didn't speak church-speak, he knew in the dream that he was dreaming. Chapter 30 In the reception of the poor and of pilgrims, the greatest care and solicitude should be shown, because it is especially in them that Christ is received. 
For as far as the rich are concerned, the very fear which they inspire wins respect for them. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 50 That night, while Blacktooth was dreaming, a small party of farmers mounted their horses, most of them draft plugs, and rode toward the camp of the Pope's crusade. These were the farmers who had survived after seeing their families and livestock killed by the Texarch soldiers. Now they wanted revenge, and the only one they could get it on was the Antipope, whose armies their scouts had told them were heading south toward Hannigan City and the Red River. They knew that Blacktooth was lying. They had seen only one party of raiders, had wounded one and killed another. They wanted what the grasshopper and wild dog nomads wanted. They wanted blood and revenge. It was late September, and there was no moon. They left forty riders in all soon after dark, counting on the starlight and their knowledge of the road. It was, after all, the road they had ridden in on. It was the road that led to their abandoned and ruined farms. The Pope, meanwhile, was beginning to lose all hope for peace. The grasshopper warriors were excited and eager for blood after the long and loud funeral for the shaman. Many of them were drunk, and though the ceremony had been hidden from his eyes, Brown Pony suspected many more had fed on the shaman's liver and lights. "'You must understand my emissary has ridden into the city to make peace,' he said to Elcure Braum. "'You mean Nyenden, Nimi?' "'My cardinal,' said Brown Pony, "'a member of my curia.' "'Cardinal Nimi, then,' said the grasshopper shark. He sat on the tailgate of the Pope's wagon beside His Holiness, watching the whooping, weeping warriors around the main campfire. It was a novelty to the nomads, unlimited firewood, even if it was damp. The blaze grew bigger and bigger. They seek revenge, said Elchur Braum. Can you blame them? Can I deny them? They need it. It is like grass for ponies. The victory of the church will be their revenge, said Brown Pony. But even as he said it, he knew he didn't believe it himself. The muddy ground was crowded with moving shadows. The sky was scratched with trees. Brown Pony yearned for the harsh outlines and open horizons of the grasslands and the desert. Here in the forest, the noises and smells were too close. Pop, pop, pop. The warriors pointed their rifles at the sky, barely visible as a smattering of stars behind the trees. The grasshopper Scharf had managed to keep only two shells apiece for them, but he knew that Brown Pony had more, left with him as a concession from the stores in Magister Dion's wagon train. "'You must give the men the rest of the brass bullets, Your Holiness,' Demon Light added with a faint smile. Amen the second shook his head. "'They must wait until my emissary comes back. Then your warriors can ride in in triumph. In fact, Brown Pony was already worried. He knew that if Blacktooth had not returned by morning, it would mean he had probably been killed, perhaps even hanged under the interdict they had both signed when they had been released from the zoo in Hannigan City. Tomorrow, then, said Elchur Braum. He looked up at the tree-hedged, moonless sky. The Pope took the Sheriff's arm. And you must control them, he said. Across the clearing, in the firelight's gleam, he could see the sheriff's carriage with eye-set fires painted on the door. There will be no fires, demon light. The farmers will surrender when they see your force. They may have already surrendered to Nimi. I think not, your holiness. I want no fires in New Rome. I am here to restore the city, not to destroy it. The Pope twisted the sheriff's arm. It was like arm-wrestling. The point was not to defeat him, but simply to show that he knew and understood nomad ways. No fires understood. Understood, said Elchua Braum, pulling his arm loose and stalking off to join his warriors at the fire. I have unleashed a storm that I cannot control, said the Pope, retiring into the wagon and arranging his robes for sleep. He was speaking to Wuxin, who stood in the shadows beside the wagon. The yellow warrior shrugged. That was, as far as he was concerned, the nature of all storms and all wars. The Pope was asleep when the farmers came. They had dismounted and were leading their horses across the creek when the dogs awoke and awoke the warriors who were sleeping it off around the dying campfires. The fighting was brief and vicious, 
and except for the screams and the splashing, almost silent. The grasshoppers were reluctant to use their few bullets, but eager to try the knives and clubs that slept by their sides, where women might have been. When dawn came, the water was still bloody in the little pools along the shore. Death by the knife is a messy, lingering business. Some of the farmers still flopped like fish. Four of them were captive, uninjured except for the rawhide cord passed through their cheeks. They sat tethered in the shade of the food wagon, one whimpering, the others waiting stolidly for whatever awaited them. The pontiff awakened to find his camp almost deserted. The grasshopper warriors were gone, so were their horses and the dogs. You said you were going to wait, he complained, finding Eltur Braum by his fire eating breakfast. They gave us no choice, the war sharp shrugged. They tried to steal our horses. Brown Pony kicked the fire. They were only a few fools. You could have chased them off. Eltur Braum shrugged again. The dogs followed them. My men had to follow the dogs. They are under orders not to burn the city, though. Brown Pony didn't believe him. And before noon the smoke was rising over the wall of trees to the east, from the city he had never seen. The pig came in the morning, but the jailer didn't. She stuck her snout between the cool bars and sat, staring down at Blacktooth, who was trying unsuccessfully to pray. As the morning dragged on, Blacktooth heard shots in the distance, shouts closer, the scuffling of feet in the narrow street outside. He still had six of the little pills, but nothing to take them with. He was afraid of the warm water in the bucket by the door, so he took one with the last of his own spit. Toward noon he drank the water. Already hungry when he was locked in the cell, he grew hungrier. It was hard to tell time because there was no sun and it was raining, a gentle shower that spattered onto the alleyway all day, muddling the footsteps of the occasional passer-by, always a dog, never a human. The pig came again in the afternoon, or what seemed to be the afternoon. Blacktooth kept the pills in his cardinal hat, which his captors had allowed him to keep, along with his cross and rosary. The Zucchetto kept the little brown pills dry. They seemed to work. The fever was gone, and Blacktooth didn't miss the cramps and the runs that had kept him busy, especially in the mornings, for days. But he felt lonely without the visions of Idria and Amen the companions who had walked by his side and accompanied him not only through his dreams, but through the interminable waking dream that seemed lately to be his life. Blacktooth had never felt so alone. He remembered with a certain affection Brown Pony and the prison zoo in Hannigan City, when they had been spied on by the wild dog prisoner and observed by the amused citizens. He remembered brooding, taciturn Wooshin. He remembered the insolent, chubby Abelot, failed contemplative and lover of cities. He missed them all. He missed even singing cow. From his solitary basement cell, Blacktooth looked back on the life at the Abbey of St. Leibowitz, and wondered at the cunning and perfect mix of solitude and companionship that was the monastic life. Some men were made for solitude, but not most, and certainly not he. Specklebert had loved his solitude because he filled it with spirit. He was never alone. Idria's solitude had been spook solitude, accepted by none, scorned by all, desired by one. The two of them in their solitude had kept Blacktooth company, but then he thought, I don't require much in the way of company. Right, he asked the pig when she stuck her head between the bars again, and like Idria, like Amen, she returned no answer. By afternoon no food had come and the rain had stopped. Was there to be no last meal? To die seemed bad enough, and to die hungry seemed the final, the ultimate insult. Would he then be hungry forever? Shocked at his own impiety, Blacktooth fell to his knees and prayed for forgiveness. The door was heavy wood, probably oak. It seemed more substantial than the black iron bars on the little high window. Blacktooth knocked on the door, then kicked it, timidly at first, then harder and harder. There was no response. He couldn't tell if anyone was out there or not. And what was out there? A hallway? He couldn't remember. It had been dark when he was brought in. That had been only a day ago, hadn't it? Blacktooth wished now that he had made marks on the whitewashed stone walls as the previous occupants had done. 
There was nothing in his little cell but the bed, which was two boards laid over stone blocks, a coarse wool blanket, a stool, and two buckets, one by the door and one in a corner. The bucket of warm water by the door was still almost full. The bucket in the corner was still empty. The room had apparently been used as a prison by the Texarchy before. The walls were filled with intricate but illiterate scratchings. Faces, smiles, and frowns, a sun, various interpretations of the male and female body. The wall looked to Blacktooth like the surface of a monk's brain, the scratchings on the soul that a man learns to live with, and usually, hopefully, eventually, to ignore. He sat on the bed. He lay on the bed. He stood at the window. He stood on the stool and looked out the window. He saw a narrow, deserted alley with a ruined step against a wall where there was no door. There were bloodstains on the wall above the step. While Blacktooth watched, a dog came and sniffed at the stain, then walked away. Was this the end of it, then? The killing place? The stairs that went nowhere, the wall without a door? He shivered. He was very hungry. In the distance the street opened onto another busier street, and Blacktooth could see people passing, carrying mysterious packages or occasionally guns. The ones with guns walked in twos and threes. Closer at hand, another dog sniffed at the stained steps in the alley, then trotted away. That's where they execute. Blacktooth turned and saw that the door to his cell had opened silently. Beyond it was an indeterminate darkness. For such a huge door it swung on silent hinges. An unfamiliar farmer guard stood in the doorway with a bucket, young in his rude twenties, red-headed, a grass-eater. You're not supposed to be up there, he said. I'm praying. What about your hat? The Zucchetto was on the bed. We don't wear the hat to pray. The guard crossed to the corner and picked up the bucket. He set it down again when he felt that it was empty. He carefully avoided looking into it. I'm supposed to empty this, he said. It was a reproach. I suppose that means I'm supposed to fill it, Blacktooth said. But aren't you supposed to bring me food? I had no supper and now no breakfast. The farmer guard shrugged. He wore leather pants and a canvas vest, probably taken from some soldier's locker, or body. His teeth were gone bad already. They didn't tell me anything about food. They only told me to empty this and bring the water. Are they going to shoot me? asked Blacktooth. He felt dizzy. He had to step down off the stool. When he looked up, feet on the cold stone floor, the guard was gone, almost as if he had been an apparition. The door closed, then a bolt slammed shut, loudly. "'Bless you, my son,' said Blacktooth, making the sign of the cross. "'I'll go back to my prayers.' He stood back up on the stool and looked out of the world, or what little of it he could see from his tiny window. Prayers indeed. But what else was prayer but an attempt to look out of the tiny window of the soul? Perhaps he would try to pray later, as it got closer to the time for his execution. Would it hurt, he wondered. It seemed to be the wrong question, but he couldn't think of the right one. Another dog came by and sniffed at the dark stain on the step, also praying. In the distance an old woman and a child poked through rubbish with a stick. When the woman turned up something, the child would lean down to get it. Blacktooth couldn't tell what they were collecting. There were more shots in the distance than a strange and yet familiar wild smell. Even before Blacktooth realized what it was, his heart was pounding. Smoke. You told your men to set the fires, the Pope Amen II said to Eltua Braum. Demon like denied it, but Brown Pony knew better. The grasshopper is always at war. I set fires. And what did it matter if he denied or affirmed it? It was done. Brown Pony and the Scharf were sitting on the bed of a wagon, watching the returning warriors thunder across the creek. It was beginning to rain again. Brown Pony couldn't see the sky, but he knew from his courier, half of whom were sick and spent time at the secondary latrine halfway up the hill, that a curtain of smoke hung over the city a few hours' ride to the east. Fires just happen, said Elcure Brougham. No man can prevent them. No man should. Dogs barked, horses neighed. 
The nomads were straggling back in twos and threes, calling to the women to prepare bandages and food and replenish the firewood stacks. They were shouting triumphantly, but in truth they had had few encounters with the mysterious enemy. The few wounded had been injured when their horses had stumbled in the unfamiliar streets, or had burned themselves setting fires. None knew still how many defenders the city had, or even if it was being defended at all. And Blacktooth had never returned. It was almost sunset. Perhaps she has found the peace you robed ones always say you are looking for, said Ilkua Braum. Perhaps, replied Brown Pony, choosing to ignore the nomad's sarcasm. But he doubted it. Smoke. It was getting dark. Or was it? The few people Blacktooth could see at the end of the street were running. He got down from the window and banged on the oak door. He put his ear to the wood, but he couldn't hear footsteps or voices. It was a strange place, this room at the end of Blacktooth's life. It reversed normal life, which we go through always looking backward. Now it was the past that was the mystery. Blacktooth could see clearly into the future, too clearly. He could smell it. It filled the air like smoke. He was afraid he would panic, and he did. It wasn't the fear of fire or even the fear of dying. It was just panic. Pure animal panic. It filled him, rushing in unbidden, with no thought or emotion intervening. As sudden and as irresistible as lust, which he had grown to know so well, it both comforted and terrified him with its intensity. Like the faith he had searched for but never found, it replaced all doubt with certainty. Blacktooth let it rage, kicking and beating on the door, shouting first, Fire, then help, then for the love of God. It brought no peace. The pain of his bruised fist and his own screams brought him back to a different reality, a more monk-like reality. He stopped screaming, surprised at how easy it was to stop, and knelt by the bed with his rosary. The smoke was thicker, but the air was still breathable. Blacktooth was no longer hungry. The water in the water bucket was dancing, and in the distance he could hear dull booms, buildings falling or bombs going off. He must have fallen asleep. He sat up and saw that it was still dark outside the window. In the distance he could hear shooting. The farmer guard was standing in the open door with the bucket. He wore a scarf over his face. For the smoke, it seemed to have diminished. Blacktooth started coughing. Excuse me, he said when he had stopped. The guard farmer still stood in the doorway. What's happening? Blacktooth asked. They are fighting. Your anti-pope is burning the city. Ah! Then he was gone. He never returned. Whether he was killed or not, Blacktooth never knew. The shooting never got closer, and it eventually faded away. When dawn came, it was a strange dawn that seemed to come from inside the cell rather than outside, filling the tiny basement room with an eerie light. The city was on fire. The wind was scouring the alley, picking up bits of straw and grass and dust and scraps of ash and paper. Blacktooth banged on the door, but he didn't scream this time. He didn't expect anyone to come, and no one did. The fire seemed to be getting closer. The wind was hot, as if it were pulled through one fire on the way to feed another. Blacktooth stood as long as he could at the bars and felt his face burning, then realized he had forgotten the pills. There were four left folded in the hat. He took one and poured the last of his water over his head. Death by fire. He could smell fuel oil. He recognized the smell from when he was a novice, handling the abbey's relics for the first and last time. Beatus Liebowitz ora pro me. He heard footsteps in the alley. Help! he called out, but no one came. Not even the pig who had probably been eaten. Blacktooth said his rosary, then put on his zucchetto and lay down on the narrow plank bed on top of the jail blanket. Better to just wait, he thought. Sooner or later the end will come. A dewdrop, a flash of lightning, Amen had said. Ash, dust. He must have fallen asleep, for soon he was back at the waterfall with Idria. The water had stopped falling, though. It stood like a sheet in the sun. She was standing in it in the sun, very wonderfully, beautifully, perfectly naked. Hey! she was shouting. Hey! Blacktooth sat up. Someone was at the bars. He thought at first it was the pig, but it was a woman with a child. 
Are you a priest? No. So what's the hat? It was the old woman he had seen with the stick going through the trash piles. I am a cardinal, he said, taking it off. What's a cardinal? she asked, reversing the syllables as simple people sometimes did. Is that like a priest? Sort of, Blacktooth said. Help me out of here. I'm afraid I got myself trapped. I can't do that, the old woman said. Will you baptize my son? She pushed her face to the window. The boy looked too young to be her son and too old at the same time. He was bald and his wrinkled forehead was blue. A glep. I can't do that, Blacktooth said. I'm not a real priest. He's not my real son, the old woman cackled. I bought him. Bought me, said the glep boy. I commensurate the deception. Am. What? A bell was ringing somewhere, faster and faster. Then Blacktooth heard the spray of shots. It was being rung with bullets. He's very strong, said the woman. Strong, said the glep. Accurate am I the exception. He says all you have to do is move this brick. What brick? The woman stood up and made a scraping noise with her stick. With a fierce, demented grin, the boy pulled a bar loose, then another. Strong! He threw both bars into the cell at Blacktooth, who ducked. They rang on the floor with the sound of bells. Hey! Blacktooth flattened himself against the wall. Had the bars been loose all along? The jail was like the abbey. All he had to do was walk out, and he was free. He waited until he was sure the old woman and the glep boy were gone. Then he pushed his zucchetto and the jail blanket through the bars and climbed after them into the alley. The air was thick with smoke, and he held his sleeve over his nose. It had been easier to breathe in the basement jail. At one end of the street he saw the woman and the boy poking through garbage unconcernedly, as if the world were not on fire. They seemed to have forgotten him. "'Bless you, my son,' he whispered, and walked quickly the other way. Chapter 31 On the day they returned, let them lie prostrate on the floor of the oratory, and beg the prayers of all on account of any faults that may have surprised them on the road. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 67 Blacktooth had seen only two cities in his day. Valana, built of wood and stone, and Hannigan City, made of wood and mud. The holy city in New Rome was a city built of old pieces of old cities. It was a mixture of old and new, more like an abbey than a city, with piles of brick and stone built upon piles of brick and stone, all mixed and leavened with wood and grass and straw, all flammable, all tinder, and it seemed to Blacktooth all burning. He was on a wide straight street with mounds of rubble and stumps of towers, the great houses on both sides. At first he was alone, but as he walked farther east into the rising sun and away from the fire, the street became more and more crowded with frightened, silent people. Blacktooth felt an unexpected, unwanted kinship with these frightened grass-eaters who were suddenly emerging from basements and the stumps of buildings, just as he had, dragging their pitiful rags and remnants and pots and animals and children with them. Everyone was leaving the city. In the distance behind him he heard shots, rare and ragged. If there were any fighting nomads in the city they didn't show themselves. No fighting horses, only mules and old nags, only stray dogs. The fleeing people were weirdly silent. Shouts or cries would have been welcome, but Blacktooth heard neither. It was as if the window from his basement cell had led him into a world where only children cried or complained. The adults were glumly silent, stumbling forward. Perhaps they thought their accents would give them away, or perhaps there was just nothing left to say. New Rome was burning. Blacktooth had prepared himself for execution, and now even his hunger was gone. A hand plucked at his sleeve, a child's hand, and he found himself, through some process he neither understood nor fully noted, part of a small group dragging a frightened mule up the steps from a basement room. How it had gotten there, who it belonged to, and who wanted it, these were questions that belonged to another reality. All that was present was the need to help coax the terrified braying beast up the narrow steps. Then it was gone into the gathering, streaming crowd. 
its owner and the child chasing it, and Blacktooth was half walking, half running after them. The wind had risen, and now there was a wall of flame directly behind to the west. Four men and four women, all naked and holding hands, snaked through the crowd, singing hysterically. Blacktooth tried to look away from the women's breasts, but couldn't. It wasn't desire, he felt, but some other almost forgotten feeling, hunger or hope. Two men in uniform with repeating rifles ran past, then two more, all running in step. It was almost comical. Blacktooth pulled off his zucchetto and hid it under his habit. A fallen mule and the traces of a cart was screaming pitifully, trying to rise. One haunch was smeared with blood. The fire was either closer or hotter, or both. At the end of the street it was a wall of flame, taller than the great houses. Blacktooth now had two shadows, one that walked before him and one behind. I set fires, thought Blacktooth, remembering the blue and gold inscription on the grasshopper shaft's carriage. A farmer leaned over the injured mule and drew his knife. Blacktooth stopped him with a hand on his arm. Let him live, he said in church speak. Huh? The farmer stared at Blacktooth's robes and then cut the traces. The mule limped off, wickering, and the farmer stuck the knife back into his belt. I will help with the wagon, said Blacktooth in grasshopper. He put his hat back on and pushed. It was a two-wheeled cart of vaguely grasshopper design, loaded with household goods and junk, including an ancient, tiny, black-skinned old woman with two kittens, which she was kissing, first one and then the other. Blacktooth pushed and the farmer pulled, then two more men joined in, throwing their possessions in the back along with the old grandmother. They all spoke grasshopper, mixed with a little church-speak and smatterings of Olzark. They fled on east toward the great river. Blacktooth stayed with the farmer with the cart all day. Hair Puller was his name, or it might have been a description or even a confession. The man was bald. He was so solicitous, sharing his food and water, that Blacktooth assumed he was a Christian, until he realized that the farmer thought Blacktooth's red zucchetto meant that he was a soldier. Though he lived in the holy city, he had never heard of the church. To the farmer there were only two types of people, farmers and Texarch soldiers. Though he was of them by blood, the grasshopper nomads, the people coming in from the plain where the trees do not go, were less than human, or more, perhaps, an elemental like a herd or a storm. Even after escaping from his basement jail, Blacktooth still felt imprisoned, between the fire to the west and the still unseen river to the east. By noon the smoke had eaten the sun itself, and a terrifying red darkness fell over the streets like a pall. The stream of refugees grew to a flood, all heading east. The streets grew wider, and at the same time more choked with refugees, all farmers. The great houses to the east were even greater, and there were no trees. Blacktooth had never imagined he would miss them. It was late afternoon when they reached the river. Blacktooth didn't know what it was at first. The crowd piled up on itself, then started milling, turning. There was fire to the west and fire to the north as well. There was a scuffle, a swift panic, and Hair Puller was lost in the crowd. Once Blacktooth thought he heard the familiar creak of the wagon, then lost it again. Luckily he had managed to save his jail blanket. It was getting dark. Except for a few children crying, the refugees were silent again, milling in place, making decisions through some sort of slow, visceral process, like a worm. The main stream turned south, following the bank of the river out of the city. Suspecting what it was that had turned them, Blacktooth climbed a low stone wall. A few others, like himself, stood on top, looking at the great river. Blacktooth had never seen or even imagined so much water before. It was a different substance than the water he had known in the mountains or on the plains. It didn't dance or swirl or fall. It lay like a sheet of muddy glass, half brown and half silver. It was a plain of water. He thought he could walk across it, but he knew better. Squeezing past the others, Blacktooth walked along the top of the wall to a fallen pier at the water's edge. Boats were standing offshore. He hadn't seen many boats before, just the flat-bottomed ferries on the red, but he knew what they were. These were barges, some with sheds built with chimneys and window glass, and long sweeps that turned them and moved them on the water. People on the decks and roofs watched the city burn. The boats made small circles in the current, watching the fire, perhaps waiting to move in later to loot. 
A few farmer refugees tried to swim or wade out to the boats, but they were beaten away with the sweeps. A few shots were fired. The people on the barges were dressed in rags, the same as the farmers, but Black Tooth assumed they were from the other shore. The fire was getting closer. From the water it was almost beautiful. Fire, loveliest of the four elements of the world, and yet an element, too, in hell. Black Tooth found a spot at the end of the pier and wrapped himself in his jail blanket. Paradoxically, it kept him cool. Beneath the wall of smoke and flame he could see the stream of refugees heading south along the river bank. So many, Black Tooth muttered. The man standing beside him grunted what sounded like a scent. He was holding a long gun, but not a repeater. It was the type that fired stones through a thick iron barrel. For some reason Blacktooth felt safe beside him. He had no desire to rejoin the refugees and head south. They could have defended the city, Blacktooth whispered, and the man grunted again. They could have, Blacktooth thought, but they hadn't wanted to. New Rome wasn't their city. They had been driven there by the Texarch soldiers and then driven out by the flames. Few were armed, and those with very ancient weapons of the kind that had killed the Scharf's shaman. Perhaps the man standing beside him had fired the shot. The howling wind was whipping the water into whitecaps. It was blowing from the east, sucked into the city by the flames. As night fell, the flood of refugees lessened to a stream and then to a trickle, all turning south along the river bank, heading toward Texarkana, as if drawn by some ancient instinctive urge. Late that night their fires could be seen in the low line of wooded bluffs to the south. By then Blacktooth was asleep. He slept for hours, alone at the end of the pier. By daylight the fire had almost died away, and the holy city of New Rome was burned. The smell of food awakened him. Blacktooth had slept wrapped in his jail blanket, propped against a wooden upright at the end of the pier. If the fire had kept coming it would have followed the pier to him and consumed him along with the rest of the world. But he had been spared. He had taken off his boots and hidden them under his blanket. They were still there, as was his zucchetto, with three pills left. As soon as he sat up he felt Hilbert's fever returning. But couldn't it be hunger? He hadn't eaten in days. He smelled fish cooking. At the end of the pier a boat was tied up on the muddy bank. A group of men were gathered around a small fire. Blacktooth stood up, pulling the blanket around him to hide his monk's robes. These boatmen were probably less Christianized even than the grasshopper farmers, who were themselves barely Christian at all, and he remembered his jailer's remark that the antipope was burning the city. Something in the shape of the group, their stance, or the tone of their voices told Blacktooth that he could join them safely. Still he edged in cautiously, walking slowly along the edge of the wooden pier. A body floated by, buoyed by its own gases. A woman's face smiled upward toward a scrim of smoke and sky. Blacktooth looked away and stepped onto the mud. Someone passed him a piece of fish wrapped in big soft leaves. The smell of it was so overpowering, so delicious, that he had to sit down to eat it. No one paid any attention to him or asked him any questions. The men by the fire seemed united by a sort of rough charity. They were boatmen, and spoke a version of Ozark that Blacktooth could barely make out. The outsiders, two or three stragglers like himself, spoke not at all. Their silence seemed to be essential to the rough peace that prevailed. After he had finished the fish, Blacktooth looked around. Now that the smoke had cleared, he could see the big towers of the ancient bridge. He could make out low bluffs on the far side. The water was impossibly wide. The great river, the Miss P, flowed into the sea. How big then must the sea be? Already this was more water than Blacktooth had ever imagined. The nomad's coming, said one of the boatmen. The word for nomad in their dialect was horse people. The implication was, so we ourselves must flee. There were no women among the boatmen, but even as Blacktooth was noticing this, several women walked down the bank, trudging from rock to rocky step, tracking ash and carrying armloads of what looked like rags onto the barge and into the shed cabin. They were followed by other women with bags that clinked, perhaps crockery. Someone passed Blacktooth another piece of fish, followed by a pot of warm water which seemed to be some kind of weak tea. The nomads are coming, said another woman, arriving at a run. The horse people. 
There was a shout and Blacktooth and the other guests stood back while one of the boatmen scattered the fire with a stick. Before Blacktooth realized what was happening, the barge was spinning off in the current. The other guests by the dead fire quickly scattered, and Blacktooth found himself holding the boatman's water pot alone again. It was just as well. For the first time in days he felt his bowels calling, so it was with pleasure that he found a hidden place by the water's edge under the pier and took a dump, and then cleansed himself and went into the city. Blacktooth assumed that the grasshopper warriors would arrive as soon as the fire burned out, and begin looting and raping, and with them would come Brown Pony and the Curia. But it was noon, and the streets were still empty. He had rolled up his jail blanket, and now he felt exposed and vulnerable in his habit and Zucchetto as he walked the right angles of the streets, waiting for the nomads to find him and take him to Brown Pony. No one came. It was as if the holy city had been cleansed. Even the corpses in the street, blackened like cinders, seemed cleansed somehow, as if the fire had swept away their corruptions, leaving only a purified husk. There wasn't much to loot. The fire had consumed everything but the brick and stone, reducing the city back to the rubble it must have been before the Hark Hannigans had rebuilt it. How many times had these bricks fallen, Blacktooth wondered? How many conquerors had passed under this lintel, this stone? The holy city, with its grid of streets between blackened piles of rubble and shells of burned buildings, was like a palimpsest of civilization and misery, all intermixed and intermingled, one age falling onto the other like leaves, like cottonwood trash, the debris of centuries good only for a twenty-minute or a twenty-hour fire. No nomads came, no howling barbarians to pick through the ruined and smoking center of all Christendom, no shots, no shouts, no neighing horses, no mad laughter or cries of delight or screams of dismay. A great fire brings with it a truce in the natural order of things, a still centre, and there weren't even scavengers in the streets. The occasional corpses, one every block or so, lay in quiet dignity as Blacktooth walked around them. There were only the buzzards gathering high overhead like fly ash. St. Peter's was not hard to find. The roof had burned and fallen, but the smoke-stained dome still stood over the ruins. Most of the interior was destroyed. Blacktooth sat in the back in one of the long pews that had survived the lottery of destruction. It was curious, he thought, what was left and what was consumed by time as well as fire. There were a few memories left of his childhood, the hard months among the nomads, the early days of the abbey. But whole years were gone, leaving nothing but ash, like the long rows of grey ash marking where the clean-burning oak pews had been. Where a pew was gone, its footstool might be left behind. It was like the remnants of the Magna Civitas, burned to the ground more than a thousand years ago. Parts of it stood almost intact, like the church. Other parts were not even remembered. For the first time in months, Blacktooth closed his eyes and prayed, not under duress, but because he wanted to. He stayed on his knees when he finished. He could feel Hilbert's fever returning like an old friend. He welcomed it, for there was Idria again in the waterfall that had no water where water did not fall. And there was Amen Speckleburg. Amen the first with his cougar smile. Amen was shaking him by the shoulder, but it was Amen the second. Nimmy, is it really you? We thought you were dead. So here you see my church said Brown Pony. His hair was gone, and his eyes stared out of dark hollows. Even the red beard of the red deacon was mostly white. All around the basilica the great empty windows looked out on ruins. The deserted streets were quiet, and only the howling of dogs could be heard far off in the distance. Oh, God, the grasshopper! Brown Pony knelt and blackened his hands in the ashes, and held them up toward the smoke-stained dome. What a fool I have been, Nimmy! to trust the grasshopper. Holy Madness trusted them too, Holy Father, Blacktooth replied, and so did Axe. I trusted Brougham to fight well, said Wushin. He did that before the desertions. It may be, said the Pope, that he could not control his warriors once they felt the battle fury, drawn down from empty sky, as they say. He wiped his hands on his dirty white cassock. Over it he wore a repeating pistol in a shoulder holster. And the grasshopper warriors have no love for the church hereabouts. 
Wu Shen stood by, still wearing the plaid tunic and Sergeant General's stripes Brown Pony had made for him. He seemed depressed. Black Tooth was not surprised. All Wu Shen's friends, the Yellow Guard, were either dead or gone south with Magister Dion and the Kisok Dri Verdar. His master, Brown Pony, seemed weaker than ever, and ruined. Nimi, Brown Pony was saying, look what I have done to my church. It wasn't for myself that I wanted this throne. And now look at it. It wasn't you. Blacktooth started, but he couldn't finish. Who else had done it? It was Brown Pony who had assembled the three hordes, who had armed them with repeating weapons, who had set them in motion across the sea of grass toward New Rome, and who had then told them not to set fires. I set fires, Eltua Braum's carriage was inscribed. He had made no secret of it. Like hell you will, the Pope had answered. Like hell. And now look around. Brown Pony laid his hand on Blacktooth's brow, leaving a smear of ash. Your fever seems better, Nimmy, he said. I got over it, said Blacktooth. They captured me and gave me some pills, the same pills the Texarch are using south of the Nadian. But they are almost gone. You don't feel feverish? I can feel it, said Blacktooth. I can see it coming. When I am feverish I see the girl, Idria, and the old Pope, Amen Specklebird. They were with me just now before you came in. He saw no point in lying to Brown Pony, not any more. I was glad to see them. Do you see them now? Brown Pony asked. No, of course not. The fever is not that bad. The fever is not that bad, repeated Brown Pony. He seemed more distracted than ever. Then suddenly he drew the pistol from his shoulder holster. Do you hear that, Nimmy? Hear what your shh. Wu Shen drew his short sword from his belt. He left his long sword in its steel scabbard. Seconds later, Black Tooth heard what the old warrior and brown pony had heard. Hooves on the paving stones, and then on steps, and then on wood, clattering inside the cathedral. It was Black Eyes, the nomad double agent who had briefly been imprisoned across from Brown Pony and Blacktooth in the Hannigan City Zoo. He was dressed in the full regalia of a wild dog warrior riding a sorrel pony. Your Holiness, he said sarcastically. He nodded at Nimi and avoided Wushin's eye and sword altogether. Put it away, said Brown Pony softly, although he still held the repeating pistol in his hand. Wu Xin put the short sword away, but kept his hand on the hilt of the long one. What are you doing here? I thought you were with the Emperor in Hannigan City. Brown Pony stood straighter, tried to look regal. Black eyes didn't seem impressed. As a spy, the nomad said. When the Lord of the Three Hordes came south with the tanks and the Glap army, I crossed the Red River to join them. But the battle is lost. The Hannigan's guns spoke too loudly and too fast. The Gleps have run back to their valley. The Spooks are on their way back to the Suckerments, and the war shaft of the Three Hordes is on his way home. Hingen Usli, Brown Pony looked stricken. The Kisak Driverdar is going home. The Weegis are calling, said the Nomad. His pony was dancing in and out of the pew ashes, ruining their straight lines. The Texarch wooden nose is burning our lodges, killing our women, stealing our horses. We ride for the short grass. I am only here to make sure that none of the children of the big sky woman are left in the city when the grass eaters arrive. You should leave also. You are also her child, and she is also your mother, begging your pardon, holiness. The Texarch cavalry is on its way. From the south, the Pope pointed with the pistol. From Hannigan City, from the north as well, from the Sea of Grass. We will leave their city to them. Good luck, Your Holiness. He rode off loudly, hooves clattering, and Brown Pony fell to his knees, cursing his fate. Vexilla Regis Inferni Produent. What's he saying? Wushin whispered. Forth come the banners of the King of Hell, said Blacktooth. It is not their city, Brown Pony muttered. They never wanted it. He looked up toward the sky and saw only the blackened, ruined dome. 
he tossed his pistol into the ashes. In the centre of the ruined sanctuary, the throne of St. Peter's had been miraculously spared. Behind it was a painted wooden statue of the Holy Virgin, also spared. Blacktooth and Wuxin silently followed Brown Pony as he crossed toward the throne, picking his way through the litter. Brown Pony paused in front of the throne and studied it before smoothing his cassock and sitting down. His freckled skin was drawn and thin strands of grey hair showed at the edges of his dirty white skull cap. He still wore his empty shoulder holster. Here. Wuxin tried to hand him the papal tiara, but Brown Pony shook his head, so the yellow warrior placed it in the ashes at the foot of the throne. It was getting dark. Blacktooth had no difficulty finding a live ember with which to light a few candles. Set behind the throne, they hardly illuminated anything except the face of the Virgin, and that only barely. Brown Pony's eyes were shut as if in prayer, and Blacktooth was glad. Looking into them had been like looking in the window of a burning house. Wuxin squatted beside the throne of St. Peter, kneeling back on his heels, balanced on the scabbard of his long sword he still wore at his side. Though limber, he was also, Blacktooth saw, an old man. He moved without joy or ease. The truce the fire had created was ended. Outside in the street, Blacktooth saw a dog chase away a buzzard to pull at a blackened body. Then it was chased away in turn by a pig, his old friend. Another dog stopped at the huge open door and looked into the basilica in the dying light. It sniffed the smoky air, pissed on the bronze door, and trotted off into the gathering darkness. A riderless horse wandered past, part of a severed human leg hanging from the stirrup. Glory to God in the highest! It was the weak, tired voice of Elia Amen the second Papa Brown Pony, speaking as if Job's wife had told him to curse God and die, and he was wearily complying. I think I hear the Texark cavalry coming. Blacktooth, do be sensible and run for your life. It was only a riderless horse, Blacktooth said, but he cocked his ears and heard something in the distance. He could feel it as much as hear it, a low, indistinct rumbling that might have been far away thunder. There's nothing to keep them out of the city now, Wuxin said. But you, my lord, Blacktooth was confused. Where will you go? If Brown Pony heard him, he gave no sign. Blacktooth looked at the statue of the Holy Virgin behind the throne of St. Peter's. She stuck out her tongue. It was black and forked. The fever's coming back, Blacktooth thought. He looked around for Specklebird and Idria, the companions of his delirium, but they were nowhere to be seen. Brown Pony turned and looked up at the Virgin. His eyes grew bright. So it's you, after all. Huh? Blacktooth and Wuxin both asked at once. Mother, mother of the night and the mares of night, the dreams. My lord? Blacktooth took the Pope's arm. Look! Look at her! Brown Pony jerked his arm loose and pointed at the Virgin. The dark spot crawled out of her lower lip. Ah, uh, worm! Blacktooth stuttered. The night hag! My real mother! Brown Pony said. Blacktooth, escape while there's time! Loyal to me stops here! Obey me! Go! Blacktooth stepped back. Why should I start keeping my vows by obeying you now? Brown Pony laughed weakly, but repeated, Go, go be a hermit and teach those who come to you about God. Be yourself. That is his calling to you. Faintly, Blacktooth could hear distant hoofbeats getting louder. Go! Wuxin was still hunkered down beside the throne, his narrow eyes closed as if in prayer. Behind the throne the virgin's face glowed in the flickering candlelight. Blacktooth walked under her, circling slowly toward the still-standing back wall of the cathedral. There was definitely a worm on her lip, or a tongue that moved, forked black. Maybe it was a shadow from a candle, or a pronobis nunc et in hora mortis nostri. There was a door in the back. Halfway there Blacktooth heard a sharp hiss, like an intake of breath. 
He recognized the sound of Wuxin's sword being drawn from its scabbard. Then he heard the murmur of Latin. To Blacktooth's surprise, this least orthodox of popes was reciting the creed. In spite of himself, Blacktooth stopped and listened. It began as the creed of Nicaea. I believe in one God, the Almighty Father, maker of the earth and the sky, and of all things seen and unseen, and in one Lord Jesus Christ. But before Brown Pony was done, the creed of Athanasius crept in and took over, saying, And in one holy Roman Catholic and apostolic church, outside of which there is neither salvation nor remission of sins, Unam sanctam ecclesiam romanum metiam apostolicam extra quam neque celus est neque remissio peccatorum. Now it was the voice of the axe. Blacktooth paused, afraid to look around, and heard the rustle of silk. There was a faint affirmative grunt as Elia Brown Pony, Amen the Second, fell to his knees at the foot of the throne. The whisper of the sword cutting the air ended in the chunk of flesh and bone, and the thump of the head, and the splashing of gushing fluid on the littered floor. Blacktooth ran toward the exit as fast as he could. He had almost reached the doorway when Wuxin's quavering voice called after him, Help me before you go, please. He stopped again and turned this time. He saw Axe sitting on the floor beside the corpse. Wu Xin had taken out his other sword, the short one, and held it pressed against his belly. While he pressed slowly with one hand, with the other he picked up the blood-stained long sword from the floor and tossed it toward the monk. It fell short, ringing like a bell on the stone floor. Blacktooth stepped over it, shaking his head. With long steps he strode to the warrior's side. No, he said fiercely. Would you now abandon your master? Wuxin looked at the heap of bloody silk beside him, glared up at Blacktooth, and pressed the blade into his belly until the blood came. He groaned and stopped and looked up at Blacktooth again, pleading. Nimi picked up the longsword, but instead of lifting it for a strike, he leaned on it as if it were a cane. Your master's enemy still lives, he said. Cut open your belly if you want to, Wuxin, but I want to hear you say, Long live Philpeo Hark, before I help you die. Wuxin removed the blade from his flesh and said something in a strange tongue, clearly a curse. Blacktooth knelt down and looked at the wound. It was bleeding profusely, but it seemed not to have penetrated far, if at all, into the abdominal cavity. He helped the aged warrior to his feet, then knelt down and tore off a piece of the Pope's white silk cassock. He gave it to Axe to hold against his wound. Wuxin picked up Brown Tony's head and placed it next to his body. Then he covered both with the jail blanket, perhaps forgetting that it was Blacktooth's. Shouldn't we bury him? Wuxin shook his head. This was the way he wanted it. Leave me for the Burrigan, the buzzard of battle. His bride, said Blacktooth. He looked for the night hag, but she was gone. The virgin was back with her glowing baby and gentle smile. Looking down at Brown Pony, dead under the blanket, a still form, Blacktooth felt strangely unmoved. So much of his life since leaving the Abbey had been in service to this worldly man. But who or what was Brown Pony in service to? Do any of us know ultimately what it is we serve? Blacktooth wondered. Then he felt immediately ashamed. Was he not a brother of the Albertian Order of St. Leibowitz? Why had he wanted so long to be released from his vows, if the vows meant nothing? The hoofbeats were closer now, rattling in the square outside the front of the cathedral, then on the low, wide steps. For a moment Blacktooth thought of stepping out into the street and offering himself up for capture. Then would he be given the pills he needed, and perhaps the death. But no, Wuxin recovered and sheathed his long sword. Blacktooth followed him out the back door of the cathedral. There was nothing more in St. Peter's to do. The dogs were wandering back into the city, smelling new blood and death. Where was it written, And the dogs ate Jezebel in the field of Jezrahel? As he followed Wuxin down the alley toward the river, Blacktooth could hear horses' hooves inside the cathedral of St. Peter's, then raised voices over the dead body of Amen the Second. 
Chapter 32 They are able now, with no help save from God, to fight single-handed against the vices of the flesh and their own evil thoughts. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 1 It rained the next day and the next. The sky was close and heavy, not like the bright empty sky of the grasslands, and Black Tooth felt bent by it, even more than by the rain, which was little more than a persistent drizzle. He followed Wuxin, and the axe followed a small train of wagons and livestock headed for the Wachita nation. It was an informal attachment, but it seemed better than traveling alone. The farmers spoke a degraded form of grasshopper mixed with Olzark, larded with Old English church-speak, a dialect Blacktooth assumed was confined to the environs of New Rome. He had trouble understanding it at first, but his talent for languages rescued him, and he was surprised to find a dialect so rich in sources and influences, so poor in subtlety and nuance. Though it may have been his understanding that was poor, or perhaps it was the farmers themselves. There were few women among them. The apparent leader of the train was a spook, Blacktooth suspected, named Farfan. He had a daughter, beautiful except for her huge glep ears, and her hands, which she kept mysteriously covered with rags. Farfan kept her in the wagon where she sewed and sang all day, and, Blacktooth was alarmed to discover, entertained her father sexually at night when the wagon was pulled up with the others alongside the muddy road. The holy city was far behind them now, still burning, a smudge on the northeast horizon that was seen only when the low clouds broke. The army that had gone south with Hung and Ursula had been routed, and the thinning stream of refugees heading south was mixed with a thickening stream of refugees heading north, giving the impression that the narrow stretches of highway of a great milling herd heading nowhere. At these points the traffic left the roads for the still green fields, which were quickly churned into quagmires by wheels and hooves and feet. Though they all spoke versions of grasshopper, it was not difficult to tell the nomad warriors from the Hannigan's semi-civilized farmers. Many of the refugees heading north were wounded, and most were still armed. A few had even kept their horses, and several times these looked at Blacktooth's clerical garb with an alarming anger. "'Come on, Nimi,' said Axe, whenever Blacktooth showed signs of wanting to ask about the Kisok's campaign. He was in a hurry to reach Hannigan City. Since Blacktooth had refused to act as his Keisaku and help disembowel him, the wizened old warrior had rediscovered his own purpose. Blacktooth suspected but didn't want to ask what it was. Axe had the peculiar ability to go for days without food and never look malnourished. This was not true for Blacktooth, who had a monk's love of dinner, but because he helped with the wagons when they were stuck, he was welcome at the meager dinner and breakfast fires. The river was only a memory somewhere to the east. Now there were the bottomland streams, at least two to cross every day, almost too deep to ford. At each crossing there were piles of abandoned, unburied bodies, stacked in grotesque positions as if they were in the process of composing themselves from the earth, rather than the reverse. The refugees walked by them, pretending not to notice, and commanding their children to look away. But children have always understood war better than adults. Death only mildly interests them. It holds neither the horror nor fascination it has for adults who can almost hear the wings. Overhead the sky was black with circling dots, the faithful Borrigan. The spook farmers with whom Blacktooth and Axe were travelling were tolerant of Blacktooth's tonsure and habit, even the zucchetto which he carried over his back without wearing. Still he worried. He remained under the Hannigan's death sentence as far as he knew. It was the death sentence that had given him Hilbert's pills, which were almost gone. Leaving New Rome with three, he had cut his dose to one a day, taken in the morning with his corn gruel. There were two left the day Blacktooth saw three brother monks crucified by the side of the road, but whether by the Texark soldiers or by angry nomads routed from their promised looting of Hannigan City, it was impossible to say. The Barragan had feasted, and the bodies were too far gone. Come, said Axe and after a hasty prayer Blacktooth hurried to catch up with his companions. He wanted to bury the dead, but he didn't want to join them yet. Above all, he didn't want to be alone. The next day he took his next-to-last pill. That afternoon he came across a second group of two clerics hung from poles by a muddy roadside. It appeared that they had been hung up and then stoned and shot with arrows, a merciful death overall. 
Their faces looked almost peaceful, as if they had only just entered the doorway into death. Blacktooth studied them for a long time. They looked familiar. It was not their faces, although in truth all men look alike, and looked increasingly alike to his most reverend cardinal, Blacktooth St. George, deacon of St. Maisie's, in these days in what he was beginning more and more to think of as the twilight of his life, even though it turned out to be a long twilight. They looked to him as monks all looked, hung on the cross of life. This was not their world. There was something almost inspiring in it. Come, said Axe. Go ahead, said Blacktooth. I'll catch up. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, bury the dead. He borrowed Wuxin's short sword and used it to bury the two by the side of the road, using stones and sticks to complete the work. When he finished, it was dark. Not wanting to travel alone at night, he slept in a shallow dirt cave by the side of the road, using his mud stains of Keto for a pillow. The next morning he took his last pill, and under the clear sky he was almost overcome by terror. He hurried all day, hoping to catch up with the spook farmers and the axe. The few refugees he saw on the road eyed him curiously, but left him alone. But he kept remembering the crucified churchman, and he was afraid. He hid the red hat under a bush, and later that day saw a chance to get rid of his habit, trading it for the leggings and tunic of a farmer who had been laid out beside the road almost tenderly, a corpse not too old. The monk buried him and took his clothes, bury the dead, clothe the naked. It had been easy to toss the Zucchetto, but leaving behind the coarse brown Leibowitzian habit was not so easy. After a few moments of hesitation, Blacktooth rolled it up like a bindle and carried it with him. He felt like a pilgrim, or a book-legger again. Under a clear sky speckled with buzzards, he pushed on south and west. Hilbert's fever travelled with him. Blacktooth had no hunger, and after a few days no diarrhoea, but no strength either. There were fewer and fewer travellers on the road, and those Blacktooth saw spoke in Ozark, or not at all. The stream of refugees had diminished to a trickle. Some had crossed the great river, counting on the water to protect them from the depredations of Filpeo's soldiers and their nomad adversaries, still thought of as the anti-Pope's army. Others had just disappeared into the forests to hide, to die, to wait for neighbour or kin. Blacktooth never caught up with the wagons. He had lost Brown Pony, now he lost Axe. When the road forked west, he followed it, putting the morning sun at his back, even though he knew that Wu Xin must be heading south for Hannigan City. Blacktooth was hungry for empty sky. The fever was like a companion, another consciousness. Often it took on a human form, as when he was crossing a small creek. The creeks got smaller and smaller the farther west he went, and he saw a speckled bird waiting on the far bank. Eagerly, Blacktooth waded across, but when he reached the bank, the old black man with the cougar face was gone. Another time he saw Idria standing in the doorway of an abandoned hut. The illusion, if it was illusion, was so perfect that he could hear her singing as he climbed the hill toward her. But in the hut he found only an old man, dead, with a crying baby in his arms. He waited for the baby to die before burying them both together. Bury the dead. It would be dry and hot for days, and then the rain would come, announced by lightning, attended by thunder, falling in sheets, and turning the roads to mud. Hilbert's fever was handy, enabling Blacktooth to go for miles without eating. The long feverish days reminded him of his Lenten fast as a novice, when he had been seeking his vocation and thought he had found it among the Albertian bookleggers of St. Leibowitz. And hadn't he? He missed the Abbey and the brothers now that he had the freedom he had sought. He had even been released from his vows by the Pope himself, or had he simply been bound in new chains? Go and be a hermit. The day Blacktooth saw St. Leibowitz and the wild horsewoman, he had been travelling all morning over open grasslands between wooded draws. He was worried about outlaws because he had seen several campfires near the road, still smouldering, yet never saw anyone. He considered putting his habit back on, but decided against it. Even those who didn't hate the church for what it had supposedly done to their world often thought it was rich, and even a poor monk could be a target for highwaymen. By midday he had the distinct feeling someone was following him. He looked back every time he crossed a high spot. The road was empty, and he saw only buzzards, fly specks to the south and east. 
Blacktooth was glad to see that he had crossed that shifting boundary where the forest begins to give way to the grass, but the feeling of being followed wouldn't go away. It became so real that when he crossed the next creek he hid on the far bank behind the corpse-colored trunk of a fallen sycamore to watch. Sure enough, a white mule with red ears came through the trees and down the muddy bank. At first he thought the woman on the beast's back was Idria, with the twins she had gotten by him under the waterfall. But it was the Fuji Go, the day maiden herself. Far beyond Idria in beauty she carried an infant in each arm, one white and one black, both nursing at her full breasts. Even as she rode the mule down the muddy bank and into the water, they sucked on. Then she dropped the reins. The mule stopped in the center of the sluggish stream. Its black eyes were looking straight at Blacktooth. No, through him. He stood up, no longer trying to hide. As he stepped over the log, he realized that what he was seeing was not in his world, and not for him to touch. He knew with certainty that if he spoke, she would not hear him, and that even if she looked straight at him, she would not see him. He felt that he had changed places with one of his own fever dreams, and that it was they, and not he, that were real. That he was the dream. It was then St. Leberwitz stepped out of the bushes and took the rope halter. Blacktooth knew him from Brother Fingo's twenty-sixth-century wooden statue in the corridor outside the abbot's office. He recognized the curious smile and dubious eyes. That the saint was no vision, Blacktooth knew from the faint, sweet fuel oil smell that hung in the air as he passed. It was Blacktooth who was the dream. As she rode past, the Fuji Go gazed up toward the sky. Blacktooth hadn't noticed how majestic the little oaks could be, a filigree of branches against a pale sky. One baby was blinding albino white. The other was as black as Speckleburg. Both had their eyes squeezed shut like tiny fists fending off the world. The mule looked straight through Blacktooth like the day maiden. Only Leberwitz, in his burlap robes with his rope over his shoulder, looked directly at the monk as if to say, like axe, come. Then he winked and walked on. Sancte Isaac Edwarde ora pro me. Blacktooth followed. Blacktooth had always followed where Leberwitz had led. But now he was weak, and he fell twice climbing the bank. By the time he got to the top, the two, the three, the five, were far down the narrow trail, almost lost in the dappled shadows. He hurried after them, but he was feverish, and even though they were not walking fast, he gradually fell behind. He had to stop again, and he must have fallen asleep, for when he woke it was almost dark, and they were impossibly far away, like a speck in the eye, an iota shimmering in the distance. But something was wrong. The sun was setting behind his right shoulder. St. Leberwitz and the wild horse woman were not heading west into the sea of grass, but south toward Hannigan City. The Hungian Fujivurn always chose the victor as her lord, and the Hannigan had won the war. By choosing a husband, she chooses a king, and she was Philpaeus now. Leberwitz was taking her to him. Blacktooth wandered on, hoping to find Texarch soldiers who would give him pills. The winter was coming. It was the winter of 3246. The Empire and its borders were being redrawn, and the few travelers Blacktooth passed were wary. Every few days he buried a corpse as he walked west, no longer a cardinal, no longer even a monk. Go and be a hermit. It no longer rained. The trees thinned out into shadows in the draws, and the road led higher and higher into a world all grass under a dome of sky. Blacktooth's fever had become a small fire that both weakened and sustained him. The morning he left the last of the trees behind, he saw a great bird circling far above. It was a red buzzard, the Pope's bird. Ahead by the road something or someone had fallen. Two smaller black buzzards pulled at it, but the meat was not yet ripe enough for their beaks. Nimmy stopped to watch as the Burrigan, the Pope's pride, as he thought of it, swooped down. Awed by her size, the smaller buzzards stepped back, black heads bobbing, but she ignored them, and they soon joined her at the attempted feast. The red buzzard was stronger and had a little better luck, but still the carcass was too fresh for easy eating. From where he sat on a hummock of grass, Blacktooth could not tell if the corpse was human. Feed the hungry, nurse the sick, visit the prisoner. 
he said aloud, reciting the corporal works of mercy. Bury the dead. He tossed a rock. The bird stopped and eyed him with funereal solemnity, then strutted and preened and resumed eating. He tossed another rock, and they ignored it. He still carried Wuxin's short sword, but he could not summon the resolve to quarrel with the queen of the buzzards. Then he watched as a bald eagle came, driving them all away, even the Berrigan, the buzzard of battle. The bald eagle was Philpeo's national bird. It nosed at the corpse, then lost interest and left, riding a thermal straight up into the china blue sky. Blacktooth St. George got to his feet and went to see what it was he had been left to bury. He hoped it was not another child. Chapter 33 Let all things be done with moderation, however, for the sake of the faint-hearted. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 48 it was a good year for the buzzards. They followed Blacktooth all the way back to the Abbey of St. Leberwitz, little dots like eye specks against the expanse of empty sky. Blacktooth gave up on finding Hilbert's pills, and the disease gradually gave up on him, burning down to embers. If he had a fever, it was the same fever that had plagued him all his life, the burning that Amen and Brown Pony had noticed, each from his own particular perspective. There was no longer a safe route across the grasslands. One could no longer evade the empire by travelling north of the Nadian, or avoid the hordes by travelling to the south. Both groups had interpenetrated, and the contended territories on both sides of the Nadian were passable and yet uncertain. South of the brave, the kingdom of Laredo had collapsed in on itself. The grass itself seemed to be shrinking back into the earth. There were stretches of sand and dust that took half a day to cross. The empty sky seemed even more of an emptiness than before. Blacktooth wore his habit again and said his rosary as he walked. But had he eaten? And where had he found water? The few people he saw were on horses on the horizons. One day there was rain. But it was a swift, dry rain, the kind that comes to the high plains and barely reaches the ground, darkening the dust and throwing it up in great splotches, and then evaporating suddenly in the flashes of sun that showed like slow lightning after the clouds had ridden away on their long ponies. Empty sky. There was no road and then no trail. Blacktooth followed the setting sun. Wagon tracks braided across the dry river courses, running in every direction. The few people Blacktooth met were peaceful and shared their food. The bodies he found he buried using the short sword he had borrowed from the axe. He walked alone most of the time, accompanied only by his shadow striding before him in the morning and falling behind by evening. Only at noon, in the heat, would it desert him altogether. Reduced to its essentials, sky and earth, the world seemed more intricate and complex than ever. Blacktooth missed the little glep cougar with its blue ears. He wondered what had become of Abelot, who had so loved the little brass cartridges of war. Had he become one of the motherless ones, or found his final home under the prairie soil? Other such thoughts came, one with each step, arriving and departing without speaking, like birds. At other times Blacktooth walked with an empty mind, a gift like empty sky in which each step was a prayer. It was a good year for the buzzards. Blacktooth could tell by how easily they were chased away. There were always other feasts waiting just over the next hill. Dormabicu Olshuen had died after another stroke, and Prior de Vendi was taking his place until a new abbot could be elected according to the time-honored Benedictine rule. Once he had arrived, Blacktooth had little desire to stay at the monastery, even though most of his good memories, as well as many of his bad ones, were set amid those ancient adobe walls. The stories of Idria's stay as Sister Clare had become almost legend, and Blacktooth heard several versions. They were linked with the apparition some of the brothers claimed to have seen of the Holy Virgin in the eastern sky. That's the night hag, said Blacktooth. She means war and death, not peace and hope. He could tell by the way Brother Wren and the others crossed themselves that they didn't want to hear it, even though they were preparing for war in their own way. They had sealed the holy relics in their original chamber and dusted off the jackrabbit smuggler's cannon. Brother Carpenter was in the basement planing boards for a heavier door. 
The defeat of Brown Pony's plans for a new order signaled the beginning of a new age of darkness. Somehow Blacktooth no longer feared it, or even thought about it. Blood and screams were the water in which humankind swam. Four children had been brought in from the village. Two of them had already died. It seemed there were new diseases abroad in the desert. After visiting Jared's grave, Blacktooth stood looking into the empty one that was always kept waiting. The straw around the open moor was hardly necessary, as there had been even less rain this year than usual, Prior de Vendy explained. The grave was so deep that it seemed to Blacktooth that he could see all the way to the bottom of... of... He swayed and almost fell. Gerard's affliction, the brothers called it, after the beloved fainting monk of almost a thousand years ago. You seem a little woozy, said Prior de Vendy. Come. He led Blacktooth through the crowded day room of the monastery under the old familiar Vigas into Olshuan's office. Using a key that hung from a cord around his neck, Devendi opened a drawer and took from it another key with which he opened a cabinet of dusty bottles. He poured a glass of brandy. Blacktooth almost waved it away until he saw that Devendi was pouring one for himself as well. Oregon, he said, it was left here as a gift for Brown Pony when he became Pope Amen too. He took the papacy to New Jerusalem and never drank it. And now he is dead, Blacktooth said. He had told no one about the scene in the Basilica of St. Peter's, only that the Pope was dead. He made you a cardinal, said Devendi. Where is your hat? My Zucchetto. I put all that behind me. I suspect whoever is made Pope will undo all brown ponies' cardinals anyway. You don't need to be a cardinal here, said Devendi. He smiled tentatively. Only a priest. Only a what? Blacktooth looked at the old priest warily. The brothers want to elect you abbot. For that you will have to be ordained. That's not possible, said Blacktooth. Not except, though. My thoughts exactly, said Devendi, looking relieved. But I promised I would ask. I have no vocation for it, said Blacktooth. I was given my vocation by Pope Amen, too. I will stay a couple of nights and then go. To the Mesa of Last Resort. I thought I might go that way. That's where she went, said Prior de Vendi. She was uh, injured, you know, and she stayed with the old Jew after she left here. But I'm sure she must be gone. Blacktooth looked out the window toward the Mesa. It shimmered in the distance like a mirage of rock. Is the old Jew still there? The old Jew was still there. Blacktooth left the abbey the next morning with the gifts of a blanket and breviary, a canteen and a loaf of bread. He was greeted with a rattle of stones halfway up the trail that led to the top of the mesa. He ignored them. They were only pebbles. He wedged himself up through the last crack onto the top. And there was Benjamin Eleazar bar Joshua, looking no older than he had looked ten years before, or a hundred years before that, for all Blacktooth knew. You, said the old man, I suspected it might be you. Brown Pony is dead, Blacktooth said. He was not the one, was all old Benjamin had replied. He told Blacktooth that Idria had stayed with him several months, until her sores had healed, and then had left without revealing her plans. Had he found her much changed? Changed? The old Jew only smiled and shook his head, apparently misunderstanding. It never was any better. It never will be any better. It will only be richer or poorer, sadder but not wiser, until the very last day. Irritated, weary of oracles and parables, Blacktooth wrapped himself in his blanket and went straight to sleep. He stayed with Benjamin two nights, sleeping in the tent where Idria had slept. The old tent-maker himself never stayed in a tent if he could help it. Blacktooth was awakened by rain on the tent every night, a few great splattering drops. Or was that a dream sent to advertise his tent-making and rain-making skills? There was dry lightning off to the east each night the wild horsewoman admonishing her children on the plains. He left on the third day. The old Jew filled his canteen from a pool hidden under a rock. The water was cold and clear, and Blacktooth was surprised to find that it lasted him all the way to New Jerusalem.
Even if she had come, Prior Singing Carl told Black Tooth at St. Leibowitz in the Cottonwoods, I would have turned her away. You heard what had happened to her? Yes. Black Tooth had followed the papal road north, then cut off at Arch Hollow into the Suckermans. The settlement at New Jerusalem was much diminished. Magister Dion had not made it back from the anti-Pope's war, as even the spooks were calling it, and no one knew of Shard's Idria except that she had left for Laredo under interdiction. No one believed Blacktooth when he told them that the interdiction had been lifted by the Pope, who was not a Pope, at New Rome, which was no longer New Rome. Nor was she to be found in Valana. But Abelot was, working as a secular scribe in the square of St. John's, under the walls of the great hall of St. Ston's, and next door to the old papal palace, where Amen had delivered his now legendary seventeen-hour acceptance speech. The air of Valana was rich with the familiar urban smells of horse dung, food, and smoke. The streets were bustling. After the Crusades' defeat, many of the nomads had come to settle in the narrow strip of farmland watered by the mountains. They bought and sold horses and cattle, changing their ways to suit their world's changing ways. I got tired of being a soldier, Abelot said. Did you tire of being a cardinal, Your Excellency? I'm not a cardinal any more, Blacktooth said, finding his old companion's sarcasm as tiresome as ever. Abelot had a long scar under one eye, which he said he had earned outside the gates of Hannigan City, when the Texarch troops had outflanked and ambushed Hungenusle's warriors. It went well with his missing ear. I almost bled to death, Abelot said. I ended up in Hannigan City. Once the fighting was over, the Empire just folded us in like raisins into a cake. Many of the Kisak Driverdor's nomads are now part of the Emperor's guard. I wandered around for a few weeks, then got a spot as secretary to a Nork churchman who arrived with the conclave and couldn't speak Ozark. Conclave? Oh, yes, Avalot said. Sorry Norquart called a conclave and had himself made pope. Or perhaps we might say Philpeo had him made pope. Urian Benefers was bitter, still is, I imagine. Without Brown Pony to resist and stall and prevaricate, the bishops and archbishops drifted in and sorely nullified all the nullifications of the Amen too, and then Wushin nullified Philpeo. The axe. Indeed, said Abelot. Stopped his carriage in the street. Sliced off his head when Philpeo stuck it out the window to see what was going on. The Hannigan's guard showered your yellow man with bullets, but he welcomed them. He bared his throat and chest and belly to them. I saw it. When Blacktooth closed his eyes, he could see Wushin's disapproving narrow eyes. I would be dead now if it were not for him. Wouldn't we both? Anyway, you are no longer a cardinal. The papacy has been removed to Hannigan City, which is ruled by Benefers, as regent for several of Philpeo's sons, who will settle it among themselves in typically bloody fashion, I imagine, when they come of age. In the meanwhile, a rough peace reigns. Avalot had married Anala the sister of Jesus, bringing her and two small children to Valana from New Jerusalem. He offered Blacktooth a place to stay, but the house was small, and Blacktooth discovered he had no taste for domestic life. I have been a monk too long, he told Abelot, bidding him farewell and heading out toward the south. It was a very good year for the buzzards. The younger generation waxed strong, soared high and far on black wings, waiting for the fruitful earth to yield up her bountiful carrion. One night Blacktooth awakened in a cold sweat and thought that his fever was back. Then he looked north and saw the sky filled with Nunshorn, the night hag, huge and ugly. He could see stars through her upraised arms. Who is dying? he asked aloud. He found out later it was his old friend Chur Usle Hungen. Brown Pony's plan had been a disaster for the nomads. After the defeat, the three hordes had turned their backs on one another. The Treaty of the Sacred Mare no longer held, and the plains were littered with bodies thrown down by drought, by famine, and by the motherless ones. Blacktooth traveled south across the Nadian, the Bay Ghost, and at last the Brave. No longer a cardinal, he expected to be turned away at Mother Aridia's convent of San Pancho Villa of Cockroach Mountain. But she welcomed him almost as an old friend. She had no news, though, of Sister Claire of Assisi. 
She suspected Idria was somewhere with her own people. Her own people? Blacktooth protested. I was at New Jerusalem, and they knew nothing of her. The Gleps, said Mother Aridia. The Spooks, the Valley of the Mistborn. The jackrabbit country had always been harsh, but after two dry summers it had become even harsher. The wet years were over. Sand was taking the grass. Hannigan City was prospering, though. The Empire had turned east and was looking toward the woodlands and the growing commerce up the red from the Great River. Blacktooth worked several days in the marketplace as a scribe before he was summoned to a papal audience. The summoner surprised him even more than the summons, for it was Torildo, wearing a curate's gown complete with feather. I told his excellency you were here, the still handsome young man told Blacktooth. You should be more careful. You are still under interdiction. I don't see why. If he took away my cardinal ship, why couldn't he take away my interdiction? It's Benefers, Torildo said. He thinks you had a hand in killing Filpeo. I did, thought Blacktooth. He probably thanks you for it, said Torildo, but he doesn't particularly want you around. Sorley Norvat was most respectful and even curious to hear of Black Tooth's adventures. He was especially interested in the situation on the plains, but he knew more than Black Tooth. The apparition of the night hag had been seen all over the high plains. The Weegis women were not pleased. When the Kisach Dri Virgar returned from the south, he was called before them and put to death. After the funeral feast, his bones were buried in three widely separated locations, decided by each of the three hordes. Why is he telling me this, Blacktooth wondered, as the plump, grave Pope rattled on, seemingly unconcerned about the time. He is burying Brown Pony's dreams. Philpeos were buried next. The Pope, who had been in the Emperor's carriage, described in gruesome detail how Wuxin had done his work. Philpeo's guard were equipped with the first copies of the repeaters, and several misfired. Axe had removed the head of the seventh Hannigan in a single stroke, then laid down his sword and knelt to receive the bullets chasing into his chest like bees into a hive. Dominus ex Deu. The audience lasted all afternoon and was exhausting. After the lengthy and bloody assassination, Pope Sorley described the imperial situation in great detail. The repeating weapons were decisive. With them, Texarkana at last controlled the plains. The old way of life was dying, and those who could not see the end coming could hear it keening in the wind. Even the grass was going. Crescent-shaped hills of sand marched slowly from west to east. The empire that had secured its western frontiers now looked more and more to the east. New Rome smoldered for years, but was never rebuilt. My son. Blacktooth had fallen asleep. The Pope didn't seem insulted. When he left the log papal palace, Blacktooth was given a small sack of gold coins at the door. Pay for listening, he thought, and then on reflection realized it was travel money. He was to make himself scarce. That had been his intention all along. Hannigan City, like Villana, was in turmoil. The streets were crowded with horses and men. The army was being decommissioned, new legates were piling out for the west, and the grasshopper lands to the north were being opened up to the motherless ones and also to those among the Hannigans' former enemies, who wanted to celebrate the new peace by raising cattle and grass. Leaving was easy. Blacktooth was weary of cities and old friends and enemies. He was weary of mankind, so using the Pope's money he bought himself an ass, or to be precise, a mule, and headed north along the ragged edge where the forest meets the plains. Grass. It stretched unbroken to one horizon and meandered among the low dark trees on the other. The little mountains called Winding Stair were lit with fires, whether of celebration or mourning Blacktooth couldn't tell. He rode unchallenged past the first log outposts of the Gleps. He hoped the valley of the Mistborn would take him in, and it did. The valley, or the Wachita Nation, as it was now called, had grown to be a network of valleys up and down the low mountains called the Old Zarks. Blacktooth wandered until he found a little community of book-leggers and memorizers called Post Cedar. He traded his mule for a guitar, much like the one his father had given him, and lived on the mountainside above the abbey, 
swapping his services as a scribe and a tutor for food. He found shelter in a rockhouse cave, very like the cave where Amen had lived, except that these eastern caves were broad and open, like a mouth. They provide protection against the rain and some against the cold, but none against the years. And so Blacktooth St. George grew old, reciting the divine office and meditating on the rule of St. Leibowitz, which enjoined him to the humility he was surprised to discover had been waiting for him all along. It was a sister to the deep loneliness he treasured, a loneliness he no longer wished filled. It was an emptiness as tangible as love. Some nights, though, he found himself praying to whatever might answer such a prayer that Idria would come to him. He had heard that a blonde spook who wore a nun's robe practiced medicine in the next valley. The local priest called her a witch. Sometimes she healed minds the priest had cursed, and because of this the priest feared her. Blacktooth needed his mind healed, but that was not what he feared in her. He feared the gateway beneath the clitoris, torn open by the black god and the white god he had seen riding with the day maiden on her rubra auricular white mule. Or had the old Jew done that to her? It was just over the hill waiting for him, the world gateway of the Lord Jesus and of all the saints, and he was a coward. Sometimes he stroked himself into a moment's ecstasy thinking about it, and he did not hide his shame from the holy mother day maiden Fuji Go, who watched him from the corner of the hut of his mind. Neither did he mention it in his annual confession to the Leibowitzian priest who visited him every Monday Thursday. The priest always wanted to wash Nimi's feet on behalf of the abbot on that occasion, but the hermit refused. You won't acknowledge your poverty? Isn't that your pride? Blacktooth signed and let the man wash his feet and give him communion. He had given up Jesus several times, as Amen Specklebird had advised, when the Saviour became an occasion of sin for him. But he always came back, and so it seemed to him did the Saviour. Well, how have you been doing lately, Lord? For three hours every weekday he taught thirteen children of various ages how to read and write their own dialect. He also taught them a little music, and taught them, sometimes to their parents' disbelief, a few things about the geography of the continent, and as much as he knew about the history of the world and the fall of the Magna Civitas. Some of the children believed him, and others believed their parents. But the laughing parents brought him food in payment for their urchins' literacy, and they mended his clothes, furnished him blankets, and occasionally brought him a hermina of wine for his weakness. When he was alone, he opened himself. Sometimes the ecstasy of God came through the opening, but more often it did not. He decided to stop leaving an opening for God. That was what Meister Eckhart advised, to be so poor that he had no place for God to come into. When God had no place to come into, he was in every place. There was nothing else. But Blacktooth did not consider himself a religious man. He did not know if God was the Father or the Maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. He couldn't see that it mattered, since God himself, when he became manifest as a whirlwind bush, never bothered to tell him, never said, Blacktooth, I am your almighty Father, and I made this earth you're kneeling on, and the sky you are kneeling under. Chapter 34. Let those who receive new clothes always give back the old ones at once to be put away in the wardrobe for the poor. St. Benedict's Rule, Chapter 55. Just over the mountain from Post Cedar was a convent, where there lived a nun known as Sister Clare. She awakened one morning with one of her feelings, and knew that the hermit who lived in the next valley was dead. She had known of him for years, but had elected to leave him in peace, knowing the difficulty of the journey he was on. No one told her he was dead. No one besides herself knew it yet. And she only knew because of the feeling, not unlike joy and yet not unlike sorrow either, that wouldn't leave her. She welcomed the feeling. The hermit had few enough left in this world to miss him. With the abbess's permission, Sister Clare packed a loaf of bread, a little cheese, and then, as an afterthought, a freshly dead mouse from the trap in the kitchen. She walked over the steep and little-used trail to Post Cedar. On the far side of the valley, across from the monastery, she found the narrow path to the dry cave, just where she knew it would be. 
The old man hadn't been dead long. It was not his death, but his age, that filled Sister Clare's eyes with tears. She had expected somehow to find a handsome young man, even though she was herself an old woman, bent and spotted with years. Blacktooth was sitting against a stone with the head of a small cougar in his lap. The animal lifted its blue head when she approached. It was Librada. Idria waited, but the cougar wouldn't leave, and finally had to be coaxed away with the mouse so that she could bury Blacktooth and place at the head of his grave the little cross she had carried with her all these years. The rosary that was clutched in his hand and the crude guitar he had left leaning against the back wall of the cave, she took with her. End of St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horsewoman by Walter M. Miller, Jr. Read by John Horton in the studios of American Foundation for the Blind, Incorporated, for the Library of Congress, October 1998. Published by Bantam Books, 1540 Broadway, New York, New York, 10036. Further reproduction or distribution in other than a specialized format is prohibited. End of book.